Um, this morning, we will have uh, uh, three talks, uh, both uh, online uh, from uh, East Asia. So the first one, unfortunately, they cannot come. But uh, uh, so the first one uh, is given by Jun Xie from uh, Beijing International uh, Center for Mathematical Research. And uh, he's talking about the uh, geometric bogomorph conjecture. So Jun, please. Okay, uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, okay, um, I, I will talk about the geometric Bogomolov conjecture. And uh, this uh, uh, is based uh, uh, on a joint work with Xing uh, uh, Yuan. Okay, uh, here is our plan. Uh, we first uh, uh, introduce uh, uh, the statement of uh, the Bogomolov conjecture. Uh, and then we give some historical notes. And uh, uh, in the end, uh, we uh, give the proof of, the, of our main results. Okay. Uh, so uh, here is our setup. Uh, we denote by a K, an algebraically closed field. And the capital K, uh, either a number field uh, or a finitely uh, generated uh, field a finitely generated a few extension of the small k uh, with transcendence uh, degree uh, at least one. Uh, in this talk, we mainly uh, interest uh, in the function field case. Uh, okay, let A be an Abelian variety over capital K uh, with dimension uh, G, and L uh, is a symmetric and ample line bundle on A. Uh, to stay uh, the geometric Bogomolov conjecture, uh, we first uh, recall the notion of canonical height uh, in the uh, function field case. Okay, uh, to do this, uh, we first say uh, what is an, an integral uh, model of uh, capital K over K. Uh, it is a, a normal projective variety S uh, over small k uh, with a function field uh, capital K. And we say a polarization of uh, capital K over K uh, is a pair uh, SM uh, considering uh, of a projective uh, model S uh, of uh, capital K over K and uh, an ample line bundle M on S. Then uh, we say an integral model of uh, uh, this Arbanian variety over capital K, uh, then over small k, uh, is the following uh, data. Uh, one, we have uh, one is a uh, uh, morphism pi from A to S, uh, which is subjective uh, between uh, projective varieties whose generic fiber uh, is our uh, Arbanian variety A and uh, L is a uh, line bundle of uh, uh, this A uh, extending uh, the given line bundle L. Uh, let X uh, be a sub variety of A K bar. A K bar is the uh, base change of A uh, by uh, K bar. We base change it to the algebraically closed uh, field. Okay, now we can define the naive height of X uh, with respect uh, to the inter to the uh, integral model and uh, the polarization uh, SM and uh, uh, AL, uh, it is uh, defined as uh, HX uh, equal to uh, the intersection of L dimension X plus one uh, times uh, pi star M uh, dimension uh, S minus one times uh, X uh, over uh, one plus dimension uh, x prime uh, times uh, degree L uh, x prime. Uh, here x prime is uh, the image of x uh, in A, and uh, uh, this x is the Zariski closure of uh, x prime in the uh, in the uh, model uh, A. Okay, uh, maybe we we um, uh, we can. Look at uh, this uh, formula. Mm, if uh, the base, if the base of uh, S uh, equal to uh, 
is uh, one dimensional, it's a curve. Then uh, we don't have uh, uh, the middle term, the, the pi star m uh, dimension s minus one. So this, uh, this uh, height does not uh, depend on this m, but uh, in high dimensional case, so, uh, we have uh, this term. So, okay. So, uh, so if the dimension of s are equal to one, then it, uh, this definition of naive height is exactly the, the naive height uh, we, we use uh, for the um, dimension one uh, uh, function field uh, case. Okay, now then uh, we can define the canonical height of X uh, as follows. Uh, H height X uh, equal to a limit N tends to infinity or uh, one over N square uh, the naive height of uh, uh, n x prime. Uh, here n uh, from a to a uh, is uh, uh, the map uh, multiplication by n. Uh, uh, using the limit, using a Tate's limiting argument, we can show that the, this limit always uh, exists. And uh, uh, this number uh, does not depend on the model. It only depends on uh, the on L and uh, uh, this uh, canonical height is always a uh, long negative and uh, uh, H height NX equal to N square uh, H height X as the usual uh, canonical height on uh, Arbanian variety. So in particular, uh, if we pick X to be uh, just a point, then we get the canonical height uh, for point. Uh, a k bar to uh, zero uh, infinite. infinite. Uh, so in the, in the case that the, the transcendence degree uh, capital K over K uh, equal to one, then the situation become much easier since uh, uh, this uh, model S is unique and uh, uh, the polarization, uh, the ample line bundle M on S uh, does is not used in the definition of height. Okay, now we have a notion of small points uh, for any sub variety X uh, of a k bar and uh, any epsilon uh, strictly larger than zero. Uh, we can define an X epsilon to be the set of uh, uh, k bar points in X uh, with uh, small height, with height, canonical height uh, strictly. Uh, less than epsilon. Uh, then we say that X contains a dense set of small points uh, if for all epsilon strictly uh, larger than zero, uh, X epsilon bar uh, equal to X. Uh, this means that uh, for every epsilon strictly larger than zero, uh, X still has a uh, joystick uh, dense. Uh, so it has many uh, points which has a uh, height strictly less than epsilon. So uh, this notion uh, does not depend on uh, anything. It does not depend on L and it does not depend on S and M. Okay, now we want to give some uh, example uh, to see uh, to the some example of uh, um, variety sub varieties contains uh, a dense set of small points. Uh, the first example uh, is as follows. Uh, we, we, we first see that for every uh, torsion point, n torsion point x in a k bar, uh, h height x uh, equal to h height n plus one x because the x is uh, n torsion. So n plus one x is just x. So it equal to n plus one square h height x. So this implies that h height x equal to zero. Now a torsion sub variety of a k bar uh, is uh, a variety uh, takes form a plus c where a uh, is an Arbanian sub variety and A uh, is a torsion point. Then uh, it's easy to see that any torsion point 
uh, contains a dense set of torsion points, but uh, all torsion points has had zero. So uh, it uh, contains a dense set of small points. Okay. Uh, the second example uh, only exists in the function field case. Uh, uh, it uh, relates to the uh, notion of trace. Uh, the k bar over k trace uh, uh, of a k bar uh, is a pair a uh, capital k bar over k uh, trace. Uh, what it is? Uh, it is the final object of the category of uh, pairs uh, C f, uh, where C is an Abelian variety over the small k and f uh, from C. Uh, tensor k k bar to a k bar uh, is a uh, morphism. Uh, so this uh, is a uh, slightly uh, abstract. So uh, if a characteristic of k equal to zero, then in this case, uh, the trace is uh, closed in motion. So uh, in this case, the trace a k bar over k uh, tensor k k bar uh, is exactly the maximum Arbanian sub variety of a k bar divided over small k. So um, it's a, we, we can think it, it as the, the, the part of the Arbanian variety which is defined over the small field. Uh, uh, if the correct characteristic of k uh, is strictly is uh, positive. Uh, in this case, the, this statement is not true, but uh, it's uh, uh, very close to be true. Uh, in this case, trace is not, uh, in general, it's not a closed emotion, but uh, it, it is uh, purely inseparable isogeny to its image. So, okay. Uh, so, uh, in this case, uh, we see that for every uh, point x in a k bar over k uh, divided over small k. Uh, we can view it as a point in a k bar uh, over k um, tensor k uh, capital K. And uh, the, we can show that the image on the trace of this point uh, is, it has had zero. Then uh, for every y in a k bar over k, so why is some sub variety divided over the small field k? Okay. And uh, uh, we can show that the uh, uh, trace uh, yk uh, is Zariski dense in the trace of uh, y uh, k bar. Hence, uh, trace y k bar contains a um, dense uh, set of uh, small points. So, such a, such a sub variety trace a k bar uh, is something like uh, you can view it as uh, some sub variety of a k bar but uh, which is uh, uh, essentially defined it over uh, the constant the, the field of uh, constant over the small field so okay so uh, we define a sub variety x of a k bar uh, to be special uh, if uh, it is a combination of these two examples. So X uh, equal to a uh, trace uh, Y tensor K, K bar uh, plus T. Uh, here, uh, T is some torsion sub variety uh, of A, K bar and Y uh, is some sub variety of A, uh, K bar over K. Uh, it is uh, something defined over the small field, small, small field K. So, so we can think that uh, uh, special sub variety is uh, the combination of a uh, torsion one and uh, something, uh, some constant one. So any, uh, we can show that any special sub variety contains a dense set of uh, small points because uh, uh, each part of it contains a dense set of small points. Uh, in number field case, uh, special and the torsion are the same. Okay, now 
uh, we can um, we can state the Bogomolov conjecture. Uh, the Bogomolov conjecture says that uh, if X is a sub variety of a k bar, then X contains a dense set of small points. Uh, if and only if uh, X uh, is special. But uh, we already know that uh, a special sub variety is uh, contains a dense set uh, of small points. So we only need to uh, prove uh, the inverse uh, direction. Okay. Uh, this conjecture, uh, in, in the number of your case, uh, this uh, conjecture was proposed uh, by Bogomolov uh, for curves in its uh, Jacobian. And uh, uh, it, uh, the number of your case uh, was proved by Unimor, uh in uh, 1998 and uh, uh, Shou Zhang uh, in the same year. And uh, 1K is a finitely generated field of uh, uh, Q. Uh, in this case, we have another height, uh, we can, which is uh, the Moriwaki uh, height. And uh, there is an arithmetic version uh, for uh, the Bogomolov conjecture uh, using this Moriwaki height. And uh, uh, Moriwaki in uh, 2000 uh, proved that. Uh, this arithmetic version. And uh, the function field case of uh, uh, this conjecture is uh, uh, called it, uh, the geometric Bogomolov conjecture. Uh, it was proposed by Yamaki in 2016. And uh, uh, our main result uh, is uh, the following. Uh, we uh, uh, I prove it uh, with uh, Yuan uh, last year uh, that the geometric Bogomolov conjecture uh, holds. Okay, uh, now we give some historical notes. Uh, for this conjecture, there are three main uh, approach um, to attack uh, the, the Bogomolov conjecture or the geometric Bogomolov conjecture. Uh, the first one uh, is to use the equidistribution. And uh, uh, this result uh, was uh, uh, first uh, obtained uh, in number field uh, by uh, Spiro, Unimo, and Zhang. And uh, uh, it then proved uh, in function field by Gubler. Uh, uh, it, the result uh, is. Uh, is the follow, following. Uh, for xn uh, in a k bar uh, is a set, uh, is a sequence of uh, uh, points uh, with a canonical height uh, tends to zero. Uh, for uh, let uh, v be a place of uh, k, and then uh, uh, we have the following. Uh, convergence uh, for uh, me probability measure. Uh, the right hand side is uh, uh, the sum of uh, uh, delta x, uh, where delta x, where x is uh, uh, in the in Galois orbit of xn, then we uh, do the average. And uh, delta x is just the Dirac uh, measure. And uh, it converges to mu v, and the mu v is some uh, canonical probability uh, measure on um, a v a n. Here a v a n is some uh, analytic, uh, uh, is some uh, analytic space associated to this uh, uh, variety a, uh, but with respect to this place v. And uh, uh, for example, uh, if V is an arch median, um, if V is an arch median uh, places, then this A V A N is uh, just something like uh, you view this Arbanian variety as a complex uh, manifold, and uh, in this case, this mu V is very simple. It's just it is just uh, the higher measure. Okay, and uh, uh, using this re this uh, equidistribution result. Uh, Unimor and Zhang, uh, they proved uh, 
mm, the Boko Mono of conjecture in the number few uh, case and uh, uh, Morimaki proved that it's in the uh, arithmetic proved that it's arithmetic version. And uh, uh, all these results, uh, the key points of uh, this result are uh, use this equidistribution theorem uh, on the arch median uh, places. And uh, uh, then uh, Gubler uh, in 2007, they, he worked on the function field and uh, he proved the G geometric Bogomolov conjecture. Uh, when A is totally degenerate at some place, some place of capital K over K. And uh, here he, he used uh, some uh, tropical version of uh, uh, this uh, uh, equidistribution results. And uh, uh, this is, uh, the tropical version is something uh, slightly uh, weaker than, uh, the, than this, this uh, original version. And uh, then uh, Yamaki, uh, in 2017, he showed that uh, he reduced the geometric Bogomolov conjecture to the case of Arbanian variety uh, with uh, good reduction everywhere and uh, with a uh, trivial trace. Uh, here he used the uh, equidistribution uh, theorem uh, in the uh, in long arch median places. And uh, here uh, we use the long, um, the Berkowitz space as the framework of uh, long arch median geometry. And uh, uh, as a consequence, uh, he proved the case that a dimension of X equal to one or co-dimension of X equal to one. And uh, finally, uh, uh, myself and uh, Yuan, uh, we proved uh, the full uh, geometric Bogomolov conjecture uh, in our proof, our proof also follows this line uh, because we use the uh, Yamaki's uh, reduction theorem. Uh, the second method is to use some BD map. And uh, this, this uh, method only works in a uh, function field case and uh, it only works in the uh, characteristic uh, Zeta case because uh, this method is uh, quite analytic. Uh, uh, the the BD map is uh, some uh, real analytic uh, uh, map, uh, which is locally defined, which is only locally defined, uh, which, and it identify a sm uh, smooth nearby fibers uh, of uh, uh, this map, this uh, uh, morphism AC, uh, to SC. Uh, uh, how, how can, we, basically, uh, how can we define this uh, BD map? It's something like uh, if we look at the, the uh, smooth uh, fiber uh, AS uh, as a really group, it uh, is isomorphic to R2G over Z2G. So, uh, so if the base point S uh, move in some small disk, uh, in the base, then uh, if we forget the complex structure, uh, they are the they are the same. It's a uh, it's just a product. So uh, we can use this product structure to get uh, this uh, BD, BD map to uh, identify uh, different uh, fibers. Okay, uh, using this. Uh, uh, this uh, BD map, uh, Gao and Arberger in 2019, uh, uh, they proved the geometric Bogomolov conjecture uh, in characteristic zero. Uh, uh, one, the transcendence degree of capital K over K are equal to one. Uh, here, except the BD map, he uh, used some counting up argument and some O-minimality uh, from logic. Uh, and uh, uh, next, then uh, Kanta, Gao Arberg, uh, and myself uh, in 2021, 
Uh, we proved the full uh, geometric Bogomolov conjecture when characteristic uh, k equal to zero, and our uh, method are uh, uh, different uh, from the one before. Uh, except the BD map, we uh, we use some uh, BD form, which is some uh, 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 closed uh, positive uh, one one form, and uh, we use some uh, dynamics. Okay, and the uh, third method is the admissible metric, and uh, this this method only works in the function field case, and uh, it works uh, only works for curves in its Jacobian, and uh, the admissible metric uh, is it's, it's very technical to define the admissible metric, but you can think of it. Uh, as some, it is a, a very natural uh, idyllic metric on uh, canonical uh, line bundle on every curve uh, with uh, genius uh, at uh, least two. Uh, uh, it, it thinks that uh, uh, it only works in some, uh, in, in some special case uh, of uh, the geometric Bogomolov uh, conjecture. But uh, the advantage is that this method is very uh, effective. Uh, this method was introduced by uh, Zhang, uh, by Shou Zhang. Uh, he uh, he reduced, using this uh, admissible metric, uh, he reduced the geometric Bogomolov uh, conjecture to an inequality in graph theory. And uh, Next, uh, Faber proved uh, this uh, uh, inequality uh, when, the, uh, gen when the genus of C uh, is at the most four. Uh, then uh, Sinker uh, solved this uh, uh, problem in graph theory and uh, he showed that uh, uh, the geometric Bogomolov conjecture holds for curves in its Jacobian. Uh, all these results are originally proved in characteristic zero, uh, but uh, uh, with a result of Robin de Jong, uh, all these are easily generated to characteristic uh, positive. Okay, so now we prove uh, our uh, main results. Uh, the geometric Bogomolov conjecture uh, proved by myself and uh, uh, Yuan, uh, the, we recall the, the statement, uh, let X be a sub variety of a k bar, uh, then X contains a dense set of small points, if only if X is uh, special. Uh, we recall the setting here, SM uh, is a polarization of capital K uh, over K, and uh, pi a to s l is a uh, uh, integral model of our uh, uh, a over capital K over K uh, and uh, the line bundle l. Uh, the, we first uh, reduce uh, everything uh, to uh, the case that the, the transcendence degree uh, equal to one. Uh, uh, we do it as follows. Uh, assume that the, the dimension of S uh, over K uh, is uh, at least two, uh, and uh, uh, M is very ample on S. Then we, then uh, uh, a general, uh, a general pencil uh, in the linear system uh, of M uh, defines a dominant rational map from S to P1. Now we pick H to be the generic fiber uh, over the uh, generic point uh, spec uh, K uh, P1 uh, to P1. Uh, then H is uh, a variety, but not over the original uh, uh, small, uh, small field K. Um, it, uh, it is over this K prime uh, equal to uh, K P1. Uh, so uh, we have the following uh, uh, following uh, inclusion of fields uh, 
K, uh, in K prime, in capital K, uh, which equal to Ks, and uh, it also equal to uh, K prime H. Uh, so in particular, uh, H uh, and the restriction of M on H uh, is a polarization of uh, uh, capital K over K prime. Uh, then uh, we can show that the, the geometric Bogomolov conjecture uh, holds for A over capital K over small k. Uh, if it holds for all uh, A over capital K over K prime, uh, uh, here, uh, the, here the transcendence degree uh, K over capital K uh, equal to transcendence degree of uh, capital K over K uh, minus one. So uh, the, the transcendence uh, degree uh, is uh, smaller. So we repeat this, uh, uh, progress, and then we get uh, the case that the transcendence degree equal to one. And uh, now we do some further reduction. Uh, first, uh, we can assume that the transcendence degree equal to one. So in this case, S is a smooth projective curve. Now, then we uh, apply a Yamaki's uh, reduction theorem. So uh, we can assume that A has everywhere good reduction over S, and the trivial k bar uh, capital K over k trace. So uh, we can assume that uh, uh, this pi a to s is an Arbanian skin over s. Okay, now we consider uh, the following morphism uh, fm from xm to a, uh, sending uh, x1, x2 to xm to just the sum of them, x1 plus x2 plus uh, xm uh, in A. Uh, now, uh, one can show that the semi-group uh, generated by x, uh, which equal to a uh, union of m, uh, like equal to one uh, fm x uh, is a torsion sub right of A. Mm. So uh, after replacing A by some smaller Arbanian variety, we may assume that uh, this uh, semi-group uh, generated by X is exactly A. Okay, now we prove the essential case. Uh, we may assume that the L uh, is uh, uh, rigidified, uh, which means that the restriction of L on the identity section of our, our Arbanian skin uh, is trivial. Uh, here is the key observation. Uh, let T be a torsion a multi-section uh, of this Arbanian skin, uh, which is just the Zaisky closure of, uh, in uh, A of uh, uh, torsion point uh, in uh, AK bar. Then uh, T is some a uh, multiple of uh, uh, LG as one circle in this uh, uh, Arbanian skin A uh, for some uh, A strictly larger than Z. Okay, uh, now uh, there is uh, R like equal to Z such that uh, uh, F R minus one X uh, not equal to A, but F R X uh, equal to A. Uh, then we consider the following uh, diagram, uh, XR, we can embed it in AR, and uh, then uh, FR and SR uh, send them to A. Here SR is X1, uh, XR to X1 plus X2 to XR. And uh, 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 by our assumption, this FR uh, is subjective and uh, E uh, divided to be dim the uh, dimension of the uh, generic fiber of FR uh, is strictly uh, less than dimension X. Okay, now uh, we claim that uh, uh, for a general uh, torsion point, uh, X uh, in A, uh, the pre-image uh, F R minus one X uh, is uh, torsion in A R. Uh, 
now we first assume we, we ass, assuming this uh, clamp uh, this uh, pre image uh, f r minus one t uh, it contains a dense set of uh, torsion points because itself is torsion so it contains a dense set of torsion points uh, so because torsion points are dense in a and uh, uh, general torsion points uh, satisfy uh, the or clamp then XR contains a dense set of uh, torsion points. Uh, using the first projection, we, we can project XR to X. It shows that X contains a dense set of torsion points. Uh, now we can conclude the proof uh, by Martin Mumford conjecture which was proved by uh, Reno uh, in the number field case and uh, uh, Huzhovsky uh, in the function field case uh, using a uh, model theory. And uh, uh, it was reproved by Pink and Huxley uh, using algebraic geometry. Okay, now we only need to prove the clamp. Uh, uh, we denote by a T, uh, the Zariski closure of uh, T uh, in A, uh, it is a uh, torsion uh, multi section, and uh, X, the Zariski closure of X uh, in A. Uh, then we, we consider the, uh, the fiber product uh, XR over S uh, in uh, AR over S, and uh, uh, we can see that it is exactly the Zariski closure of uh, XR uh, in AR uh, in uh, this uh, fiber product uh, AR over S. Uh, now we, we can uh, extend uh, our uh, SR and FR uh, to this, uh, to this, uh, uh, S scheme uh, version. So uh, then we get the following, uh, we get this uh, commutative uh, diagram and uh, we denote by T prime uh, to be the pre-image on the FR of T. Uh, we pick LR to be any relatively ample and rigidified line bundle uh, on uh, the fiber product uh, AR over S. Now, uh, we use uh, Zhang's uh, fundamental inequality. Uh, Zhang's fun fundamental inequality uh, shows that if a uh, sub-variety contains a dense set of, uh, uh, contains a dense set of small points, uh, then its canonical head uh, equal to zero. So uh, in this case, because X contains a dense set of small points. So its power XR still contains a dense set of small points. So the canonical height of XR equal to zero. Uh, but uh, in all settings, uh, we can compute this. Uh, usually, the usually to compute the canonical height, we need to take some limit. But uh, in our case, uh, everything is in some an uh, Albanian scheme. Uh, over some curve of uh, over some projective curve. So in this case, we don't need to uh, take limits. Uh, we just take the intersection. It's already it already gets the canonical height. So XR over S uh, times LR dimension uh, XR over S uh, equal to zero. This is just. Uh, Yes, it's just uh, means the canonical height of XR equal to zero. Uh, now we do some fake computation to uh, conclude the proof. Uh, uh, the computation is uh, uh, like this. Uh, because it's a canonical height, so uh, H height F R minus one T is large equal to zero. Uh, and uh, it is less equal to uh, uh, T prime times uh, L R uh, E plus one, uh, because uh, uh, this uh, 
because this uh, pre-image f r minus one t, uh, it is an uh, irreducible component of this uh, uh, t prime, and uh, then this one equal to uh, x r uh, fiber product over s times uh, s r pull back of t times uh, l r e plus one, and uh, by our key observation, it equal to a x r over s times s r uh, pullback l dimension a times uh, l r e plus one. But uh, l r uh, is because l r uh, is uh, uh, relatively ample and rigidified. And uh, here the pullback uh, by s r of l, it is also rigidified. So it is less equal to uh, some multiple of LR. So we can change the constant to uh, another constant A prime. Then we get uh, uh, this one uh, less equal to A prime XR over S uh, times LR dimension XR over S. And uh, we already know that uh, this term are uh, equal to zero. Then uh, we apply Zhang's uh, inequality for essential minimal. Uh, it shows that uh, this uh, uh, LA FR minus one T, this uh, uh, fiber contains a dense set of uh, small points. Now uh, for T general, uh, this dimension, the dimension of FR minus one T uh, equal to E, which is strictly less than X. So we can use uh, or we can use the in, by induction, uh, this fiber FR uh, minus one T uh, is torsion. Uh, so this implies our uh, claim. So the, the only problem is that uh, this is a fake uh, computation It's not, uh, uh, it's not the real real one. So uh, the, we need to repair this uh, fake uh, computation. So why it is fake? Uh, the problem is that uh, this uh, T prime may not have uh, the correct uh, dimension, uh, uh, which means that uh, the, uh, the intersection of S R minus one T and X R over S is, is not a proper intersection uh, in A R over S. So um, the solution is, uh, is that uh, uh, we know that uh, this intersection is uh, not uh, proper. So uh, we can divide it by some proper part and uh, uh, no proper part. Uh, in, in general, uh, the non proper part may have may give some uh, negative uh, contribution in the intersection number. But uh, we can show that uh, in our case, uh, this, uh, uh, the contribution of this non proper uh, part uh, is non negative. Then we still have uh, uh, this right, right uh, inequality. And uh, uh, this uh, makes uh, the fake computation to be a uh, right one. So, okay, so uh, I finished, I finished uh, my talk. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, so uh, thanks uh, speaker. So uh, any question? Also, if there are any person on, uh, on Zoom, if, uh, if you have any question, you can unmute yourself and uh, ask your question directly. So, uh, yes. Uh, hi, sir. My question is uh, I, I kind of naive. So the, could you explain a bit about the uh, geometric meanings of the notion of height you introduced uh, in the beginning of the talk? That's a... Uh, okay, so, so I think it's, um, uh, 
uh, ge geometric means that uh, you do something for function field. And uh, because uh, because original need, uh, the, the height original comes from something uh, we, we do something over number field. And, uh, but uh, uh, we have an analog between uh, function field and the number field. So geometric means that uh, we do similar things for, uh, for function field. So it's a function field version of the Bogomolov conjecture. So uh, in fact, it's something, in, it's interesting that uh, because in most of the problem, uh, the, the number field case is uh, much uh, uh, difficult than the, the function field case. The number field case in general is uh, much is uh, harder. But uh, for this kind of uh, uh, Bogomolov conjecture, uh, uh, the number field case is uh, easier because uh, in, for number field we have some arch medium places, and uh, the arch medium in the arch medium places you get some analysis, and you get many. Uh, information, but uh, in the uh, function field cases, uh, function field case, there is no arch median uh, places. And uh, uh, using the same method, the equity distribution, uh, you get uh, uh, the, the information you get is uh, is less, and uh, it is not sufficient to uh, get uh, the conclusion. So uh, usually we need some. So so we. So we need to uh, do more work. So uh, I, I, I hope that um, I uh, answered you correctly uh, your question. Uh, no, yes, we have another question. Um, so, okay. Um... So can, can you explain a little bit if you have some special properties that uh, help you to show that the uh, the contribution of the non-proper part is uh, non-negative? Because that seems to be quite difficult, right? Uh, this part is, uh, yes, uh, I think this part is a bit uh, technical. So it, it's, it's uh, uh, so, so usually this is phenomenon. So usually this is not true. For example, you consider uh, P2 and you consider P2 blew blue, blue up one point, then you get an exceptional uh, divisor. And you, if you consider the self uh, intersection, then the, the, its proper part is uh, zero. And uh, its uh, self intersection is minus one. So, so the non proper the contribution of the non proper part is uh, uh, non negative. So so in general this is uh, th this is not true uh, in in general. But uh, but uh, in in our case uh, we, we can show that uh, this uh, uh, we have this uh, uh, phenomenon is uh, that the, the non proper part have some. Uh, positive uh, contribution, non-negative contribution. Uh, maybe some, uh, okay. Maybe, maybe you can think it, think it like this. It's something like uh, uh, if you have some ample uh, divisor and uh, you do the intersection of this ample divisor and uh, then, uh, then uh, you get some proper part, proper intersection part, but you still have some, some part which is not uh, proper. And uh, I think uh, in I think in this case you can show that uh, in this case you can show that uh, uh, the contribution of the non-proper part is uh, uh, non-negative. Uh, but but uh, how can to, to show this, you need to do the com computation uh, by hand. So it's not uh, so easy to uh, ex explain this. And uh, then uh, in our setting, it's not uh, that uh, simple, but uh, we can 
uh, use some kind of uh, bacteria uh, uh, to reduce uh, our setting to uh, the setting of uh, uh, intersection of uh, some ample devices. So, so something, something like this. So, yes. Uh, okay, Th thank you. So, so by bacteria, do you mean like, um, um, what do you say? Um, kind of uh, moving lemma or something else? Uh, bacteria means that uh, you can, uh, uh, mean, means that uh, I, uh, you, you, how can we say? Uh, usually bacteria means that uh, you, you, you use some hyperplane to cut something and uh, then uh, if you the hyper plan you cho choose it uh, gen generally then the then the intersection is uh, is good it, you can make it to be smooth or irreducible or something like that and uh, uh, here we need to use uh, to do some uh, to the bacteria but uh, some some more uh, some stronger version because we, we needed to uh, uh, we cannot uh, we cannot move this uh, uh, hyper surface very very freely uh, we needed needed to uh, uh, pass something but uh, we move the other part of this uh, uh, hyper surface and uh, uh, we, we want that the, the, the final intersection uh, it contains uh, some part uh, we need, but uh, uh, for something uh, so outside the, the, the place we want, uh, it uh, is uh, more freedom and uh, the intersection is uh, uh, something nice. So uh, maybe so, so, so it, it, it's, it's something like this. Thanks. So, so uh, it seems you, betting is uh, seem to be something similar to like left chest uh, hyperplane section, uh, right? Uh, oh yes, or... maybe. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, any other questions? Uh, I have uh, one last uh, question about uh, uh, your talk. So. So Jun Yi, can you hear me? Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, the thing is that you and uh, your, your, this journal uh, already finished this program. So I'm wondering if your techniques can, could be used to some other problems, like, uh, for example, uh, the Kawaguchi Selman conjecture. Uh, for example, uh, this Kawaguchi Selman conjecture, maybe we, you can also think, of, think about a geometrical version. And then, uh, uh, for example, if your techniques in uh, this paper can be used to consider that geometrical Kawaguchi Seaman question, does that make sense? Uh, um, yeah. mm. I'm not. Mm, I'm not so sure because. Uh, I, I think this method can be used, uh, some, some part of this method can be used in the study of arithmetic degree. Uh, in, in particular, the, the part to treat some proper uh, intersection, non-proper intersection, some, some part uh, like this. Uh, I, 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 I think I have some idea to do this uh, for some, uh, for some problem about arithmetic degree, but I think uh, the for Kawaguchi Silverman conjecture, it uh, um, uh, um, I don't know because for Kawaguchi Silverman conjecture, uh, uh, I I think what you you mean is uh, is the one that. Uh, 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 if a point has uh, has a small 
uh, arithmetic uh, uh, degree, then the orbit of this point is uh, uh, not a Zariski dense. Yes, yes. And, uh, 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 I, I think, I, I, I don't know. I, I think uh, something like, um, uh, I, 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 I don't know, because of, to prove that the point, the, um, the orbit is not a Zariski dense is something quite difficult, so, yeah. Okay, so I I, I, I'm, I'm not so sure. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you. So uh, if no other questions, so let's thank the speaker again. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, start our talk. So our second talk came by uh, Shane Mong from Korea Institute for uh, Advanced Studies. Uh, he's going to talk about the equivalent color model for a Fujiki class. So Shen, please. Okay, so can you hear me? Hello? Yes, uh, we can hear you. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you very much for the invitation and the introduction. Okay. So today I'm going to talk about uh, a recent work, uh, a recent joint work with Jia Jia. And, uh, and uh, we are gonna talk about, I'm gonna talk about the uh, Iguana killer model for Fujiki's class. Okay. So. Okay, so uh, let me briefly introduce the background. So we work on a compact uh, complex space X and uh, denote by auto X the group of uh, the group of automorphisms on the G from X to X and G is biholomorphic. And uh, uh, it is by duality that uh, the automorphism group X carries a complex Lie group structure uh, and this is a comes a Lie group, which acts by holomorphically uh, on X. And uh, then we can denote by uh, its neutral component auto zero. And this is the generalization of uh, the, the case for uh, the case where X is a projective using the statement of Hilbert scheme. Okay. And uh, now here we do not assume the smoothness of X uh, but we can apply the Hionaka's classical result and uh, functorially by the Bielstone and Newman that uh, one can operate the equivalent successive blowups to get a smooth model. Therefore, the auto X leads to an action on its smooth, a smooth compact complex manifold. So in particular, so in most cases, we may work on, uh, we may assume that our X is smooth. So today I'm going to focus on the following question. So can we get some restriction on the components group, you know, by auto X quotient by auto zero? Okay. So let's first uh, uh, look at several examples. So in dimensional one, the curve case, uh, so it is easy to see that the auto X quotient by auto zero X uh, is a finite group. Okay, so this is a, uh, this can be classified by the genus. So for P1, the automorphism group is just the auto zero, which is just the PGR2. And for elliptic curve E here, it is a, a semi-direct product of the translation E and uh, finite group G, where the order is less equal than six. And for curves of general type, higher genus curve greater or equal than two, then the automorphism group is bounded by the uh, in terms of its genus. Okay. Okay. Uh, for surface case, okay, we, uh, we focus on the projective case first. So uh, to, uh, it, this is in general true that auto, uh, the component group is finite. So it, it is infinite if one can find the automorphism of positive entropy. Okay. So for example, there are typically three cases. So usually you can, uh, for abelian varieties, if you take the abelian varieties to be the product of E and E itself, then you can see that the component group contains the GR2Z, uh, which is which the map is easy to given by the matrix action, the so XY maps to AX plus BY is X plus DY, and ABCD is the uh, matrix. The ABCD are integers. Okay. And the uh, uh, second uh, typical example is about the rational surface. Okay, but you cannot choose P2 as uh, because the automorphism group for P2 is just the auto zero P2. 
in general, you need to block uh, many points. So at least you need to block 10 nodes of a noodle statistic of a, a, a noodle curve of degree six, okay? And there is a, there ha it has 10 nodes and you block these 10 nodes and you are get, uh, you, you can find the automorphism of positive entropy on S and then for this case, the component group is also infinite. Uh, a third classic case is uh, the, the K3 surface uh, with large picker number or in ring surface. Okay. Uh, later, we shall see that the component group is finite uh, uh, projective or killer if the, the cone of net dividers uh, is a rational polyhedron. And the reason is that it will, we will see that it, uh, if it preserves some killer class or ample class, then this component group is finite. Uh, for example, uh, when X is a more dream space, final or final type, or the pika number or the H11 equals to one. Okay. So, okay, let's see uh, the killer case and projective case. Okay, so now we fix the, uh, we fix the class in, uh, fix the class in the H11. Uh, space and let it be a killer class, uh, which means that there is a killer form containing this class and denote by the subgroup auto alpha x the the elements of G which pull back R, the class alpha equals to alpha itself. Okay, so this is the subgroup, and uh, and uh, we 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 can. We can use the following results. Okay, so first we consider the representation of automorphism group uh, on the second second and singular cohomology with Q coefficients or Z, co Z coefficients, and we we'll pull back and denote by the kernel auto tor x, and then we use the Hodge decomposition that H11 can be embedded into H2K x C. This is not true in general for uh, for general compact uh, complex manifold, but here we assume x is a killer, so it is okay. Mm, and so, uh, by definition, auto tor x is a kernel, so it acts trivially on the singular cohomology H2, and therefore it acts trivially on the uh, H2xc, and therefore it acts trivially on the subspace H11. And therefore, we see that auto tor x is contained in the uh, subgroup of auto alpha x. And then we apply the Minkowski's classical uh, results. Okay, the, the general linear group with Q coefficient uh, enhances, the, enhances the subgroup with auto X quotient by auto tor X have bounded finite subgroups, which means that uh, any finite, which is equivalent to torsion subgroups uh, has bounded order by a, con by a constant M and here N is just the, the, the rank of the space. Uh, we will not use the following, uh, but uh, you can see it first that uh, by Kronaka's theorem, indeed you can show that this auto alpha x, uh, the, the difference between auto, auto alpha x and auto two x is not so large. It is, it is finite, the quotient is finite. The reason is, that, uh, the reason is that if you have some automorphism G preserve this class alpha then you can, by some linear algebra, you can show that the pullback action on this, uh, this vector space is diagonal, diagonalizable and uh, uh, all the eigenvalues have been modulus one. And then note that since, you, since the eigenvector, eigenvalues can be obtained by the action on H2, the single cohomology with Q coefficients. So the eigenvalues are algebra integers and therefore you can see that they are uh, then you can apply Kronaka theorem to show that uh, all the eigenvalues are rules of unity. And in, in particular, after some iteration, eventually it, it is the trivial action on H2XQ. Here, you also need some burn size theorem, okay? So now we have discussed the blue part, the relation, uh, the blue part, auto tor, auto alpha, and auto. So next, we will discuss the relation between auto zero and auto tor. Okay, the following is the important theorem by Fujiki and uh, Lieberman uh, independently. Now they show that uh, if alpha is a Kähler class, then the auto alpha, the automorphism group pre preserving this Kähler class 
uh, has only found many components. Okay. And uh, uh, in the case of projective varieties, especially when the base field has arbitrary characteristic uh, in positive, positive characteristic, uh, so if H is an ample class in the narrow survey group, uh, narrow survey space, then uh, the automorphism group fitting this ample class has also only finite many components. Okay, here is some re re remarks. The above results uh, also hold when alpha or H is only assumed to be big. Later, I will introduce the definition of a big class. Uh, this is uh, simple because if we pull back by some linear algebra, you can show that if the automorphism group fits this uh, big class, you can show that uh, it action, it action uh, on the uh, narrow survey or H11 is eventually, is virtually uh, a trivial action. So we have the auto alpha or, uh, X quotient by auto to X is still finite, okay? And then we can see that uh, this group virtually preserves some ample class or killer class. Uh, then we can use the result of uh, the, the Fujiki lemma or this one. Uh, but here, the proof requires uh, uh, essentially requires the requires the existence of a killer class or an ample class. Okay. So okay, but anyway, now we have a positive answer to the following question for killer or projective case. So the question, general question is that if X is a compact complex space, uh, so we ask whether the component group have bounded finite subgroups. And this statement has have a very, has a lot of applications, and we will see it later. Okay, now we come to our today's the main topic uh, on Fujiki's class. So, um, uh, I will sure. uh, first give some. Okay, I have a question. Okay. So in your previous slides, you you mentioned the question. Uh, component group have uh, bounded the finite subgroup. I think this is is this the same as a, it's a finite because in your previous or previous re result like Fujiki Nimbaman, you only mentioned that the quotient group is finite. So mm. the quotient group is finite. Uh, I think they are different, right? Oh, uh, this is this is a subgroup of auto x. This one says that auto x uh, uh, how to say? Yeah. Um, you, if so auto, auto tor, yeah, if you say if you prove the auto tor x quotient by auto tor x has only finite many components, then you can prove this question. Yeah, this they are equivalent somehow. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay. But this is a more general argument because this the auto alpha auto tor is just a uh, is just a tool of, for us to uh, to help us to understand this component, the, the total component group. Okay. So this is a, a more general question. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Now let me introduce the definition of Fujiki class. Okay. Uh, uh, here I give four equivalent definitions. So a compact complex space X here I don't assume X to be sing uh, to be smooth, and uh, for short I simply say it is a, a Fujiki space or Fujiki manifold. If one of the following equivalent definition holds, first. Uh, this is the original definition that it is the meromorphic image of some killer manifold. Okay, and the second one is uh, you can say it is a bimeromorphic image of some killer manifold, and uh, uh, you can also you can also say that X admits a killer model. Uh, then you further require this bimeromorphic holomorphic map to be uh, this this bimeromorphic map to be well defined, or, or just say it is holomorphic, and. Uh, these three are also equivalent to the following definition by the Mayan point. Okay, they show that if you find a, for example, here I here I here I add the bimeromorphic holomorphic map x prime to x, uh, because I don't assume the singularity of x. But if you uh, simply assume x is smooth, a smooth Fujiki then uh, this equation is simply that X admits a, one, a big one one class, then it admits a killer model, okay? Okay, so why Fujiki uh, is important? Uh, because it is, uh, uh, this class is close undertaking uh, closed subspace. 
or meromorphic image. So for example, if recently, if you want to run the minimodal program, you, you always get singularity, then you can work in the category of Fujik class. Okay. okay, so let me explain the definition of big class. So first uh, we are, uh, uh, so, so uh, now we work on a compact, a complex manifold, then, and uh, fix the positive definite Hermitian form omega, and let alpha be a closed real one one form. Then we define that uh, the class alpha is killer if alpha plus i partial partial bar phi is greater or equal than epsilon omega for some smooth function phi and uh, epsilon greater than zero. And its class is big if it contains a killer current uh, in this uh, still alpha plus i partial partial bar phi. Uh, greater or equal than epsilon omega. But here, phi is only assumed to be a quasi plural sub, sub, subharmonic function. Okay. So clearly, killer implies big. Okay. Uh, I know that if x is the motion, uh, uh, which means it is a meromorphic image of some projective variety, then uh, one can choose its scalar model is further projective, okay? And uh, in dimensional two case, if you assume uh, the, uh, if you consider the smooth Fujiki surface, it is always scalar. And, and therefore smooth, uh, smooth motion surface is always projective. Okay, so here is a construction of a, a non-projective or non-killer motion and threefold uh, on an arbitrary, on an arbitrary uh, projective variety. Uh, so first, uh, keep, uh, for example, you, you consider the projective threefold, okay, and uh, you let C be a noodle curve with singular point uh, P, and uh, this noodle curve have two, uh, have two tangents around this P, and A, uh, the two tangents are A and B, and denoted by the two an local analytic components. And then we block this threefold near P uh, by blowing up the, A, the, the component A first, and then block the, the second component B, and outside the neighborhood, it is a smooth curve, and then you can, you, you, you simply block this C, and you glue this, you glue this data, and you get a smooth compact a complex manifold. However, this manifold is no longer projective, although it is a bi, bi holomorphic to the, uh, bi meromorphic to the projective threefold. This is because uh, uh, here in, in this graph, you can see that, uh, L is the general general fiber, uh, the pre-image of the general point on the uh, on the blow up uh, blow up component A, and M is a general member on the blow up component B, and then you the P and L zero and M zero is you will find that L zero and M zero is just the pre-image of P, and by since we have the order, we blow up A and B, A first and and secondly blow up B, then you see that L is numerically equivalent to L0 plus M0, and L is a general member, so L M are general members, so they are also numerically equivalent. And since we blow up uh, uh, B secondly, so M is numerically equivalent to M0, sorry, this is numerically equivalent. And therefore this implies that this special line, L0, this special curve L0 is numerically trivial, and this cannot happen in projective varieties. Okay. So this is a, a classical construction of uh, uh, non killer or non projective uh, motion three uh, motion variety. Okay. Okay. okay later, we, uh, you can think about the, when you study the automorphism group and you can think about the, uh, the, the killer class or the killer current and the automorphism group and auto zero, etc. Okay. okay. Now let me state my main, uh, uh, the, the main results. Okay. So let X be a Fujiki manifold and the alpha, uh, okay, and alpha is a big class. Then we say that there exists a bimeromorphic holomorphic map uh, from X prime to X, such that X prime, X prime is a, killer a compact Kähler manifold and uh, the auto alpha X leads to holomorphic to an action on X prime. Uh, here is some remark, okay. And our pi is obtained by a successive auto alpha equivalent blow-ups along smooth centers. Mm. 
uh, oh, so the so the exceptional part is the simple normal crossing. Okay, everything is good, and the lifting is holomorphic. Okay. Uh, uh, this is this can be obtained naturally if one simply can simply can uh, lift the, the group action to x prime. Okay, and uh, and also we can compare their auto zero part. So auto zero of x prime is isomorphic to auto zero x, while the while the pi you can you you can push push down or pull back. Okay, and uh, this is not true. This this commonly is not true in general when x has some very bad singularity. For example, has non non normal singularities. So in this case, in this situation, we uh, we cannot uh, only assume that x is uh, uh, just the Fujii space. So this result can be uh, this result can be general to when X has normal uh, singularity, but cannot be uh, but cannot be easily uh, applied to the normal singularities. Okay. So therefore, uh, we can see that the component group. But here we only con con uh, consider the small component part of the auto alpha X quotient by auto zero X is a sub can be viewed as a subgroup of the Automorphism group of X prime preserving this uh, the class pi pro back alpha and this is also a big class okay and uh, as I have just mentioned uh, if we know X prime is scalar and the pi pro back alpha is big then this component group is also a finite group so therefore we can show that auto alpha X according by auto zero X is a finite group okay. Okay, this result also is also true when X has normal singularities. Okay. Okay. okay before I uh, give the proof, uh, I would like to mention several applications. So, uh, with this equivalent killer model, I have just mentioned if X is a normal Fujiki uh, space, then we can show that the total component group has bounded finite and uh, equivalent to torsion subgroups. Okay. And with this, and with this result, we can, uh, we can generalize uh, early results on, uh, about the torsion, the total automorphism group being torsion uh, equivalent to the being finite. So still need the normal, uh, uh, normal singularities. Then we see that the automorphism group is finite if and only if the it is a torsion group, which means that we only need to check that every element has final order. And uh, thirdly, uh, here for here we don't need to assume any singularity. So let be x be only a Fujiki space. Then also, then also x has Jordan property, which means that any final subgroup H uh, in auto x has an abelian sub subgroup H prime, and uh, with index bounded by a constant j, depending only on the x itself. Okay. So another application is about the t's alternatives. But here we also need to assume normality. So let x be a normal Fujiki space. Then we can then we can show that the automorphism, the full automorphism group has the t's alternative, which means that it either contains a non-abelian free group z star z. Or it is virtually solvable, meaning that after replace a subgroup by a finite index, it is solvable. I'm not going to talk in details about uh, uh, how it how it applies. Okay. Uh, so today I'm going to focus on the proof. Amazing. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Now let, let me. Uh, let me try to explain the proof. So the first step is to find a equivalent ideal shift. Okay, the construction is obtained in the following way. First, uh, uh, first we fix our big class alpha in the Fujiki class, and by the uh, regular regularization uh, theorem, we can find a killer current T alpha plus I partial partial bar phi. With, with further analytic singularities set of type J phi, uh, the, the ideal shift J phi C for some, uh, here J phi is some coherent ideal shift 
and C is a, a number, is a real number greater than zero. Uh, and this means that we can locally write the potential uh, in, in this way, C log sum uh, the F square plus H, where F I are locally, uh, F I are locally holomorphic, holomorphic and uh, they are gen then and we did know by uh, j phi the ideal shift generated by this fj and h is a smooth function okay and then we construct the ideal shift to be the the sum of the g pullback of j phi where g runs through the all the automorphism in auto alpha x and uh, clearly when you when you pull back again, you see this ideal shift is uh, is a, is invariant. So it is this ideal shift, this constructed ideal shift is auto of x invariant. And since we are working on a compact manifold, so this ideal shift you can see it is a coherent. So you only need to choose find the many gi in this automorphism group. And, you put, uh, and uh, then you can write it as a finite sum of this ideal shift. Okay, so we will, later we will essentially use this finiteness. Okay, let me see. Okay. Uh, then, then we try to construct our killer model by using the equivalent of like log resolution. This is the essential due to Hironaka, Yostan, and Newman. So it says that uh, now we have the ideal shift J, then we can operate an equivalent by meromorphic holomorphic map sigma x theta to x, uh, which is obtained by a sequence of blowups along smooth centers, such that the inverse image of this ideal shift is an invertible shift. Um, most, more specifically, it, this ideal shift, invertible shift has simple normal crossing support. Okay. okay we, we will, uh, but here, it is, it is not important to have simple normal crossing support, but we, we all, we, what we need is uh, this is, uh, uh, this by meromorphic holomorphic map is uh, a sequence of blow ups. Okay. And, uh, the inverse image is invertible. Okay, now what we are left is to uh, prove that the, the, the new model X theta is a Kähler manifold. Okay, now we, uh, to show that the X theta is the Kähler manifold, then we need to construct, a, uh, we try to construct a, a class and show that it is a killer class. So this is the blue part is our plane. So we try to claim that this new class is killer for, uh, okay, now let me give, uh, explain the notation here. So sigma is our, sigma is our map, and sigma pullback is pullback of this form, sigma uh, uh, alpha is, is a form in our big, in our big class, and uh, D is obtained in the following way. So the inverse image of the ideal shift is invertible. So we can denote by S the local generator of this, this invertible shift. And then we define a positive current D, which is the integration current along the divisor S equal to zero. And then by the poincare Lelong formula, D can be locally written as the partial partial bar log S square. Uh, so this is our D. And the C is, uh, just what we uh, mentioned that the potential function is written in this way and C is a little number. And uh, here E is a reduced full exceptional divisor of the sigma. And then since our procedure is by sequence of blowups, then step by step, you can, sh you can find some uh, smooth closed one one form uh, UE in a class uh, in a class E such that uh, the sigma pullback omega minus epsilon U E is probably definite when epsilon greater than zero, which is uh, sufficiently small. Uh, in algebraic geometry, this is something like that. Uh, omega is uh, omega is an ample uh, on X. It's ample on X. The pullback ample may not be ample, but if you minus, but if you 
add some anti small anti a uh, small ample relative ample divisor. So u e here is a relative uh, minus u e is a relative ample, then it becomes ample. Okay, so this is algebra. Uh, this is a complex version uh, of this statement. Okay. 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 Now, now we. Now we use the a trick of book sum to show that the the uh, newly constructed class is a is Kähler. Uh, this is uh, by checking that the non Kähler locus is empty. Here, the non Kähler locus is defined to be the intersection of the singular locus of the current T delta. Uh, here, T delta runs through all the Kähler current in the in the class alpha delta. So, so, to, so now we try to find several Kähler current in this new class and check their singularities. So, as I just mentioned, uh, uh, we only need to choose find the many uh, GI, and we denote by the TI, the pullback of T. And each TI is still a Kähler current. So, TI is uh, greater or equal than some epsilon i omega. Since it is finite, so we can find a universal, uh, we can find a, a common Hermitian form, a positive definite Hermitian form of omega, such that the TI is always greater or equal than omega. So here I omit, I omit the epsilon here, okay. And then uh, we consider the, uh, we consider the current uh, in the, X delta, and uh, here Ti delta is constructed by further pull back the uh, pull back Ti and minus Cd minus epsilon Ue. Then you see this is uh, then we see that this is uh, uh, we see this is a current this is a current in the class alpha delta, and we want to check that this is also a Kähler current. Here we use the CD composition. Uh, Note that Ti is greater or equal than omega. Then we can see that the sigma propack Ti is greater or equal than sigma propack omega. Then we use the suit decomposition uh, for this almost positive uh, current. <clears throat> and then we, we can see that the divisorial part contains the contains CD. Therefore, and by suit decomposition, if uh, sigma propack Ti greater or equal than omega, meaning that Sigma propact Ti minus its divisorial part is still greater or equal than sigma propact omega. Therefore, we see that we have the uh, in, uh, we have the relation here. So the blue part, the sigma propact Ti minus CD is greater or equal than sigma propact omega. And then we need to we further minus epsilon U E, as we have just mentioned. Uh, this is the positive definite uh, Hermitian form. Therefore, we see that Ti delta is the uh, Kähler current. Okay. So, uh, so, so we have, we, so we have obtained a find many uh, Kähler current, and its potential functions can be easily written in this way. So previously it is the C log of f i square plus h, and then by our construction you simply replace f, these f by composition. Okay, and note that. The inverse image of J i generates uh, the generates the inverse image of the ideal inverse image of J. So, and the and the J the inverse image of J is locally generated by S. So these function the, uh, this uh, this these functions have have great common divisor S, and we we have this factorization. Okay, and we we write F equals to F theta times S. And denote by J delta to be the ideal shift generated by this F delta. Uh, <laughs> then we can further write down, simplify the potential function in the following way. So we see this in, inside the log, inside this one, you always have some S square. So you move this outside and you, and by cancel with this one, then you see that you can write this as C log sum of F delta square plus a smooth function. 
Therefore, the singular locus of T theta is then the singular locus of this potential, which is just the, the common zeros of these F theta, uh, which I denote by V of the ideal shift J theta. And finally, we can check the non-killer locus. Okay, so by definition, it is the intersection of all the killer currents. And here, uh, so it is, must be contained in the intersection of this finite many uh, killer singular locus of the killer currents, T theta. And uh, it is just the common zero of all the F theta, which is the uh, zero of the sum of the ideal shift J theta. And by definition, uh, this sum of J theta is just a sigma inverse J times S inverse. And uh, this is just the structure shift of, of X theta. And therefore we see that uh, this non-killer locus is empty set, is an empty set. Okay, so this finishes the proof. Okay. So here we should notice that our alpha theta is not necessarily a clear form uh, in this class. What we we find, so if you really want to find the killer form, it is obtained by the upper envelope of the, t, the current T theta I, okay. Okay, finally, I would like to uh, introduce several open questions, okay. So for, for many quite previous questions, it is enough to consider auto alpha equivalent killer model. Uh, but it's, it is still important to think about whether there exists uh, auto X equivalent killer model uh, for full automorphism group. Uh, of course, this is true when the H11 space is one because then you automatically fix some, fix everything. Uh, a weak version is, uh, a weak, version, a weak version is that, uh, can we find some big class with minimal singularity? Okay, I consult this question uh, with uh, book some, but uh, it seems, uh, seems not known. So given, and, uh, given any big classes, uh, alpha and beta, so there are two different classes. Can we find a big class gamma such that uh, the non killer locus of gamma is contained in the intersection of alpha and beta? And therefore in particular, can we find a, big class with the minimal non-killer locus. Uh, this is automatically true when your manifold is killer or projective. Okay, so because you can simply find the, you let a gamma to be a killer class, okay. However, even if this result is known, we, it is not easy, still not easy to ob obtain the auto X equivalent killer model. Um, and if one or two is true, then we can, uh, generalize the uh, conjecture on wild automorphism to Fujiki space. So a Fujiki space X has a wild automorphism G. Then a question is, can we, can we say that it, it is automatically killer? Because if it is not killer, then you must have some, you must have, you must have every big class have non-empty non non-killer locus. Then you must, you, you can, you must can find some uh, big class with B class with uh, minimal uh, non killer locus, and this non killer locus is automatically auto X equivalent. And then, and then you, you can find some G in one subspace, uh, which is uh, non trivial in X, then so it, uh, it is not a wide automorphism. And further, by the result of uh, Augusto and John, uh, they uh, they show that for a projective threefold, then it is either a uh, abelian variety or a strict labial. And the latter one is uh, expected to be not possible. Okay, but this is uh, very difficult. Okay, and then I, I guess the killer case is also true that it's either a complex torus or a strict or a strict labial. Okay, okay, I think I stop here. <laughs> Okay, I'll stop here, thank you. Okay, thanks, uh, thanks to the speaker. Uh, any question?
may I ask a question? Oh yeah, the professor gives her question. Yes, yes. Maybe maybe uh, you can speak uh, a little uh, bit louder. I'm I'm, I'm Kejo Biso and uh, oh professor. hello professor. I'm 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 in Italy, but today only today I have some duty and just uh, participate okay. from Zoom. Okay. Uh, I have a uh, very nice talk. I have one one question. Uh, can you okay. hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Uh, uh, about your open question three, can you return back? Okay. Ah, uh, so open question three is still unknown. Even if you are after your result, yeah, I don't know whether if it is Fujiki, whether your whether your automorphism will preserve the all the automorphism will preserve the non the, the minimal non killer locus, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, and another question is again question three. Uh, assume that if you prove that X is killer or you just start from Kera, Kera threefold. Uh, yeah. There was still, I see, in, in, my, in my feeling, there are still some uh, difficulty in treating uh, Kappa minus infinity case. Maybe. Yeah, yeah, Kappa I guess Kappa there is. Is studied. It, it is not fully solved for Kela case, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, still, still, still need some. No, no, no. I guess there is a. I guess, I, I guess. Your student uh, is working on this project. I I, I don't know. Maybe uh, 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 I heard Dr. from John that your student is working At on this project. Doctor has studied, and uh, I don't know the final answer. <laughs> yeah, I also don't know this expression. Uh, but I'm uh, more interested on this 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 question. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. So let me give you your show you the more geometric graph. So you see this typical mm -hmm. motion and threefold. Then this is the, the you can construct the class by the non-killer locus. I guess the non-killer locus is R0. But I don't know whether this R0 is always pre I guess this R, R, for this example, R0 is always preserved by any automorphism on, on this motion and threefold. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but uh, I'm not very sure. Yeah. Oh, so much. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, so I, I might have a question. So you mentioned yeah. uh, uh, at some point uh, for uh, this uh, uh, minimum model program. So, yeah. so, so uh, is there a kind of a minimum program for this Fuki, Fujiki class? <laughs> I, I don't think so. I, I guess uh, uh, Fujiki, but I you can I, always take a scalar model first, right? Yeah, I, I think there's some yeah, yeah. model program. Always, for they always code. start from uh, some scalar model, but with very good singularities. But for general Fujiki, you say you say KRT Fujiki. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know whether there is such an answer. Yeah. Okay. Okay. It is a good question. I think. Yeah. Uh, are there any other questions? Yeah, yes, we have one more. Uh, can can you go back to some uh, first slides? Uh, when you have a question, you say that you have positive answer uh, to the question. Maybe we should start. We should... Uh, I don't Open remember. Question. Just go. Just go. Maybe you just go back and then uh, go go to the the first slides. First slides. This one, you mean? No, uh, more. Uh, okay, second, maybe let's see. C can you go more? Uh, because there is a question, and then you say you have. Ah, uh, uh, yeah, right. This question. This so here you say you work on compact complex space, and and you say that you have positive answer to this, but uh, in the in the remaining, you you talk about Fuji Fujiki class, right? So. So do, do you have massive answers for all also for compact complex spaces in general or only for Fuziki? Uh, uh, yeah, currently we only apply this for all the Fujiki. So this this is true for Fujiki, yeah. Yeah, but we don't know, even for surface, we don't know whether this is true because of some very special, like a, a type seven, surface of type seven, we don't know this. 
whether this is true. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? So if no question, uh, let's thank thank speaker again. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, okay. So it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Professor Hiroki Sumi from Kyoto University. So he's going to talk about the random dynamical systems of uh, regular polynomial maps on a uh, complex affine plan. So uh, okay. Professor, please. Okay, uh, thank you very much. So can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Yes, yes. Okay, okay, yeah. So uh, <clears throat> I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity. And uh, so I will talk about random dynamical systems of regular polynomial maps on, in the C2 or P2. And uh, the motivation of this talk is as it follows. So uh, nature uh, has a lot of random or noise terms. And thus it is natural and important to consider a random dynamical systems. And uh, holomorphic dynamical systems have been deeply investigated. The study of them helps us to investigate real dynamical systems sometimes. And so uh, combining the above two ideas, uh, we consider a random holomorphic dynamical systems. <clears throat> okay, and uh, we want to find new phenomena, so-called randomness induced phenomena, uh, which is the uh, phenom new phenomena uh, caused by the randomness in random dynamical systems, which cannot hold in deterministic iteration dynamical systems of single maps. We want to find such a kind of new phenomena. And uh, here are some uh, other motivations. And uh, one of them is a random neutral method. Uh, that is uh, here you have, we have a uh, one uh, polynomial of one variable Fz and we want to find the roots of this Fz. And uh, you, you know that uh, we sometimes uh, use the Newton's method and in order to do that, we consider the iteration of the following uh, rational map on the Riemann sphere. And about uh, sometimes uh, this cannot work well if the if the f uh, is not if the f and the uh, initial value values are uh, not good, then uh, this doesn't work well. We cannot find uh, any root. Uh, but uh, if you add uh, complex noise here, uh, where where uh, lambda is a complex noise uh, taken from uh, uniformly from the uh, disk uh, with radius uh, with with center one and radius r, where r is a number between one half and one, so lambda is a complex noise uh, uniform uh, taken from uniformly from the disk with center one and radius r, then it really works. Actually, uh, for almost, uh, for uh, all but finitely many initial values, Z naught, uh, for almost every random sequence, uh, the, the orbit tends to one of the uh, roots of this polynomial Z. We can show that. So uh, by using this random neutral method in which we can find roots of polynomials more easily than the deterministic methods in a sense. Uh, please see my previous work uh, published in uh, CNP. And this is one of the motivations. And uh, sometimes we can consider the higher dimensional random neutral method actually. Uh, I'm working on, I, I've been working on it actually. And the another motivation is the action of holomorphic automorphisms on complex manifolds as in the previous work, uh, as in the previous uh, talks, or the, the action of mapping class groups of the Riemann surfaces on the character varieties, etc. There are some, there are many topics, are, I think so. Okay, and uh, he, from here, uh, I will introduce some notation and definitions. Let's see to be the two dimensional complex Euclidean space, and let F be a polynomial map on C2. That is, if we write f of, of xy equal to g of xy and h of, of xy, then g of xy and h of xy are polynomials of x and y. 
And uh, we say that F is a regular polynomial map on C2. If F extends to a holomorphic map on P2, P2 is a two-dimensional complex projective space. And note that uh, we regard C2 as a subset of P2 via the following canonical identification and inclusion. Okay, and uh, here is a remark. Let F uh, be a polynomial map on C2. Then and F is a regular polynomial map if and only if the following uh, condition uh, star holds. And uh, let F of XY be G of XY and H of, H of XY. And let G1 XY be the highest degree term of G of XY. And let H1 XY be the highest degree term of H of XY. Then a degree of G1 equals the degree of H1 and G1 of XY equals G1 of XY and H1 of XY are equal to zero if and only if X and Y equals to D regime. Here is an, one example. Uh, let F of XY be the following uh, map. A1 is X square plus A2, XY plus A3, XY square plus B1X plus B2Y plus B3 and C1 Y square plus C2 X plus C3 Y plus C4 where A1, C1 are non-zero complex numbers and A2, A3, B1, B2, B3, C2, C3, C4 are complex numbers. Then actually we can show that F is a regular polynomial map on C2 because in this case, uh, this one, this part, uh, this part is uh, G1, XY and this part is uh, H1, XY. So, uh, the degree of G1 is equal to two and the degree of H1 is also two. And uh, we can show that this condition uh, holds very easily, okay? So uh, this map F is a, a regular polynomial map of, uh, on C2 of U2. Okay. And uh, of course, if F is a regular polynomial map on C2, then we regard F as a holomorphic map on P2. And we call such a holomorphic map F on P2, a regular polynomial map on P2. So from now on, we consider a random dynamical systems uh, of regular polynomial maps on P2, actually. And <clears throat> in order to do that, uh, let X be the space of all regular polynomial, polynomial maps on P2 of degree two or more and dealt with the distance eta, which is defined as eta of f and g is equals equal to supreme uh, of uh, d of fz and gz, where z runs over the p2, uh, where uh, d denotes the distance from p2 induced by the Fubinist d metric on p2. And the five, uh, we denote by uh, m1x, uh, the space of all real probability measures on x. Also, we set uh, M1X, M1CX uh, to be the set of all elements tau in M1X, such that the support of tau, uh, this support of tau denotes the topological support. So that's a, a closed subset of X. Uh, is a compact subset of um, x. So uh, this is the uh, uh, this is the minimal uh, this is the uh, minimal closed subset uh, of x uh, where the where the uh, <coughs> where, uh, minimal closed subset uh, y of x uh, such that the tau of y is equal to one. Okay, and. Uh, <coughs> Okay, and we endow M1CX uh, with a topology O, uh, which, which satisfies that uh, tau n tends to tau as n tends to infinity, if and only if A, uh, for each bounded continuous function phi on X, we have that the integral of phi with respect to the measure tau n tends to integral of phi with respect to the measure tau as n tends to infinity, and uh, support of tau n, that it, uh, which is a non empty compact subset of X tends to support of tau, which is also a non empty non open subset, and which is also a non empty complex subset of X. 
as n tends to infinity with respect to the Hausdorff metric uh, in the space of all non empty uh, complex subsets of X. So, uh, anyway, so support of tau n, uh, if n is large enough, then support of tau n uh, looks like support of tau. Okay, anyway. Okay. Uh, I think this is a natural topology in M and C X, and uh, <clears throat> for each uh, tau in M and C X, uh, we consider independent and identically distributed a random dynamical system on P two, such that at every step we choose a map F according to tau. Uh, this defines a Markov process whose state space is P2 and whose transition probability P of C A from a point C in P2 to a Borel subset A of P2 satisfies that uh, P of C A equals to uh, tau of the set of elements H in X uh, for which H of C belongs to A. Okay, and uh, the easiest, the easiest uh, case is the following. So here you have uh, F1, uh, F1 and F2, and that, so first you choose a you choose the initial value Z naught, and uh, please you you have a dice and you throw a dice, and if you get the uh, odd number, then uh, you uh, you map the point Z naught under the uh, cho chosen map F1. But if you get the uh, even number. Then uh, you choose um, this map F2, and uh, you map the point under the uh, you map the point uh, under F2. Okay, so if you have an odd number first, then you have it here the first orbit. Then you throw a, you throw a dice again, and you obtain if uh, you choose F1 or F2 again, uh, uh, half and with probability half and half. And uh, so if y1, you choose if y2, and so on. And uh, you consider uh, random orbits, OK? <coughs> so uh, this is the very easiest, this is the very easiest, uh, this is the very easy situation. But even if you have this kind of uh, very Easy situation. We have a lot of new phenomena. Okay. And uh, in order to investigate the random dynamical systems of uh, a random dynamical system generated by this tau, uh, we have to consider the following things. So six uh, for each element tau in M and C X, uh, let G tau be the semi group generated by uh, the elements of support of tau. That is, uh, G tau uh, is equal to the set of uh, all finite compositions of elements of support of tau. Okay, so n is, n is whatever, and the gamma j's are elements of support of tau for each shape. And that this is a semi group uh, with the semi group operation being the functional composition. Note that this is not a, a group anymore sometimes. Okay, and uh, it is important. Uh, actually, uh, in this case, so uh, since x be the all regular polynomial maps of uh, of degree two or more, so uh, uh, this is a semi group but not group anymore, and this is a semi group with the semi group operation being the functional composition, and uh, it is important to study the dynamics of G tau in order to investigate the random dynamical system generated by tau. Okay. Okay, and uh, here we introduce the following nice class <clears throat> in M and C X. Uh, we say that an element tau in M and C X is mean stable if uh, there exists a uh, positive integer n and positive positive integer m, uh, non-empty open subsets u one blah 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 u m of p two, a non-empty compact uh, subset k of uh, union of u j. And a constant c with zero less than c less than one, uh, such that the following a and b hold uh, a uh, for each gamma one blah 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 gamma n in support of tau to the power n, we have that gamma n blah 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 gamma one of union of u j is included in k. And moreover, for each j 
and for all x and y in uj, and for each x gamma one blah 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 gamma n in support of tau to the power n, we have that the distance between gamma n blah 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 gamma one of x and gamma n blah 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 gamma one of y is less than or equal to uh, c. This c is the this c uh, times distance between x and y. And B, uh, for HD in P2, uh, there exists an element HD in G tau such that H of Z of Z, HD of Z uh, belongs to you. So if you draw the picture, the following, we have the following. So here we have uh, U1, U2, blah, 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 blah uh, UN. Okay. And uh, inside the net, uh, we have a complex subset, K. The union of these is K. And uh, if you consider uh, N words, uh, N compositions of elements of support of tau, from, your, from the union of UJs, then uh, this map gamma and blah, 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 gamma one is a uh, contraction map from the union of UJs to into this uh, complex subset K of union of UJs. Okay, so here we have a very mild situation, and and for every for for any initial value t in the P two, uh, there exists a nice map H Z in G tau. Gita was the uh, semi group generated by the elements of support of tau, uh, which carries uh, this point D into this nice region, the union of UJ. Okay, once you have the, uh, the image in the union of UJs, after that, uh, so every orbit uh, behaves very mildly because uh, gamma and blah blah, uh, inverse, all inverse, all n compositions of elements of support of tau is uh, contraction. Is a contraction map. Is a uh, are a contraction map. Okay, this is the figure, and I and then um, one might one may think that uh, this condition is very very mild, so uh, it seems sometimes uh, very strong, but actually uh, we can we will see that uh, this uh, this situation is so common, uh, actually. If we consider a kind of class uh, in tau, uh, so this is this is the generic figure. We will see that later. In order to uh, see that, uh, we consider the raffling. We might do let ms uh, be the uh, let ms uh, be the uh, set of all elements tau in ms cx and set that tau is mean stable. Then ms is non-empty and open in ms cx o. Uh, openness is easy to see, okay, uh, and the non-emptiness non uh, we will see uh, in the following example. Uh, let f1 and f2 be two elements in x uh, defined by the following thing. f1 xy is x square y square, and f2 xy is equal to uh, one quarter times x square and one half times y square. And uh, if you draw the picture of y uh, the P2. This is the figure of P2. And this is the, the origin in C2. So this is the uh, 0, 0, 0, 001. And this is the uh, 100. Zero, zero. And this is the 010. Then those three points are common attracting fixed points of F1 and F2. So uh, here uh, you have a common attracting, a co common attracting basin for F1 and F2. I mean, if you take any initial value from here, then every orbit, every random orbit tends to 0, 0, 001. If you take initial value from here, then every random orbit tends to 1, 0, 0. And if you take orbit, if you take any initial value from here, then every random orbit tends to zero one one. Okay. And uh, for the 
dynamics of F1, uh, if you consider the Bayesian boundary, then uh, the Bayesian boundary is like this. So this is one and this is one. And uh, if you consider the Bayesian boundary of F2, then the, the figure is different, actually. Uh, The, the Bayesian boundary is like this, so different from the uh, blue one. And since the, those Bayesian boundaries are different, so uh, if you take any, any initial value uh, from G naught, whatever it is, uh, there exists a nice map uh, HZ, which carries uh, one of those common, attract, a common attracting neighborhood, okay? So uh, we can show that uh, let the, uh, this tau, uh, that, that's the one half times direct measure at F1 plus one half times direct measure at F2, where delta Fi denotes the direct measure concentrated at Fi, uh, for HI, and uh, then tau belongs to MS. The tau is a mean stable one. Okay, we can show that. Okay, and, and here is an open problem. Uh, is MS dense? Is the MS dense in M1CXO? Or was the uh, topology I introduced here? Okay. Uh, a kind of natural topology in M1CX. And uh, here is a remark this kind of statement is true for random dynamical systems of one dimensional complex polynomial maps on P1. Actually, the limit sphere of degree two or more. Uh, please see my <clears throat> previous work uh, published in Advanced in Mathematics in 2003, one, uh, 2013. And uh, please also see my, <clears throat> please also see the Takayuki Watanabe and um, my work. And me, um, and Takayuki Watanabe and uh, my work uh, published in Non Linearity in 2022. Okay. And uh, so uh, this kind of thing is okay. Uh, hey, okay. You can uh, uh, we have a question? Yes, yes. So just a question about the, the open problem and in, in particular, the one dimensional version, which is yeah, not yeah, open yeah, apparently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so it's known that there are maps with uh, Julia sets, one variable map, polynomial maps with Julia yeah. sets of positive area. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So one thing this one dimensional thing rules out is that you could have two maps, two different maps, who's the different the, maps. Yeah. Where it's, the it's, Julia it's, sets, it's, the, the intersection of the Julia sets had positive area. Um, I mean, so uh, since uh, we have, we can have a lot of, we can have a lot of maps. Yeah. So uh, even if, even if the one of the maps, uh, even if the one of the maps, uh, Satisfied that the Julia set of it uh, has a positive area. Oh, uh, right. I, another map can help us. Right, right. Yeah. yeah. And it's just, uh, okay, I see now. It's yeah. not just yeah. those two. Thing. It's just that, it, you know, yeah. F1 and F2 might be a problem, but F1, F2, the one that would then, okay, right. so, I understand. So, Sorry. Yeah. That yeah. kind of thing, that kind of idea really works. Uh, yeah. We will see that later. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so, uh, Anyway, uh, uh, let us proceed and uh, let P1 infinity uh, be the uh, line at the infinity. So, so this is the, you know that uh, this is the figure of P2 and uh, the line at the infinity is of course, you know, uh, this part. Uh, So this is this was the zero 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 one, and uh, uh, if you consider this part, then uh, if you uh, consider that any 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 element f in x, then uh, f preserves this uh, p one infinity, and the f inverse of p one infinity also equals to uh, p one infinity, and uh, if you consider any neighborhood uh, b of p one infinity, uh, there exists there exists an open neighborhood c of p one infinity. Uh, with C included in P, B such that 
the closure of FC is included in C. So the, the figure is, uh, the figure is, uh, if you consider that uh, here is a B, uh, there is an open neighborhood uh, inside open neighborhood C inside the net, which is invariant under uh, F, like this. <laughs> okay. Uh, but uh, here we we might have a Julia set here. So uh, situation, even if we have this kind of thing, uh, the situation is not so uh, easy still. Okay. Anyway, uh, <clears throat> and here comes the, uh, another definition. Uh, let psi be the set of all uh, elements tau in M one C X satisfying the following condition. Uh, there exist two monotony open subsets U and V in of P1 infinity and then uh, element N in, uh, and, and then positive integer N such that all of the following one, two, three hold. One, and the cardinality of P1 infinity and minus U is larger than or equal to three. And uh, the second, uh, the closure of V is included in U where the closure of V denotes the closure of V in P1 infinity. And three, and for each gamma one, blah, 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 gamma n in support of tau to the power n, we have that the gamma n, blah, 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 gamma one of u is included in three. And the situation is, uh, so here is a p1 infinity, and here is a u, and inside in it, you have a v, and uh, n compositions of elements of uh, support of tau. Uh, <clears throat> maps this u into this uh, v. So if you consider the hyperbolic matrix on ev every connected component of u, uh, we, we immediately see that uh, we have a common attractor inside v or inside v. Okay, so uh, we can see that psi is a non empty open subset of M and C X O. So in uh, so I, I, uh, in this talk we consider this class uh, this set psi. And in this psi, uh, we 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 want to solve uh, this open problem. Inside of this class, we want to solve this problem. So this this is what I want to uh, <clears throat> do in this talk. And uh, psi is non-empty. Why? So here is an example. Uh, let y be the set of all regular polynomial maps uh, f of the following form f of x, y is equal to a1 x squared plus a2 x, y plus a3 y squared plus b1 x plus b2 y plus b3 c1 y squared plus c2 x plus c3 y plus c4, where a1 c1 are non-zero complex numbers and then a2 blah 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 c4 are complex numbers. Note that y is isomorphic, canonically isomorphic to c, uh, c, c minus zero uh, squared times c to the power eight. And let a tau be a royal probability measure on y with complex support. Then we can we can show that tau belongs to this class psi because uh, in fact for any uh, for any f in y of the above form by of the uh, identification p minus infinity is isomorphic to the Riemann sphere uh, by of this uh, <coughs> respondents uh, f restricted to p minus infinity is equal to the map z to the z two. Uh, one over c1 times a1 z squared plus a2 z squared plus a3 on c hat and so a uh, 100 in p1 infinity is a common attractive point of any f in y so from this kind from this fact uh, we immediately see that tau belongs to this class psi okay and uh, there are, uh, we have another uh, we have a lot of lot of uh, examples of elements of tau uh, elements of psi <coughs> okay and uh, here comes the main theorem. Uh, let A be the uh, let A be the intersection of psi and MS. That is, uh, A be the A is the set of all elements tau in psi such that tau is mean stable. Then A is open and dense in psi. So those, this density in psi is the main part of this main theorem. Okay. And moreover, for each mean stable tau in M1 C X, in particular, for each tau in A, we have all of the following statements one to eight. One, 
uh, there exists a constant c tau with c tau uh, less than zero, such that the following holds. Uh, for each d in P2, for each initial value z in P2, there exists the Borel subset P tau z of x to the set of positive integers with infinite product of tau of P tau z equal to one, such that uh, for each gamma one, gamma two, and so on in P tau z, we have that uh, the limb sweep of one over n times log of the norm of the derivative or differential of gamma n blah 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 gamma one at z is less than or equal to c tau, which is negative. Uh, here for each f in uh, x and each d in p2, we denote by the, uh, this one, uh, the norm of the differential of f at z with respect to the Fibonacci tree metric in p2. So uh, the, the approach uh, for every, for each initial value z, for almost every uh, random orbit, the, the approach of the exponent at z is negative and the constant is uniform, okay? So the situation is very, very mild. And uh, we cannot have this kind of thing for a uh, deterministic, deterministic iteration dynamics of F in X because we have a Julia set. And the second, uh, for HD in P2, uh, there exists a borrowed subset C tau Z of the X, X, X to the power, X to the set, to the power, the set of positive, positive integers with uh, infinite product of tau of c tau z equal to one, such that for each gamma in gamma equals to gamma one, gamma two, and so on in c tau z, uh, there exists a number, a positive number r, which depends on uh, tau z gamma, satisfying that the diameter of gamma n blah 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 gamma one of b of z r tends to zero as tends as n tends to infinity exponentially fast. So the here is a b z r. And if you consider them the orbit, if you consider images, forward images, this shrinks, okay? And where BZR denotes the ball with center Z and the radius R with respect to the distance D induced by the Fubini study metric on P2. And for each subset A of P2, we set diam, diam A, the diameter of A, that is the supremum of D, D of the XY, uh, where D denotes the uh, distance D induced by the Fubini's to the metric. Uh, and, and the supremum is taken over uh, all elements XY in YA. Okay, and then three, three, and let mean tau be the set of all minimal sets of tau. Then uh, the set of the, the cardinality of minimal sets of tau is finite. Okay, so we only have a week, we have only finitely many minimal sets of tau. Here we say that a non empty contact subset L of P2 is a minimal set of tau. Uh, if for its D in L, we have that L is equal to the closure of the digital orbit of Z. Okay, uh, we cannot have this kind of situation uh, for a deterministic, deterministic iteration dynamics of a single map F in X. And for, uh, for H D in P2, there exists a borrowed subset D tau Z of X to the set of positive integers with infinite product of tau of D tau Z equal to one, such that for H gamma one, gamma two, and so on in D tau Z, the distance between gamma one, blah, 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 gamma one of Z uh, and the union of minimal sets of tau tends to zero as n tends to infinity exponentially fast. And five, and let CP2 be the balance space of all continuous complex valued functions on P2. Uh, we here, this is an uh, arbitrary point in P2. This is uh, important. And let CP2 be the balance space of all continuous complex valued functions on P2 and dealt with the supreme norm. And let M tau uh, be the linear operator on CP2 defined by the following. Uh, for each phi in CP2 and for each point Z in P2, m tau phi of z is equal to the integral of phi of h z over a over x, uh, where the variable, uh, where the, uh, with respect to the major tau, where the variable is this h, okay? This is called a transition operator. Uh, this is called a transition operator. Uh, of tau. Uh, this is the important thing in uh, Markov, Markov chain or Markov process. 
And uh, then there exists the finite dimensional subset, subspace of the tau, which is not 1.0 of CP2 with m tau of m, m, m w tau equal to w tau, such that for each pi in CP2, uh, the, the sequence m tau and pi tends to w tau, as n tends to infinity. Uh, so here, uh, we, uh, so here we have a since since it uh, here we have a since it uh, w tau and for each uh, phi uh, initial function uh, the orbit of this one uh, under the duration of m tau tends to this thing subset thing finite subset of w tau and also the map new to w new is continuous on ms ms was the set of all minimal Oh, MS was the set of all. Jimmy, uh, uh, yes. we have a question from audience. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Hi, so, so do you have examples where W tau is of dimension larger than one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. So it's not necessarily, uh, that later. Not necessarily yeah. an, an eigen, uh, one dimensional eigenspace. Uh, so this, this is not, a, uh, in general, this is not a one dimensional subspace, right? In general. Okay, so you, you don't right. have like spectral gap type of. Uh, we have a spectral gap type uh, argument. Uh, we have a spectral gap result in, if you work on uh, uh, Helder continuous functions. Uh, I, I will show that later. Okay, oh, okay. okay. thank you. Yeah, yeah. And uh, the map new to W new is continuous MS with spectral Excuse me, oh, Excuse yeah. me. also, uh, yeah. sorry, I'm trying to understand and I work more in real dynamics. So I'm trying to reconcile this. So is this a WT in the complement of your open and dense set? Uh, this, this is a, uh, this is a finite subspace, so uh, this is a thin, thin subspace. Yes, yeah, so it is. So the complement of this one is a uh, complement of this one is a uh, uh, open and dense, open and dense in the CP two, of course. And, and W T is in the complement of your uh, of the space that you defined, where you have contraction, or not? Uh, I don't understand. Oh, w T is just a space of test functions. Yeah, ah, yeah, okay. yeah, I thought it was a yeah, yeah, yeah. double tau. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Okay. Sorry, I missed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And this, this, and the next one. Uh, there is a number alpha between zero and one such that the following A, B, C hold. And uh, A, the space double tau in five. This one, uh, double tau. This one, uh, uh is included in the Banach space C alpha P two of all alpha Helder continuous functions on P two and dealt with alpha Helder norm. Maybe you know alpha Helder norm. And B, and for each phi in C alpha P2, and the sequence M tau N phi tends to W tau exponentially fast. Thus, M tau on C alpha P2 has the spectral gap property. So, uh, as I said before, uh, I mean, so uh, if you consider the spectrum of the map M tau on C alpha P2, and the figure is like this. And so here is the unit circle, and here is the finite, finitely many. Uh, eigenvalues of m tau and the inside in it uh, the rest part of the spectrum is like this okay okay now this is for the spectral gap property so we have a very mild situation with respect to that uh, with respect to the uh, this transition operator and, and let's see for each l a minimal set l for each minimal set l of tau and uh, let TL tau be the function of probability of tended to L. That is, uh, T, uh, for each Z in P2, TL tau Z is equal to the infinite product of tau of the set of elements gamma, gamma 1, gamma 2, and so on in X to the set of positive integers, uh, such that the distance between gamma n, blah, 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 gamma 1 of Z and L tends to L0 as N tends to infinity uh, for each Z in P2. Then, uh, this is called a function of probability of tended to L. Then, uh, this function TL tau belongs to this W tau, okay? And so th th this W tau is included in C alpha P2. So TL tau is a alpha Heller continuous function on P2. So, okay. I will show the uh, uh, example and the picture later. And uh, let F of G tau uh, be the set of elements G in P2 uh, for which uh, there exists a neighborhood U such that G tau is equal continuous on U. With respect to the uh, distance t, distance t induced by the Frobenius d metric on P two, and this is called a Fatou set of the Senegal of G tau. And this is important. 
Then for each L, uh, for each minimal set L of tau, and for each connected component U of F of G tau, there exists a constant C U in the one interval such that P L tau restricted U is equal to constant C U on U. Thus, uh, P L tau is a continuous function on P2, which varies only on J of G tau. That is the a complement of a fatu, a fatu set. This J of G tau is called a Julia set of semi of G tau. J of G tau is also important. And eight uh, for each gamma equal to gamma one, gamma two, and so on in X to the set of positive integers, let F gamma uh, be that uh, set of elements, set of all elements B in P2 for which there exists neighborhood U such that gamma and blah, 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 gamma one in U uh, is equally continuous on U. This is called a fatu set of the sequence gamma. Then uh, for an infinite product of tau almost every gamma in X to the set of positive integers, we have that the four dimensional Lebesgue measure of the complement of F gamma is equal to zero, where lib four denotes the four dimensional Lebesgue measure on P2. So this is called the Julia set of gamma. This, this P2 minus F gamma is called the Julia set of gamma. So uh, for almost every gamma, uh, the Julia set of gamma has zero measure, okay. Okay, and here is an uh, important remark. None of statements one to six in theorem seven can hold for deterministic dynamics of a single map F in X. In fact, in the Julia set of F, uh, we have a chaotic phenomenon. Okay, one to six was uh, this kind of thing. Uh, negative Lyapunov exponent for each Z in for almost every sequence and uh, diameter shrinks for each z and the minimal set we only have finitely many minimal, minimal sets uh, in the usual iteration we have uh, infinitely many periodic cycles so on. and therefore uh, we only have a fi finitely many minimal sets and uh, if for each z uh, orbit for almost every orbit tends to the union of finitely many minimal sets and uh, we have uh, this kind of uh, linear operator string and the uh, spectral gap probability thing we don't have for a usual iteration case. Okay, and uh, so uh, we we can we found uh, new phenomena in random dynamical systems caused by randomness. Okay, uh, many kinds of maps uh, works together in uh, <clears throat> to make such a kind of new phenomena. Okay. And the rough idea of the proofs of theorem seven is as follows. To show the density of A in Psi, that was the main part of the main result. And let tau be an element in Psi. Let uh, L be a minimal set of tau. Uh, I will show you the very rough idea. And if L is attracting for tau, then even if we enlarge the support of tau a little bit and we obtain a new new in Psi, uh, there exists a minimal set L new of uh, new close to L, which is still attracting for new. Attracting minimal set, minimal set is like this. Attracting minimal set, I mean, uh, here is a minimal set L, and attracting means that here we have uh, uh, some neighborhood of it, say U, and if you consider uh, any initial value from here, then every random orbit tends to L. This is the attracting minimal set, okay? And uh, if L is not attracting for tau, then if we enlarge the support of tau a little bit and if we obtain a new new in psi, then L is broken. I mean, there is no minimal set of new around L. Thus, uh, if we enlarge the support of tau a little bit and we obtain a new new in psi, then every minimal set L in new is attracting. Once you have such a kind of situation, then it is easy to see that new is mean stable. Mean stability was that this kind of thing. This is the this is the uh, de definition of mean stability. Okay, you know. Okay, and so thus the in in this way we can show that the set of all mean stable elements tau in psi is open and dense in psi density was the difficult part okay 
and the summary, uh, we introduced the notion of mean stability in, in the independent and identically distributed random holomorphic two-dimensional dynamical systems. And we can see that the generic random dynamical system of regular polynomial maps on P2 having an attractor in the line at infinity is mean stable. And if a random holomorphic dynamical system on P2 is mean stable, then for each G in P2, for almost every orbit starting with C, the Lyapunov exponent is negative. Or if a random holomorphic dynamical system on P2 is mean stable, then for any Z in P2, the orbit of the direct measure at Z under the iterations of the dual map of the transition operator, transition operator was the, uh, this one. This, this is the transition operator, this one. Uh, the, the dual map of the, the iteration of the dual map under the iterations of the dual map of the transition operator uh, the, uh, converge, uh the, the orbit of the direct measure at z under the iteration of the dual map of the transition operator converges to the periodic cycle of probability measures. And note that the statements of three and four cannot hold for deterministic, deterministic dynamics of a single regular polynomial map f uh, with degree two or more, of, of with degree larger than or equal to two. So uh, we see many uh, randomness in this phenomena, phenomena in random dynamical systems, which cannot hold for iteration dynamics of single maps. In this talk, uh, we have seen randomness induced order. So a kind of order caused by randomness. So uh, actually, uh, mechanisms, so the mechanism is as follows. Many kinds of maps in one random dynamical system automatically cooperate together to make the chaoticity weaker in this case. And we call such phenomena a cooperation principle. So uh, in this setting, cooperation principle uh, works well. So one may think uh, if you have that kind of thing, then uh, the situation is very, very mild and so easy to understand. We don't have any uh, <clears throat> discussion at, uh, around that. Is it right? But actually, uh, it's not so important. It's not so. <clears throat> it's not so easy. Still, if if you have this kind of situation, I mean, uh, here you have uh, T L tau, uh, the the function of probability of tending to infinity, and uh, this one sometimes uh, T L tau does not belong to uh, uh, C alpha C alpha p two if alpha is close enough to one, and uh, actually uh, if alpha is close enough to one, then uh, uh, <clears throat> that m tau, the iteration of the m tau does not have spectral gap property on C alpha P2 if alpha is close enough to one, okay? So the situation is so complicated. I mean, uh, <clears throat> so uh, we still have a kind of complexity. So we have to comp consider uh, gradation between chaos and order in this case. We have to consider weak chaos. And uh, actually, uh, this is a references list. And uh, uh, this is the example of uh, the TL tau in, in one dimension. So uh, this is called a devil's Colosseum. This is like a Colosseum and a and also this looks like a devil's staircase. I mean, so this is the function, this is the uh, graph of the function of the uh, probability of tending to infinity uh, with respect to that random dynamics generated by two uh, one dimensional polynomials, F and G. And uh, this is a function, this is continuous function on Riemann sphere, actually Helder continuous function on the Riemann sphere, uh, which varies only on this thin fractal set. Okay, this is the Julia set of the semi group, uh, Julia the semi group in one dimensional case. Okay, and uh, so this is this doesn't belong to uh, C alpha uh, C hat if alpha is close enough to one actually, and uh, M tau uh, doesn't does not have a, a spectral gap property uh, on C alpha P two if alpha is close enough to one. So and actually this kind of system. Uh, can be extended to two-dimensional uh, random dynamical systems on P2. So 
uh, in this case, we still have a kind of complexity. And uh, I mean, we have to consider uh, gradation between chaos and order. This is the uh, next problem we have to tackle. And uh, references, the, this one, and all of them are regarding, uh, all of them deal with uh, one dimensional random polynomial dipole system, but uh, we sometimes, we can sometimes borrow some idea from these, uh, uh, <clears throat> these ones. And then regarding the random, uh, regarding the random, uh, yeah, random uh, Newton's method, please see this S21. Okay. And uh, regarding this uh, picture, uh, I don't, I don't know whether we, you, you can see this one. So, uh, but uh, we can, we can have a 3D, we can use the 3D printer to make this kind of 3D thing. You can try that. Uh, and then up the, up the, this is the upline sound figure, and this is called a fractal wedding cake. Up the, upside down figure is like this, and this is called a fractal wedding cake. And this is called a complex analog of the devil's staircase. And the devil's staircase is this one, you know. Okay. And we can have a lot of uh, similar things. And we can have a lot of uh, two dimensional things. Uh, as, as we have seen in this talk. Okay, uh, I stop here. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, we have a question. Uh, do you have a, a concept of um, um, random topology? Random, random topology. Uh, sorry, random uh, topological entropy. Random topological entropy. Uh huh. That's a nice question. I mean, so uh, for sequence-wise uh, dynamic, we have a uh, uh, yeah uh, topological entropy or sometimes uh, such, such a kind of thing we have. But uh, I think uh, it's not uh, enough. Uh, I mean, so uh, in this case, in this setting, so uh, the, the the topological entropy for random sequence is positive but uh, if you consider the averaged phenomena in uh, averaged phenomena of one system then uh, actually uh, this system is very very mild so uh, the the etnological entropy of whole averaged system should be zero but uh, i don't know any nice definition of topological entropy of uh, averaged system so if you have nice if you have some new and uh, nice if you have some Good idea. Uh, I would like to know that actually. Yeah, that's my answer so far. Yeah, I do have a question and the curiosity, but let me just ask you a question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm fine with the deepness of your results, but what is kind of puzzling me is your interpretation. And let me explain why. Let me take a simple uh, C1. Julia set. We have a chaotic dynamics on the Julia set. But yeah, yeah, yeah. if we look at the inverse maps, we can see mm. this, uh, mm. in, this invariant measure on the Julia set, actually yeah, many yeah. of them, as mm. what is called the, the invariant measure of an iterated function system. So now you like to call these things random maps. There is this language of uh, iterated function system in which you iterate maps according to probability, actually to various degree, uh, various construction of probability. So my question is, granted that you get very, very impressive results, how many of these results can be cast in the form of iterated function systems? And also, if I look at in this invariant measure on the Julia set as being chaotic, it is clear that the IFS is just going backward in time. So it is order, in a sense, coming, uh, coming out, not uh, <laughs> by just by rewinding the tape, if you, if you see what I mean. It is chaotic if you go forward in time. It is not if you go backwards. So uh, um, I'm kind of puzzled by your way of uh, presenting I mean, your, in, I, I repeat, impressive uh, results. I'm okay, puzzled so, from the point of view of interpretation. To me, okay, okay. perhaps uh, I'm naive, but this is not order, it's, not order, it's uh, just rewinding the tape. Okay, so 
from uh, in the one dimensional case, so you have a Julia set like this. And in this uh, Julia set, uh, you, ha you have a many chaotic, uh, uh, you have a many uh, probability invariant measure and where the, the positive exponent is positive. That's true. But uh, actually, if you add noise, so th this is the one map F, F naught. And if you add the noise like this, th this is a noise. Actually, then uh, that kind of chaotic invariant set uh, collapse. That's the trick, actually. And uh, if and uh, you know that the uh, other uh, in in red uh, in the in the fatu set you have uh, attractors, uh, attracting periodic cycle. In the if not, you know that. And uh, we can we. And the, in the, those kind of chaotic invariant set collapse easily if you add a noise, and uh, we and we just have uh, that kind of uh, attractors where the the opponent of exponent is negative. That kind of that, that kind of uh, trick we have here actually. Yeah. So uh, here in, in the in the in the Julia set of the one map, if you add the noise, uh, the, this kind of chaotic uh, invariant collapse collapses. Yeah, actually, yeah. So, uh, um, okay, I have one more question. That, oh, sorry, sorry. Hmm. So you know that if you have a uh, iterated function system. If you know the iterated function system generated by uh, contracting maps, then uh, you have a uh, invariant, invariant set and the invariant measure, and where the uh, the opponent of exponent is negative. So actually, uh, the situation is like that here, because uh, we we don't have any that kind of chaotic invariant set in in this setting. Yeah. Can I have one more question? So can yeah, you go yeah. back to your spectral gap theorem? Spectral gap, yeah, 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 yeah. So you said yes. that you cannot take alpha arbitrarily close to one, right? Mm -hmm. If alpha is arbitrarily close enough, uh, if alpha is close enough to one, then uh, there exists a, uh, then in, in some setting, in some, uh, <clears throat> in some uh, under certain conditions, if alpha is close enough to one, then uh, there exists that phi in CL, CL P2, uh, such that, that the, if alpha is close one, then uh, there exists the alpha, uh, there exists the phi in C alpha uh, P2, uh, such that uh, the alpha Helder norm, alpha Helder norm expands. Yes, yes. So, uh, uh, under certain conditions, of course. If you replace so, other other spaces like Sobolev spaces or or ah uh, Sobolev space, uh, I don't have enough. I don't have I don't have any results about on Sobolev spaces or yeah. That, that's a very important um, interesting question because but, uh, I think that I uh, any... there are some theorems by Dean and Siboni for one map that apply uh, the exact same proof apply for mm, for random uh -huh. maps. Yeah. Uh -huh, uh -huh. But uh, I don't have any results uh, uh, about that. Yeah. Yeah, that's an interesting question, but uh, yeah, uh huh. Okay. Mm, all right. Thank you. Yeah. And mm. you you said in your in your summary you said that the um Dirac delta measures converge to mm. a periodic. Uh, mm, mm, orbit, mm, mm, mm. Right? Yeah, yeah. Is, yeah. Is this is this periodic cycle on the line at infinity? Do you know uh, where the, uh, the? I mean, so I uh, it, uh, it, it, it periodic cycle uh, on the P one infinity or. Of course, and uh, sometimes in the C two. Uh, it depends on the uh, choice of tau, of course. But uh, yeah, we we have uh, many examples uh, where uh, we, for which uh, periodic this periodic cycle uh, is in uh, line at infinity and uh, C two. Uh, we have many kinds of. I mean, so uh, we have a very easy example so here. Uh, let me see. Uh, this one, uh, in this case, uh, so uh, the periodic cycle, the limit periodic cycle is uh, this this direct measure at uh, origin and the direct measure at this one 
and the direct measure at this one. This is the uh, limit periodic cycle in this case. So two periodic cycles are in P1 infinity, but one periodic, limit, limit periodic cycle is in the uh, C2. Yeah. It depends on the choice of tau, of, of, of cross part tau. Yeah. Uh, yeah, can, can I have questions? So can you yeah. go to your uh, summary page? Summary, summary, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, next, next page. Yeah. Uh, next, next, next. Okay. okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, this uh, cooperation principle. So my question just uh, maybe a uh, kind of philosophical. Uh, because so um, so this kind of cooperation principle. Um, do, yeah. do, do you know if before maybe people maybe not for maps, but maybe if they have some. Some kinds of similar principle that if you have some uh, random things and then you combine them, then they may be they may behave better than if you have some very deterministic uh, system. If uh, I mean before, if someone has some <coughs> such thing. So. Excuse me, I I don't see uh, your your question. I mean, so uh, regarding cooperation principle uh, your question is uh, what uh, yeah so my question is that uh, okay so this uh, of course you have uh, mm. system of maps and um, so mm. my question is uh, if uh, be before before this before your 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 paper then uh, yeah. Yeah. if someone else so also they have some kind of um, this idea of like if you have some some noise. Dumb things and then you yeah. can buy them and then they could behave better than if you have something mm. pretty deterministic. Mm -hmm. uh, ah, ah, okay, okay, okay. So the history regarding history. So the first, uh, first, and uh, the first researchers uh, worked on uh, who, who worked on uh, random holomorphic dynamical systems is uh, actually Fornice and Siboney, and in 1991, and they showed that uh, if you here you have a one dimensional map f naught. And, and if you add a very small noise, uh, then uh, you have a, a, that kind of cooperation principle. So that was the 1991 ETDS and the Fornice Sensibility. And, he, he, and this one is actually reference this one. Okay. And this is the first one, uh, first paper uh, deal with, which deals with, which dealt with uh, random iteration of uh, holomorphic maps. And uh, here, but uh, uh, they deal with, they only deal with uh, small noise here. But in this talk, uh, I deal, we can deal with a very big noise. Yeah. Even if you have a big noise, we still have a, uh, this kind of cooperation principle and this dis disappearance of chaos in a sense. Uh, even if uh, actually more precisely, even if a disappearance, disappearance of chaos, we still have a uh, weak chaos uh, actually, but uh, anyway, yeah. So uh, yeah, th this, is, this is the first paper. So uh, if you, if you want to see that uh, first paper, uh, then please see that uh, Fornance and Siponi paper, 1991 ETDS. Yeah, this is also very interesting, of course. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, any other question? So if no other question, uh, let's thank uh, Professor Sumi again. Thank you very much. Yeah. <clears throat> So welcome back to the afternoon session of uh, dynamical, um, all, dynamical system and system of equations. It is a pleasure to, for me to introduce a colleague and a friend, uh, uh, Professor Nguyen Vietan from uh, Lille University, who is going to talk about the long numbers of positive harmonic currents directed by singular holomorphic foliations. Thank you, Cynthia. <laughs> First of all, I would like to thank the organizers for, uh, for the a very nice invitation and this is the first time uh, I visit the Pisa and uh, 
<laughs> I appreciate very much the, the conference. Uh, there are many interesting uh, talk and uh, the city, also the city. And I, I, I also like, would like to thank all of you <laughs> for coming here. And uh, I, today I will talk about um, uh, the low number of um, directed positive uh, uh, harmonic current. And here is the plan of my talk. And it is divided into three parts. In the first part, uh, I, I will recall the background uh, uh, about um, uh, positive current and then directed positive current and low, low number, uh, etc. And in the second uh, part, uh, uh, I will state uh, some uh, main reasons and I will uh, uh, make some comment on this reason and the history. And finally, the, the, the last part is devoted to, to a sketchy proof. Uh, uh, I will outline some idea of the proof. And, and now we... <laughs> We begin by the first part, uh, background. Uh, so the main object uh, of my talk is about um, um, pollution. So first we, we, uh, we consider uh, an open set in Siena, and uh, uh, we have a, a vector f, vector fin f, uh, which is fc, uh, which is um, in component is a vector fin, a holomorphic vector fin. So uh, fc is a holomorphic function on u. Uh, uh, so we we, can, uh, we have the notion of uh, uh, integral curve. That is uh, the solution of this. Uh, uh, the curve which integrates uh, the, the vector fin. So uh, it's <laughs> geometrically it should be like this. Uh, Then um, this means that uh, uh, Z is a uh, integral curve, uh, ZT. Uh, for example, uh, each curve is in parameterized by uh, a function ZT uh, uh, from some open set in C, some open set in C uh, into e, such that uh, um, DZ, ZZT dt equal to f dt uh, for for on z from one to n. So this means that we have a, a integral curve like this. Then uh, now and here we uh, we should mention that t is a complex time. Uh, is a complex time. This means that uh, each curve here is a Riemann surface. Now I would like to uh, uh, generalize this situation to a complex ma manifold. And then now X is a complex manifold. Uh, of the of complex dimension n. So uh, I will have, uh, uh, I will cover x by, uh, by the chart U, ui, ui is uh, open set, open in x. And uh, on each chart, I have uh, a, a vector fin vi, vi is a vector fin. 
when I pick better fin. And then uh, I can uh, define the, um, uh, for example, the v, VL, VK here, and then there's an overlap. Uh, and I need a condition so that uh, I can uh, uh, glue the, the overlap, VL, VK, and then I have the, uh, the condition is that, say it's a function CK, uh, which is a holomorphic function of uh, UC, UK, uh, non vanishing function such that uh, VL uh, is the NK, VK. A cosine condition like this. And then, I, if, of course, I need a cosine condition uh, so that, uh, for example, um, and, and by this way, I can uh, glue this vector pin so that uh, if I have a uh, uh, an integral curve uh, on uh, on UL here is yeah, in the open chat UL here I have uh, UK uh, I have uh, another curve uh, on UK integral curve on UK which is defined like this then it it should be coincide in the overlap left by by the condition uh, like this, Z, Z and K. Of course, we have a condition like this. Uh, uh, and then by this way, uh, uh, I have a, um, a notion of uh, holomorphic population. Population by by curve or by Riemann surfaces holomorphic population, and then the integral curve is that uh, we we have the integral curve on on each chart, and then we we extend it uh, on by this by this you can extend every each integral curve, uh, and you have the notion integral curve. Uh, which is uh, called a leaf uh, of the population. Uh, uh, passing through through a point X in X. For example, we have a, a point X here. A leaf, uh, we call a leaf and X. So it's a immersive Riemann surfaces. And then uh, we have the notion of uh, singularity. Then uh, here we should have a uh, uh, singularity of F. This is exactly uh, the set where the the vector fin uh, uh, vanishes, and and then we, here we also have the notion of uh, singularity of the population is uh, in some uh, singularities of the population should be, for example, in the it should be uh, something singularity of the vector fin VZ. So uh, we had uh, remarked, uh, is that singularity of the population F? Uh, is a, a complex analytic set of co-dimension. Uh, greater than equal to, and then uh, um, outside, outside uh, I I will call E from the the set of singularity of of the sing holomorphic singular set outside E, uh, uh, the population have the structure of a uh, flow box like this. This means that. Uh, uh, We can uh, linearize uh, uh, the uh, the population outside the outside the singular singularity. Uh, this means that um, we have a, a, an op open set U, and in the open set U uh, uh, can be write can be written as uh, B 
time t u b is a the lift and t is a transversion t is here the transversion here and so this means that b is something like uh, in uh, uh, b is an open set in c and t is a uh, in c and the minus one open set in c minus one and and is this description only valid outside the, the singularity? And we have a, a, a description of the singularity. Uh, Uh, look, here is a, a local study. Um, so we uh, maybe can, so we have a holomorphic uh, population F uh, described by, by a vector fin uh, F equal to Fz. Uh, near neighborhood. Of, of the origin in Siena. And then you say that, uh, uh, um, the, so uh, uh, zero is a singularity. So we need that uh, uh, zero is in F equal to zero. And we say that uh, zero is a uh, um, linearizable uh, singularity. Uh, if uh, uh, under a holomorphic coordinate, uh, so maybe I, I do not write uh, um, under a holomorphic, holomorphic coordinate, uh, then we can uh, do that. F is uh, lambda z, zz, d, dz. Under holomorphic coordinate, change the coordinate uh, uh, where uh, lambda 1, lambda n uh, as a complex number, uh, non zero number complex number uh, and here's a linearizable singularity and we say that the zero is a, a weakly hyperbolic uh, if it is a If it is a um, linearizable singularity, and if uh, moreover there are some there, there are, uh, some index z k uh, such that uh, uh, look uh, the equation uh, uh, are not real. And uh, uh, the strongest uh, notion is zero is a uh, uh, hyperbolic singularity. If uh, uh, here, if there are some here, is, here we require that on uh, for on uh, uh, the equation. Are not real. So in dimension n equal to in dimension two, uh, weakly uh, when in dimension two weakly hyperbolic. Uh, uh, it's exactly like uh, it's hyperbolic singularity because in this case there's only two two, uh, two complex uh, lambda lambda one lambda two but in when uh, lamb and in dimension greater than two then weakly hyperbolic is something weaker than uh, uh, hyperbolic and now here is a singular the foliation 
And uh, now I will recall about uh, about positive current. And the low number. <clears throat> so um, for positive current, uh, so uh, um, for example, I say is a, a complex manifold dimension n. And then we have uh, the um, uh, the space uh, uh, D uh, P Q uh, I say, which is the, uh, the space of uh, test uh, um, P Q form uh, smooth form with compact support uh, in I say. and then um, a current is uh, uh, for example uh, a current. Uh, a current of uh, by dimension uh, PP, for example, uh, is a, a continuous linear form. Uh, from uh, C value, C value. Continuous linear form on uh, uh, on the space of D uh, P P I say. and then this is a current. Uh, so is um, uh, a current is a, a, a generalized uh, a form with the uh, distribution and uh, coefficient. And now I speak about the positive positivity of T. Uh, is a, a BD PP. And then I have notion of uh, positive. Uh, 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 a form like a smooth form, a form uh, which is a combination uh, a positive form positive uh, smooth form uh, is a, a, a combination, a linear combination with positive coefficient of the form uh, E uh, alpha one alpha one bar uh, E uh, alpha P alpha p bar where uh, alpha one is a smooth form uh, the one zero form uh, in ice uh, so here is a, a, a description of positive positive form is a combination with positive coefficient of, of, of this form of this this type and then uh, uh, we have it says that uh, T now T is a uh, uh, current uh, by dimension PP and, and then we say that T uh, T is uh, positive if uh, this is a uh, correspond to the notion of equally positive but um, I do not distinguish this in this talk uh, if uh, T uh, alpha uh, is positive uh, uh, for on alpha uh, pp uh, positive form 
so like this one so um, 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 uh, um so in fact we can show that the t is um, uh, a current of order zero so that, that is just means that the coefficient of this current is uh, a measure and uh, and then uh, when we we have um, uh, then when this uh, current is the coefficient is measure we can uh, talk about the mass the mass of a measure uh, etc and uh, now uh, uh, t uh, is closer if uh, dt in the sense of current equal to zero and t is uh, harmonic if uh, uh, d dct equal to zero this means that uh, uh, t d alpha equal to zero uh, for on uh, platform alpha here it means that uh, uh, t DDC alpha equal to zero for on test form alpha. And here I, I recall that D, D equal to D, D bar, and DC is D minus D bar over D uh, two I pi I. So that uh, DDC D, D bar E over two pi. That's that. In the center. So now we have the notion of uh, positive current, closed current, harmonic current, and then in in this talk uh, we we uh, we are interested in uh, directed current. Uh, That is a current is directed by a holomorphic population F, singular holomorphic population F. Then what does this mean? This means that uh, uh, T is directed. So T is a, a current a DDC, a harmonic, a positive. Current of a uh, by dimension one one, and then uh, in the description outside the singularity, we have uh, the local flow box of like this, and then the leaf is a uh, horizontal light here. Uh, uh, the leaf is parameterized by an open set B in C, and the transverse in C. Uh, T is like this, uh, and then uh, we say that the the current T is uh, directed by the holomorphic population if uh, T is uh, uh, um, can be in this integrator. Uh, for example, is um, is T. Uh, Then we t, uh, t in t bar. So uh, t have uh, this uh, description. And then here, uh, mu is a boring measure, uh, uh, positive measure on the transversion t. Uh, t is a transversion. And then uh, uh, for each t in the transversion, h t is a harmonic function, positive harmonic function. Uh, living on, uh, on poison T here. So HD uh, living on uh, 
living on this plaque uh, is this so-called the plaque uh, plaque corresponding to to t and hd is a positive harmonic function and uh, I'm sorry. And we say that uh, uh, T is diffuse. If uh, 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 the, the measure, the transversal measure, me has no atom. This means that, uh, uh, this means that uh, there does not exist a, a point T in T, such as uh, uh, me, the, uh, the measure of, of the, this single point uh, is positive. Uh, And finally, uh, I have the notion of the uh, low, low number. Uh, so now I suppose that T is a positive harmonic. Positive eh? harmonic current in a neighborhood of zero uh, or in a complex manifold. Uh, a by a bit by dimension by then pp uh, for example we, we can uh, uh, near the origin in uh, in cn uh, but this notion is uh, exists when in complex manifold and then uh, the long number of t s0 is something uh, is a, the limit uh, uh, of the mass of the uh, on uh, on the bone r divided by the uh, p two pi i p r two pi and here is uh, the the air of a uh, of a bone in dimension p in dimension uh, uh, p and then at 10, 10, 0. So this is, um, we, we take the mass of the, because it, uh, the positive current here with the uh, coefficient measure, then, uh, then we can take the mass of a measure and then we divide it by the, uh, the, the, the air of a bone of radius R. And then we take the radius R 10 to 0. Then it's called the low, low number. And then in this uh, context, uh, uh, then, uh, the reason of Le Long Skoda, uh, Le Long for positive closed current and Skoda for positive uh, pulley sub harmonic current. Uh, so that the Le Long, uh, the Le Long number of this year on the axis uh, and it's finite. It's a positive uh, number, positive finite number. And uh, I'm sorry. And now here's the, the motivation for, I, I think that I have finished the first uh, part of, uh, of the talk uh, about the background. Now I pass to the second part, uh, the main reason, the motivation of the work and main reason. And uh, we make a, a comparison between the dynamics of map, uh, uh, discrete dynamics, and uh, the dynam continuous dynamics. 
in particular dynamic of foliation. Then, for example, when you have a map F uh, from a, a, um, I say, uh, a, a measure I say is a, in down with a measure mu, and we suppose that uh, mu is invariant. Mu is a, a probability measure. And uh, mu is invariant in the sense that uh, uh, f star mu equals mu. And then uh, we study this, and uh, for this invariant measure, mu is called an invariant measure. If it uh, satisfies this, it And uh, we expect that in the good uh, dynamic system, we expect that mu is uh, when distributed is the sense that uh, it does not uh, concentrate mass on somewhere. Then, uh, and the, so um, in the similar situation in, uh, in dynamic of population, we uh, invariant measure, invariant measure should be here corresponding to uh, uh, directed. Uh, positive harmonic current. This is natural because uh, in uh, in the dis discrete dynamic uh, we have the uh, uh, orbit uh, of a point x uh, of x is a sequence of point x uh, f x uh, f two x uh, etc f n x uh, but in the in the dynamic of foliation, it should be something like uh, if you have a point X here, uh, then uh, we do not have a discrete uh, orbit like this, but we have the whole leaf uh, passing through X. Uh, this, we have situation like this. Uh. Here is the orbit. Uh, and the, the dimension of the orbit is one. That, that's why we need to, to work with the uh, uh, direct positive harmonic current. This is a current of bi-dimension one, one to reflect uh, the dimension of the orbit. Uh, and, uh, and then, uh, as in the case of uh, discrete dynamic, we need a measure mu, uh, not concentrate. Uh, uh, for example, in the equilibrium measure, the measure mu is not concentrated uh, on some, some way. And here, we, we prefer that. Uh, we expect. Uh, Uh, harmonic current uh, the current T, the current T in uh, and, uh, the dynamic of population is uh, does not concentrate on some uh, particular space. That is T, for example, uh, uh, the long of T at is equal to zero everywhere, and uh, T is uh, diffuse. That is at least uh, the, the, the mass of T does not concentrate on, uh, on one single orbit. That's why the, 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 the study of diffuse, uh, of, uh, we expect that uh, uh, the, the harmonic current is, is diffuse. That is, uh, the, it does not concentrate on one single orbit. And here. Uh, yeah, on the whole, on the whole, and it. it but it's a harmonic function, yeah. It is a harmonic function. It can be uh, some small and uh, big uh, at some point in others. And uh, yeah, 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 yeah. It's not constant. It's a harmonic function. So it's this. so here is that is the motivation and and our main reason is follow. We have here's the motivation main reason. First main reason. Now we we have the it's a local reason. Then we we have a, a, a weakly hyperbolic a hyperbolic a singularity. That is we have a vector fin f equal to uh, f z uh, associated to a a vector holomorphic vector fin like this uh, 
with fz is exactly lambda z zz d, d z z yeah uh, on uh, on dn uh, oh, d here is a uh, unit this uh, in c that is uh, d equal to uh, z uh, uh, t in c uh, z equal to one. You need this, uh, and then uh, quickly hyperbolic, uh, and then we have uh, t, uh, and quickly hyperbolic singularity. That this means that, uh, and we suppose that uh, this uh, zero is a uh, weakly hyperbolic singularity. So that is in this is uh, two indices z k such that. Uh, the quotient of the two uh, com, uh, here lambda z uh, in a complex and non zero number. So we suppose that there are two lambda z uh, with the quotient uh, uh, non, with quotient non ring. That is weakly hyperbolic singularity. And we suppose that t is a uh, um, uh, uh, positive harmonic harmonic uh, current directed by this foliation F. And uh, we suppose a condition uh, on the I I write I write here a condition. Uh, in fact, we know that there uh, in n of equal to you have uh, two separatrices, but here in in then here n is a uh, uh, I, I do not here n is a uh, uh, dimension uh, arbitrary dimension greater than two, and then I suppose that uh, t the current t uh, does not. Uh, 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 put uh, does not charge uh, uh, the invariant hyperplane uh, that's z equal to zero. That is, uh, this means that uh, uh, the mass of t on uh, uh, that's z equal to zero equal to zero. Uh, is a is a hypothesis, yeah, yeah. I otherwise not true, yeah. And uh, here, what is uh, why we call this invariant hyperplane? Because uh, uh, you you can describe the the, the the integral curve here. The integral curve here should be uh, uh, for example, we have uh, is a uh, z uh, z e e lambda uh, t lambda one t z n e lambda n t and t is uh, in a complex here we have uh, on the description on uh, on integral curve associated with this uh, linear vector field and then for example if z1 equal to zero here then we see that um, this one is only zero. That's why we saw I say that this uh, is an inv invariant uh, hyperplane. It's because it's invariant by curve. And then the con conclusion is that then the long of t zero equal to zero. And that is uh, our uh, local reason. And here, next we have a global reason. Uh, global reason. Uh, now we have a singular holomorphic population. Now we have a F with a singular holomorphic population uh, on the on the ice, a complex, compact complex manifold. Now, 
compact complex manifold. And E is a set of singularity of, of the Poisson F. And we suppose that, uh, suppose that uh, uh, there is there's no invariant curves. This is says no lift, which is an, 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 a curve, an analytic curve. Uh, suppose that, uh, we also suppose that uh, on singularity a linearizer band. Uh, this, this includes that uh, on the singularity are uh, discrete, uh, are finite. So there are only finite number of singularity and every singularity uh, is linearizer band. And hyperbolic, and even hyperbolic. And the third condition about the uh, hyperbolicity of the leaf, uh, here is the hyperbolic, hyperbolicity of the, the, the singularity here. The, the, the third condition is, uh, so says no constant, no uh, non-constant. A holomorphic map uh, uh, from C to to X, uh, such that uh, out, out of the singularity set, uh, the image uh, of C is locally uh, contained in a leaf. Uh, is some kind of a Brody uh, hyperbolicity, Brody hyperbolicity. Uh, then the conclusion of the, the global reason is that uh, for every every directed uh, positive uh, harmonic uh, current T directed by this population, uh, T is diffuse. Uh, And the long t, long, long number of t equal to zero everywhere. So this means that uh, when we have uh, um, uh, invariant uh, object uh, t, and then uh, the mass uh, when distributed uh, everywhere, it does not concentrate on something. Uh, then this uh, this should be a nice system. Uh, and then the corollary is that uh, a generic, a generic. Uh, if you if you, you have a PN, uh, and if you fix a degree uh, d greater than two, then uh, a generic uh, uh, pollution of degree d uh, here. Uh, satisfy on this condition. This means that uh, for a generic population uh, of, of a given degree D, uh, we have um, uh, some kind of invariant measure, well, in invariant current in this case, uh, which is uh, good. And the, the existence of uh, the existence of of a such guarantee is proved uh, by uh, Benson of, uh, of a current, of directed current, Benson Siboni, I think in uh, 2001. And then uh, another construction is given by Fornet Siboni in 2005. I'm sorry, I have, uh, maybe I have. Uh, I have a six minutes, something like this. And then, uh, and then we take the for example, we take this current, the existence of this current, and this current is diffuse and low, it's low number equal to zero everywhere. And is this so? Uh, 
Yeah, yeah. It's a uh, it follow it follow from a result of uh, Brunella of uh, Lisnetto. Uh, uh, so um, and um, uh, Uh, of Zona Lu. and Burnella. And then uh, uh, something like listen to source uh, says that uh, generically um, uh, the two condition I and two I are satisfied. And uh, Burnella says that uh, uh, if uh, I and two I uh, satisfy, then uh, the three I also satisfy for for the population in in Vienna, and then uh, and then that's combining this and then, yeah, mm. and then now for the first five minutes, uh, which remain to me, I will say what is a new for uh, in uh, in my previous. And uh, for the historic, uh, the theorem one uh, for for dimension two is put uh, by myself in two thousand eighteen, and and then uh, and uh, I I I should uh, uh, mention here the reason of uh, Chen in uh, 2020, it says that uh, if uh, uh, if the in uh, dimension two, if uh, uh, the singularity, uh, if uh, the singularity is not hyperbolic, uh, then uh, the low number of t may be may be uh, non-zero. So the the the, uh, the hypothesis in hyperbolic is uh, important. And the result of Ding and uh, Wu Hao in 2021 say that uh, uh, theorem one is essentially optimal. That it cannot uh, expect something better than the number zero, uh, the, the little number zero. That's if you have uh, is optimal. If the number is zero, uh, I'm sorry. Oh, oh, oh. I, I, I was wondering, um, for instance, you said you could have some non-hyperbolic example uh, with the long number non-zero. Oh, yeah. Could such an example already be with like a parabolic fixed point singularity? Hyperbolic fixed point singularity? In other words, not, uh, parabolic point is not hyperbolic. A par parabolic. Uh, um, uh, uh, because uh, um, uh, in, in the case of uh, Chen, uh, uh, this means that uh, you, uh, parabolic uh, uh, singularity here uh, because uh, um, in, in, in pollution, uh, what does it mean, hy parabolic? Hy oh, I'm taking you off of your subject. I, I'm, uh, yeah. I'll ask you later. Yeah, um, maybe uh, there's a... Uh, um, no, don't let me stop your talk. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's a it's a very nice question because uh, if uh, uh, if you have um, uh, if it's not hyperbolic, then uh, we have only here is only person reason. So maybe it's uh, some kind of uh, more uh, different uh, different than uh, non hyperbolic singularity, but we do not know. Yeah. So it's uh, it's still open here. It's only a uh, even in dimension two is a person reason and uh, uh, theorem two uh, for n uh, equal to two is known by Fornet Siboni in other work in 2010 and then for my recent work uh, I 
I prove uh, this theorem in dimension uh, uh, arbitrary dimension and the uh, vector uh, than three. And then uh, the, the new difficulty here is, uh, is some kind of phase space. Uh, uh, phase space in dimension two uh, is a phase space is uh, something to parameterize uh, uh, a leaf, uh, a leaf uh, inside, uh, inside the end. Uh. Maybe I have one minute and then I finish. And a phase space in dimension two, it should be uh, some cone like this, uh, some uh, in dimension two. But in dimension and the greater than two, uh, the phase space is very complicated. It's uh, in general, uh, phase space is uh, uh, depend on a point X. Here, the phase space does not depend on, on point X in the population. But in the phase space in dimension greater than two, uh, uh, phase space can be a polygon. Uh, 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 and X is a phase space is a MX polygon. And we only know this MX is an integer between uh, two and, uh, and dimension N. And a uh, phase space uh, uh, like this can be bounded or uh, unbounded. And then uh, here we have uh, essentially one phase space and we can use a uh, fixed uh, um, uh, uh, by, whole, by whole motion mapping to to map it uh, conformally to a uh, unit disk. And here, here we have polygons and we, of course, we have uh, uh, Christoph uh, Schwarzer. Schwarzer, uh, Christoph and Because it's a pol uh, convex polygon, then it's uh, uh, conformally equivalent to the unit disk, but the uh, schwarz Christoph and map. Uh, uh, but this one is very complicated because uh, the, the polygon is very uh, it's not not unique it can be very thin it can be very large uh, then uh, it's uh, another difficulty and then uh, there are also many many different things uh, between the dimension n equal to n uh, greater than three and then i have no time to to talk about this so i stop here <laughs> thank you are there any questions So you said that theorem one is essentially optimal. And what about theorem two? Do you expect more uh, regularity than just zero along number for global currents? For well, global current? Yeah. Uh, global current is uh, only along number equal to, to zero. Uh, I uh, maybe have some, uh, yeah, by, uh, by the reason of Ding and Vu Hao, then uh, the along number equal to zero is essentially optimal and then Maybe you cannot have something better Even locally, yeah. Uh, but global B, I don't know. Uh, mm. Global B, maybe we have something more, but because we, we, we need to, to explore uh, the fact that uh, the, the current is defined globally, mm. but uh, maybe some kind of um, compact, compact niche, uh, I, okay. I don't know. Okay, thank you. So in your global theorem, what is the role of condition three? How is condition three giving you something that condition one is not? I mean, how would, if, if condition three were violated, um, but uh, condition one was not? Uh, 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 in, uh, in condition three, if you are in CPK, in CPN, then if, uh, Condition uh, one and two satisfy, then condition three also satisfy. Is uh, the reason of uh, in, in CPK, in CP, in CPN only. And uh, if uh, other manifold, then I don't know. <laughs> yeah, maybe it's uh, some some kind of some uh, particular particular geometry of CPN uh, of the projective space. And I see, but then you would expect something with a positive long number that you didn't. Uh, the positive Want. long number uh, uh, here, if this is violated, then this means that uh, um, this because here is implies that every, every leap is hyperbolic that is uniformized by the unit this. Uh, and if it's uh, maybe there are some parabolic leap, uh, some parabolic leap, and maybe uh, 
uh, I, I don't have any reason to hunt fish. Yeah, maybe. Uh, uh, I, I have not yet thought about this. <laughs> it's a nice question. Yeah. Thank you. Other questions? Uh, maybe I have a, maybe one or two questions. Yeah. So so first, uh, so uh, you mentioned that uh, Ding Yivu, uh, the result about two more ones is actually optimal. Yeah. yeah. So so what exactly the, the statement of? Uh, uh, yeah, the statement in dimension two is like this. Uh, I think uh, essentially. Uh, So there is an in dimension two, the low long number p zero. Now, in this case, this should be say by definition, say lim at zero as the mass of t on the bone. T, because in dimension, because by dimension is one one, then it should be divided by by the, the GA of a, of a bone of dimension okay, one. Yeah, okay, it should be I query mm. like this. It's yeah. a little number, I think, it's because the T is a T is a B by dimension one one. Mm -hmm. And this is a little number, and then the result being in Vu, a Vu how say that if you have a function f given uh, a function fr depend on fr epsilon r r here, the radius uh continuous uh for example, continuous uh, uh, from uh, zero one to a plus uh, such as uh, f zero zero equal to zero, mm -hmm. then we can show that uh, uh, if there exists on way a current t uh, positive harmonic yeah, mm -hmm. and directed mm -hmm. locally. Mm -hmm. That is a local mm -hmm. such that uh, t b zero a the uh, okay, uh, greater than epsilon error. Okay, okay, okay. For on error, uh, so service so, service so, 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 one. This means that we can uh, not. For example, this means that you cannot have something like this. Uh, you cannot have some. Uh, this one cannot uh, like uh, log error uh, mm. Mm. minus one. Uh, then you can take the function is here is log r mm. then and so on, then you cannot have something better than right. okay okay so maybe maybe a second question yeah? mm. <laughs> so in a theorem two you comment that uh, uh, in dimension two uh, finesse simulate proof that uh, theorem two for, uh, yeah but uh, the, do, do they do it for for p2 or any any uh, complex surface uh, Theorem two, uh, they state this uh, for for uh, compact uh, manifold dimension two. Ah, okay. Yeah. But oh. I I I use uh, uh, their proof, uh, and uh, mm. but I have some uh, some new uh, estimate on the uh, Poisson kernel, and then I can uh, adapt this proof to dimension uh, arbitrary dimension. But it's still uh, you need uh, some more new work. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so for discrete uh, dynamics, you have several uh, notions like, for example, fixed points and then uh, pull back on community groups and uh, yeah. also pull back on uh, algebraic cycles and so on. Do you have similar things here? Uh, let's just uh, uh, fixed point uh, formulas and so on. Cycle. Maybe there's only the, the, um, uh, the sequence of pull back by, uh, by for example, um, uh, we have the notion of pull back by by a meromorphic map, something like this. We have a, we have a Poulosian which defined by by vector fin, and then we pull back the vector fin by a meromorphic map, and we have another uh, Poulosian. And then maybe we have the notion when we have a directed current on the initial 
pollution we can pull back by meromorphic map to to the new pollution something like this um thanks but, but my question is can you pull back on um uh, community groups uh, yeah, Good something night. like that. Uh, no. Uh, no, I don't know. I, I, I didn't. Or, or you have some uh, similar notion to like fixed points? Do you have? A uh, fixed point. Uh, uh, fixed point for pollution. Uh, fixed point for pollution. I have not yet. So this is a corresponding uh, oh. for fixed point. Uh, yeah, it should be nice uh, to <laughs> to study this fixed point periodic point for pollution. Yeah okay yeah yes but uh, i have not yet um, our uh, analog other questions uh, remarks comments uh, curiosity no if not we thank vitan again for thank you very people. much thank you so it is my pleasure to introduce the next speaker of the afternoon, Jonathan Owenstein from Notre Dame University is going to talk about analyzing energy landscapes using numerical algebraic geometry. Please, Jonathan, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you uh, to the organizers for organizing this wonderful uh, uh, workshop. Uh, I wish I could have been to, to Pisa uh, to see this uh, beautiful math center, as well as, uh, you know, to see the beautiful city of Pisa. Uh, I'm glad to see that my uh, colleague Jeff Diller uh, is in attendance. And so any questions that you have, uh, you know, feel free to ask, uh, ask Jeff uh, as they come up. Uh, uh, just joking on that. But uh, so my, uh, my work is more on the solving systems of equations. And what we've been doing is using a lot of dynamical systems and, and sort of behavior of the dynamical systems to sort of understand how we can do uh, best fit problems and their applications in uh, mechanical engineering in particular. And so uh, that'll be sort of the structure of, of my talk, uh, sort of how solving equations to compute critical points and then looking at the dynamics uh, from these energy landscapes can help us uh, in these applications. Uh, so let's start with a very basic understanding. So uh, energy landscape is nothing more than the graph of a function. Uh, so these arise a lot in sort of uh, molecular design, uh, trying to find how proteins fold. And so you have these, uh, potential energy landscapes and the states of minima sort of are the, are the molecules that you see uh, in practice. But mathematically, it's just a graph of a, of a function. And so these can have lots of ridges coming up. My work is on polynomials. And so these functions that we're interested in really are, are polynomial uh, functions. So from the... Uh, uh, sort of how to analyze energy landscapes. So one way is just to use an optimization method. So you have this function and you can just let things move around uh, on your energy landscape until it uh, sort of settles into uh, a local minima. On the other extreme, you can do a, a complete decomposition of the space. So you can find all of the critical points, where the gradient is equal to zero. You can look at uh, gradient ascent and descent paths uh, to be able to find connections between those critical points. And then you can combine everything in these uh, more smale complexes. What I'm looking at is somewhere in between these. So find a decomposition that's in between. A little more uh, rigorous than just using a local optimization method but not a full complete decomposition that we can use for applications, especially in things which are higher dimensional. And so it's hard to sort of visualize uh, these more smale complexes. So the goal is to find uh, a decomposition in between uh, using numerical algebraic geometry to compute critical points, and then using the dynamics coming from the gradient to be able to find some connections uh, between them. So today, uh, I'm going to focus really on uh, sort of sum of squares fitness landscapes. 
So these are the landscapes where we're trying to fit data and we fit the data by looking at sum of squares residuals. So these are the landscapes of, of interest for today. And so we're gonna look at two cases, whether it's well parameterized or whether it's over parameterized. So over parameterized systems arise often in, in machine learning applications where they just have tons and tons of parameters and they don't care whether uh, it's over parameterized or not. And so we want to look at sort of what happens in those cases at the end of end of my talk. Okay, so let's uh, let's look at these sum of squares fitness landscapes. So let's start off with a very simple uh, example. Uh, you have some data, so you have some x coordinates, and you and you take a measurement, uh, and so that gives you the y coordinates. And so you can plot those data points here. And you can kind of see that they sort of appear in some linear relation. So you want to find what is the best fit line to that. So you want to find the slope and the intercept that best fits your data. So you have your x coordinates and your y coordinates, and you take this sum of squares fitness function. This gives you a, a energy landscape, which is called the fitness landscape. And because this is a nice quadratic function, it has a unique uh, uh, critical point. So that unique critical point corresponds to this best fit line. So you can compute uh, or solve gradient of f equal to zero to be able to compute sort of this best fit line. You can do this in, in other uh, more general cases. So in general, this is what's called regression in statistics. So you have some model that you're given. So you have some model function G. It depends upon some parameters which are unknown to you. And those are what you're trying to find. And then you have the input data X and then the response or the output is Y. So this is our general form of our unknown model. So in the best fit line, the parameters are the slope and the intercept, and then this function is just mx plus b. Okay, so that's our, our general form. We think our data is of this form, but since we have errors associated to it, then we have to do this best fit. So we want y to be equal to g, but of course there's error, so we want to minimize that error g minus y quantity squared. And when you want to minimize something, you compute the, the first order condition. So you compute the gradient equal to zero. So we have solving these polynomial equations, gradient equal to zero from this fitness function. So that's the, the general setup. And so in the special case when things appear linearly, so for example, in the best fit line, our parameters appear linearly, or you can more generally think of fitting a polynomial to data. So in the polynomial case, your parameters are the coefficients of some monomial, for instance. And so you can find the best fit sparse polynomial exactly in this way. So when these parameters are linear, then this gradient is just a linear function. So you can uh, find a, you can solve this by just using linear algebra. So of course, the interesting cases are when your uh, uh, when your parameters don't appear linearly. And so uh, what we know is that let's say G is polynomial because that's the case I'm interested in. We have sufficiently large number of data points and our data is generic. Then what you know is that solution set, the number of critical points is independent of both n, the number of critical points, and the actual location of the, the data points. So this is a really nice property to have in that you can use uh, uh, parameter homotopies uh, to be able to solve this as your data changes, as your n increases, as you gather more data, you can quickly solve uh, for these critical points by using uh, a parameter homotopy. So as new data comes in, 
things behave nicely and you can just update your critical points very quickly by using uh, a parameter home utility. So this is nice, but we haven't talked about how the parameters appear. So from the algebraic geometry side, the number of critical points could either be infinite and have this positive dimensional set, or it could be zero dimensional, so isolated points and, uh, and finitely many. So we'll call the well-parameterized case, the case when we have finitely many critical points. And then the over-parameterized case is when there's a infinitely many or a positive dimensional set. So of course, when things are well parameterized and you have a, a zero dimensional system, that makes things much easier because there's only finitely many things to compute. And because of this genericity property, we know that there's a generic number of critical points. And so that generic number only depends upon the structure of, of your system. And so we'll call this the SOS degree. So we have this generic number of solutions that we can use in our, in our home utility. Of course, as we have seen uh, several times now, if the parameters appear linearly, the SOS degree is one. There's a unique critical point that uh, uh, describes the best fit to your data. So let's look at an example where the, the parameters don't appear linearly just to get our heads around uh, uh, this setup. And so the example that I wanna describe is computing concentric ellipses that best fit your data. So you have concentric ellipses and uh, you can have different uh, so-called radii of those ellipses. Of course, you know, the radii corresponds to circles, but you, know, you can think generally uh, uh, for ellipses as well. Okay, so here's the, here's the formulation that we're gonna use. So we have four parameters, P1 through P4. Uh, P1 and P3 are gonna be the axis scaling, so the major and minor axis scaling. And then P2 and P4 are the center of the ellipse. So we have the center of the ellipse, and then we have the major and minor axis scaling. And we wanna find the center and the scaling that best fits that best fits our data. So we want sort of a concentric family of ellipses that best fit our data. And so you can solve the gradient system for a generic uh, behavior, and you can find that there are 33 critical points. So there'll be 33 critical points uh, for generic data. And then you can sort through those points to be able to find uh, the global minimum. So for example, in the plot here, the X1 and X2 coordinates are uh, in the plot, shown in the plot. And then the Y coordinate is, if it's a dot, then the Y coordinate is 1.15 squared. And if it's a star, then it's 0.65 squared. So those are the two values that we want. So the way to think about this is we want an ellipse that best fits the stars and an ellipse that best fits the, the dots, but have those two ellipses be concentric. So they have the same, uh, the same center and the same scaling between the major and minor axes. So in our plot here, we have two ellipses from our two sets of, of uh, values of so this is a generic case and there are 33 critical points. Because our data is now real, not all of them are real. Uh, only 11 of them are real. The other 22 are, are complex conjugate. Of those three are local minima. And then there's the unique global minimum, which is uh, uh, shown here. So if you were going to analyze this, potentially, this potential energy landscape from this uh, sum of squares fitness function, you would see 11 uh, uh, critical points. So these include the minima as well as the, the saddles. So numerical algebraic geometry away, allows us a way to, to compute these uh, quickly. 
Uh, you can also set up non-generic behavior. Suppose you wanted all your data points, so the same set of data points, but now suppose you want them all on the same ellipse. So if they're all on the same ellipse, then we drop from the generic behavior of 33 down to 25. So the other eight solutions went off to infinity. And of these uh, nine are real, and of the real ones, you have a unique local min, which is the global min uh, shown in the plot. So there's this way to be able to compute these critical points quickly using a parameter homotopy and allow you to analyze these uh, sum of squares fitness uh, landscapes uh, using numerical algebra geometry. Okay, so now uh, comes uh, an unknown question that I, I don't know the answer to. And so how do these uh, degrees of critical points, so how do these number of critical points relate to the structure of our, our uh, function G? So when we had this best fit ellipse, we can expand it out and you clearly see that the, the parameters appear nonlinearly. The X's are, are, are data, so those are gonna be given numbers. And so it's these unknown parameters is what we're searching for. Uh, the number of critical points is 33, but if you just look at the monomial structure from them, the monomial structure would suggest that there should be 49. And so you could say, well, maybe these coefficients aren't completely generic because they're sort of related to each other. And so you could set up the same problem, but now each one of the coefficients, you put a new generic number uh, uh, with it. So you could separate all your uh, monomials and have a generic number in front of them. And sure enough, the SOS degree increases. Now it's 36 and 30, instead of 33 but it's still short of what you would expect from just the monomial structure. So I'm at this uh, uh, point where I don't understand why these things uh, behave the way they are. So if uh, people have questions about uh, the behavior of them or can sort of answer how these uh, uh, critical points relate to the structure, I'd be happy to hear that uh, uh, sometime later. So that's an open problem or open question that I have no idea uh, uh, the answer to. But what we can do is we can use this to be able to design mechanisms. So we wanna look at these fitness landscapes and design mechanisms from this. Uh, so this is joint work with a PhD student here at Notre Dame, Ervin, and a colleague in the uh, mechanical engineering department, uh, Mark. So we'll look at two different uh, examples of how we can use these uh, sum of squares degree and, uh, <clears throat> and uh, gradient descent to be able to find a best fit. Okay, so let's start with uh, uh, an example. So we're trying to mimic the behavior of someone's finger as it's moving. So, what Erevin did was he took a video of his finger moving and plotted it. And so these light blue dots are the raw data. Well, there's noise in the video capture and everything. So he, he just looked at this and said, okay, this is a quadratic fit. So I want to be able to approximate the way that a finger moves, it behaves like a quadratic function. As this angle changes, this one behaves in a quadratic manner. So what you're trying to do is you're trying to design a linkage inside your finger to mimic this behavior, this behavior. Okay, so this is what's called a function generation. You're trying to generate this function based on this input angle to match this output angle. The problem with this is that there's a degenerate solution. If you set all of these things to zero, you get this degeneracy here. And now you can twist one angle and the other angle is completely independent. And so you can fit any function you want. Of course, that's completely useless for a practical application. 
So this happens often in these types of problems is that there's this degenerate global minimum that appears. The reason that it's there is because it's too difficult to formulate all of the constraints into your problem. So like you have torque constraints, you have branch defects, you have sort of packaging, you want it to fit inside of a mechanical finger. So you have to worry about how to package it in a nice way. There's a lot of things that you can't formulate mathematically or are too difficult to formulate mathematically. So this is where our dynamical systems comes in. So if you just look at the critical points, you could have something that looks like this. Of course, this is just a cartoon. So down here, you have your global minimum, which is completely degenerate, not useful in any way. If you just use optimization, you may get uh, some other local minimum, which is inferior. You know, there's a lot of room between this local minimum and this global minimum. And so our idea is, well, instead of doing a complete decomposition of the space, why don't we look at what happens if we take gradient descent paths from these saddle points down into the global minimum? So we're gonna explore gradient descent trajectories coming from these saddle points that go down to the global minimum, but stay far enough away that they're still useful. So we don't wanna be down here where it's completely degenerate and decoupled, we wanna stay a little bit away, but use the gradient descent paths to be able to uh, search along there. So from the mechanical design, this gives the designer freedom to explore the space, but still constrain it to say a one dimensional space by looking at these uh, descent directions. So here's our sort of cartoon description of, of what's happening. You have some specification that you're trying to, to match. So you have some function that you're trying to match. You formulate this as an objective function. So this gives you the, the energy landscape there. So in our case, we're using the sum of squares uh, objective. You then take its gradient and set it equal to zero and you get all of the minima and the saddles there. And then finally, what you want to do is you want to look at how can I use gradient descent paths to move from these saddles and create a, a, a one dimensional network between them. So this gives us a network of how we can move from uh, minima to saddles and saddles to minima. We organize this into a, a graph, which we call a saddle graph. And then you can evaluate extra uh, metrics on top of those. Remember, there are things in mechanical engineering that are hard to formulate mathematically. And so you can add those as, as these auxiliary conditions and, and give a design interface on top of them. And so we designed a mathematical interface, which I'll demonstrate here uh, live and in real time. And on the back end, it uses our, our software called Bertini uh, for, for doing the polynomial system solving to be able to find these uh, critical points. So in our uh, four bar function generation, this is actually it lives in five dimensional space. So this thing lives in five dimensional space. It's too hard to visualize everything. So that's where these saddle graphs come in nicely is that in Mathematica, it can put it in two dimensions, turn it into a graph that you can then uh, visualize. So let me switch over to the Mathematica interface and show you uh, this in, in real time. So what we are able to do is we're able to pick a branch between the critical points. And then you can slide along that branch and see how it deforms into the critical points. So as we go this way, we're going to that degenerate global solution. Each angle can just move independently, so it's completely useless. 
And so you wanna be a little bit away from that. And then you can look at your function as it moves, as it moves along this curve. In our uh, base case here, we have six different uh, graphs that allow us to look at these index. And so the green part means that this is good, red part means that this is bad. So for example, let's uh, move somewhere to uh, a branch defect. Uh, all right, so if we move over here and now we can track along this curve and everything in Mathematica goes crazy because you're now over the complex numbers, things don't actually work. Uh, you can't actually design it. And so these red uh, lines here correspond exactly to these errors. You get these kind of uh, crazy things that come about because of the, the complex numbers. So those are places you want to, uh, want to avoid. But you can now track along this as it goes into the global minimum. And you can get a nice function generation that you can design your uh, finger mechanism from. So what we hope is that these saddle graphs allow uh, mathematicians and engineers to be able to give some idea of what's happening in this uh, energy landscape without having to do a full decomposition in sort of like a, a Morse complex or smale com more smale complex uh, context. It gives you some idea of, of how the saddle points connect to uh, minima and how they relate to each other, but it's not a complete picture. Like this one is an index two saddle. So the index two saddle you would think would connect to index one saddle, but that's too hard to be able to do uh, numerically. Whereas the robust thing is to go into the minima. And so that's the idea is that we're taking robust paths into the minimum and then be able to explore around that. So the hope is, is that this is a nice middle ground between just doing some raw uh, finding uh, the, the minima, local or global, or doing a full complete decomposition of the of this space. And so you're able to uh, find some really nice designs along here, uh, jump to different branches, be able to track along them, and uh, create some really nice mechanisms uh, that you can use. Uh, so this Mathematica is available, uh, uh, freely available uh, with the paper that, uh, uh, that was just published last week uh, uh, on this. So you can try it out for, your, uh, for yourself. Okay. <clears throat> so now let's look at, a, at another example. Suppose we're trying to uh, draw a straight line. Well, you can't really draw a straight line because a, a sextic uh, can only pass through six points on, on, a, on a line at most. And so what you wanna do is you wanna do a least squares fitting to a line, okay? So you wanna find a, a linkage that best fits along a segment of a line. And so you're optimizing the sum of squares residual in this best fit context here through those tests. So if we pick 100 equally spaced points and then we look at the sum of squares, there are 73 critical points there. As we change where the pivots are located, the uh, mechanism will change location, of course. And so we can just track 73 uh, paths in our parameter homotopy to be able to find the best fit uh, function to track along uh, uh, this straight line. Okay, so as I mentioned, we use a parameter homotopy uh, and change the location to be able to do this. 
And now what we want to do is we want to use clustering. We want to cluster them based on, on their design. And so one way to do this is, is with sort of these dimension reduction tools. Uh, one of them is called T-SNE, uh, which is a, a dimension reduction to visualize things in, in two dimensions. And so this is a high dimensional space that got projected down to two dimensions using this T-SNE. And then it gives you nice clusters uh, around those. So as you can see in these, it doesn't exactly track along a straight line, but from our eyes perspective, it's pretty darn close because we can use this uh, solving equations to find these global minima very quickly. And so you can create an atlas of these uh, straight line generators using this, uh, this whole process on, on sum of squares degrees uh, to be able to compute these, uh, these linkages. Uh, there are two uh, famous ones, uh, Chebyshev and uh, Watt. Uh, Chebyshev, we should all know as mathematicians, and Watt is famous for the Watt steam engine. And so they created uh, uh, two of these straight line generators, and uh, they approximately uh, show up in our, in our atlas, but of course, in a more general family. In, in Chebyshev, he took a straight line, and in Watt, he took a straight line, but of course, uh, you're allowed to take triangles there too. So these uh, show up inside of these, uh, these families there. So you get sort of this whole picture uh, coming from uh, uh, this decomposition. Okay, and now let's uh, get to the, uh, the end of my talk here. On, uh, on what happens in the overparameterized case. So in artificial intelligence and machine learning applications, what they generally do is they generally just throw tons and tons of parameters out there in, in, the, uh, in the response function. And then they use data to be able to try to uh, approximate what those parameters are. The problem is, is that because they put so many parameters on there, there's actually infinitely many uh, best fits. So to illustrate this, suppose I have sort of this two layer linear response function. So then I have two parameters, M1 and M2. And of course I can multiply M1 by any number and then M2 by its inverse and those cancel each other off. And so that gives you these uh, hyperbolas uh, of these positive dimensional uh, sets of minimum. So when you look at the sum of squares fitness, you no longer have just isolated uh, uh, critical points. You have infinitely many critical points from these positive dimensional uh, cases. And this is persistent uh, throughout machine learning uh, 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 functions to be able to, uh, to look at the parameters. In some cases, they like it because then there's a, a, a big range of things that give you the exact same thing. And in some cases, they don't because now you're getting down into uh, cases where the Hessian is no longer invertible and so you can run into numerical issues. So it's sort of this double-edged sword on, on these over-parameterized uh, uh, systems. Uh, so in some uh, recent work, uh, we sort of characterized these. So these are called flat minima. Uh, so these positive dimensional families come from flat minima. And these are just artifacts of, of continuous symmetry. So there's a continuous symmetry in the, in the parameters. And, it, and what we saw uh, here is you can multiply something by a constant and then it's inverse and those cancel each other off. So that's this uh, continuous symmetry there. And you can get rid of them by using a, a, an L2 regularization. So let me uh, sort of describe this regularization process and then how it all relates to, uh, uh, to these fitness landscapes. So we've already seen regularization in this talk. Uh, so when we were fitting uh, to the finger, 
we had this noisy data and we said, okay, we don't really wanna go through all the data points. We wanna sort of think of something that looks kind of nice. And so that's where this quadratic fit comes in. So you don't want to sort of match all the noise in your data. That's too much. So you wanna sort of look at lower degree approximations of them to get sort of just right approximations to there. So the way you do this in, in mathematics is you add a penalty function. So you add some sort of penalty function with a, with a, a parameter lambda. And so in our case, we're gonna regularize with this penalty that uh, just weights each one of the parameters. So this is this generalized L2 uh, regularization. So you pick some weights to weight each parameter, you square it so that everything is, is positive. And then you put this uh, uh, parameter lambda on there that you can take to zero to get back to the original, uh, the original function. So in this example, when lambda is positive, what happens is you get these two isolated uh, critical points. So you, in particular, one point is on sort of each branch of the, uh, of the hyperbola. And so you can use this behavior of the sum of squares degree and parameter homotopies to be able to compute those uh, points. And then you do another homotopy that takes lambda from being a positive number to zero. And what happens is these points will deform from being isolated to lying on the positive dimensional components. So you can actually return back to your positive dimensional components in this sort of homotopy that gets rid of this, uh, this weighting. So this is what a lot of people do in, in machine learning is they regularize and then they let that uh, weight or that uh, parameter lambda get sort of closer and closer to zero. And then they take that as their, uh, as their uh, uh, setup for their parameters. But it's a double-edged sword. On one hand, it's great because it avoids overfitting of your data. You're not actually matching all of the noise in your data. It gets rid of ill conditioning because now once you're uh, isolated, you now have a, a hyperbolic uh, equilibrium point. So everything behaves sort of nicely uh, locally there on your, on your dynamical system when you take uh, say gradient descent there. So you avoid sort of all of the ill conditioning. But the problem is, is that when you perturb something that's really nice, it turns into things which have a lot of uh, curviness to them. And so your energy landscape becomes much more complicated. And so as lambda goes to zero, this is what's called topological trivialization. You're sort of trivializing the landscape as you're removing this, this weight. And so when you have this positive weight here, you get, as shown in my picture here, you get local minimas that aren't global minima. And so as lambda goes to zero, this non-global local minima will go off to infinity as you do uh, the deformation back. You really need this global minimum to be able to go to the global minimum over here. So when you do this regularization, it's really helping the numerics by avoiding ill conditioning, but it's causing a lot of other issues in, in your energy landscape uh, here. And so this is sort of a, a, a cartoon of what's happening on the, uh, on the homotopy. So when lambda is positive, you get lots of critical points out here. And then as lambda goes to zero, things are becoming trivial. They're becoming uh, less curvy. And so critical points can die off. They can go off to infinity. And of course, some of them go, have to go to that positive dimensional component that, uh, uh, that you're looking for. 
So you have to be careful when you're using regularization. So on one hand, you can do this uh, uh, fantastic, but you also end up at these uh, non-local, uh, non-global uh, local minimum. Uh, so let me uh, let me wrap up my talk and happy to answer any questions afterwards. Uh, so we're looking at these energy landscapes from these uh, sum of squares fitness functions. Uh, we're able to use uh, parameter homotopies and numerical algebraic geometry to sort of find uh, the generic number of these critical points. Once you understand the generic number, you can then quickly find other solutions by using parameter homotopies. And it would be really nice to have an interpretation of how many critical points, what is the number of critical points of F in terms of this G function. So how do I interpret that in terms of the G function? And then in the overfitting case or overparameterized case, you have these positive dimensional components, you regularize it to avoid overfitting, but it really, really complicates things. So you're, you're making the SOS degree much higher than what it really should be because you're adding all of these uh, extra waviness uh, to the landscape. So again, I apologize that I wasn't able to attend in person. Uh, hopefully uh, some other time I get to uh, uh, visit Italy. So thank you so much for, uh, for your attention. Happy to answer questions. Thank you, Jonathan, for the nice talk. Uh, are there any questions? Remark, curiosity. Okay. Uh, hi, John. Uh, thank you Hello. for your interesting talk. Um, so can I have a question? Uh, sure. Yeah. Uh, so I I don't understand your the thing about like you have a sort of point and then you try to go to a minimum point. So what what do you want to achieve from that? What what do you like? Uh, because what uh, yeah what 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 do you want to get from that process? That's right. That's right. Okay. So I'll just use this picture as an example. So oftentimes we can't put all of the optimization constraints into it. And so the global minimum can be uh, degenerate. So what we want to know is we want to sort of actually search around the global minimum, not exactly at the global minimum. But this thing lives in a really high dimensional space. And so it's hard to sort of navigate yourself around, uh, around that. So what's an easy way to, to find a one dimensional family here is to start at this critical point and take the gradient descent path down to this point. So that gradient descent path gives us a one parameter family that we can then look around and make it much easier to sort of see the behavior uh, here. So in our examples, uh, which are small uh, examples, you know, this lives in five dimensional space. So it's uh, how do I move around in five dimensional space in a, in a sort of nice way that's difficult, but I can move along a one dimensional uh, uh, gradient descent path easily, and then sort of find the location at where I have a good design, but I'm not uh, too close to uh, sort of being degenerate. Does that make sense? Uh, okay, yeah, okay. So um, so then uh, there are two more sure. questions uh, yeah, rising from your answer. So first, uh, in higher dimensions, okay, you have example here, so you could have like several, just some critical points, so you could draw and you could see. Um, but in higher dimensions, you could have a lot of critical points, and also most of them may be just starter points, right? So, That's right. so even if you go from a starter point, you could end up at a starter point or 
That's and right. So you you cannot fight uh, your global minimum, right? That's uh, that's right. So a lot of the uh, sort of a lot of the theory from uh, a, a, you know these more smale complexes is you can go from uh, a saddle point, say an index two saddle point, to an index one saddle point, and sort of you didn't you don't go down to the minimum. These, uh, these trajectories that connect um, sort of higher index saddles are, are numerically unstable. And so if you sort of move off of those and you try to do gradient descent, you're gonna go down into the basin, uh, you know, go down to the minima there. And so that's what we uh, designed in our, uh, in these saddle graphs is that we don't actually, uh, so this one is an index two saddle. It should actually, if we were doing it correctly, it should go to an index one saddle and then to the index zero. But because of numerical uh, issues, uh, we're gonna be off of that a little bit. And then we're gonna, uh, when we do gradient descent, we'll go down to the, the corresponding local minimum uh, in its convergence base in there. So we're not getting a complete picture of how the index two go to index one to index zero and, and you know, generalize in higher dimensions. It's, the idea is to give a quick picture of sort of how things connect uh, into the minimum. So into this minimum, you can get from this saddle down, this saddle, and then this index two saddle all go into that minimum. Um, oh. Yeah, I still, uh, my, maybe I can have one more, more sure. question and then uh, sure. other people yeah, want yeah, to yeah. have questions. So, yeah. uh, okay, so practically, so say you want to find global minimum and you say you want to use gradient descent. So usually gradient descent will apply certain points, right? So you don't actually That's see right. any certain points, you, right. but you may go to local minimum instead exactly. of Exactly. Uh, and then, so I still, it's still not clear. Um, That's right. That's where uh, the numerical algebraic geometry comes in, is that you, you solve the critical point equations, the gradient equal to zero, uh, using uh, a homotopy uh, to be able to find the saddle points. So if you just do, uh, you know, classic gradient descent or stochastic gradient descent, you're going to wind your way down into some local minimas. But what we really want is how do I uh, how do I relax from a saddle point down? So I need a method to first find this saddle point. And so that's where this numerical algebraic geometry comes in. Is that polynomial system solving allows us to compute those saddle points. And then once we have the saddle points, then we can do the gradient descent starting from there down into the, the minimum. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks for your questions. Hi, why L2, why not L1 or L alpha or some other alpha? How does, it, how does it affect the results? That's right, that's right. So if you're looking for a sparsity structure, then you probably wanna do like an L1 uh, uh, regularization. Um, but because I come from polynomial world, I like L2 because you can square it and get uh, uh, nice polynomials. So uh, if you're trying to find sort of sparsity in your parameters, then you probably want to do an L1 regularization. And then my techniques from uh, algebraic geometry don't no longer work. So uh, yes, if you want to do this in practice and you want to find sparsity structure, L1 is the, is the right thing to do. If you want to uh, sort of look at, analyze the landscape and how critical points converge, and uh, then uh, you have to find the critical points. Uh, so you want a function which is nice and you can differentiate it, then L2 is a, is a, is a nice choice. So you have a perfect comment, of course. Uh, uh, in practice, L1 is used uh, for sparsity structure. Are there other questions, remarks, questions?
curiosity. If not, we thank Jonathan again for the beautiful yeah. talk. Thank you. So the next speaker of the afternoon is Professor Wong Fan from the University of Southampton and is going to talk about the second order dynamical system and its discretization via variational inequalities. Please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizer uh, to invite me uh, to a very nice conference, meeting some old friends and then so new friends, making some new friends and to a very nice city. Uh, and I must correct that I'm not a professor, I'm just a lecturer. So <laughs> maybe in 10 years, 15 years, but, but not now. <laughs> yeah, thank you. So um, my talk is about the second order dynamical system for solving uh, variational inequality. And here's the outline of the talk. I would like to, um, I, I'm trying to, to give uh, the talk as simple as possible. So it can be hopefully understandable for audience without any optimization background. Uh, it can be a little bit elementary for expert like Jerome or Tinson, but uh, I'm sorry about that. Um, but feel free to, to interrupt me at any time if you have uh, whatever question, okay? So here's the outline of the talk. I will give uh, some uh, basic introduction and motivation from optimization problem. And I will talk about the a special class of uh, variational inequality, namely the strongly pseudo monotone uh, VI. Huh? And then uh, introduce uh, recall the second order dynamical system for fixed wire problem and uh, generalize the result to monotone inclusion. And finally, if uh, time permits, I will talk a little bit about a zero monotone uh, variational inequality. Um, so let's uh, start with a, a classical optimization problem. Huh? So uh, here uh, we work in the Himbe space, in finite dimensional Himbe space with inner product and the user norm. But uh, uh, you just think about uh, RN, that's in so, uh, okay, no problem. Huh? We consider the unconstrained optimization problem, uh, minimize F of X in the whole space. Huh? And the well known FECMA theorem say that if X star is a, a local minimizer of this problem, then the gradient of F at X star equal to zero. That's very classical. And now if we have a constraint optimization problem where we try to, to minimize the problem in the subset of the space, then the optimality condition is a little bit different. So basically um, it say that if X star is a, a solution of our problem, then it must satisfy this inequality. The gradient of F at X star in the product with X minus X star is greater or equal than zero. Uh, or, ever, um, or equivalently, uh, zero belong to this inclusion where N C of X star is the, the normal cone of the set at the point X star. The normal cone is something like this one, if you have a set now. A set C, a closed convex set, X star here, for example, huh? and the normal cone is this cone. Okay, uh, N C of X star is all the point uh, X belong to H, such that the inner product of, um, the angle between this one um, and X and uh, Y minus X star huh, is less than or equal than zero for all Y belong to uh, C. I will recall, uh, return to the de definition of uh, normal cone later. Huh? So um, now for solving the, the 
optimization problem. In the unconstrained case, the, the most popular one is the gradient descent, where you take uh, a step size. Here is this lambda, huh? positive step size, and you move along the opposite direction of the gradient. And this is called the, the gradient descent. Uh, lambda here we call step size in, in machine learning, they call it uh, the learning rate. And with the, the constraint optimization problem, huh, we need to project it back uh, to the feasible set. Like if you start from xk here, huh, you compute xk minus lambda gradient of f and xk. It can be go outside of the feasible set, C, and you need to project it back here huh, to obtain xk plus one. So the PC, is the orthogonal projection onto the feasible set C. Okay. And uh, the classical theorem say that if uh, the step size is not too big, yeah, it's uh, less than two over L, where L is a Lipschitz constant of the gradient, and we suppose that the, the function has the Lipschitz gradient, then the sequence XK converts to some solution X star. And uh, the function value f of xk converts to f of x star with the rate uh, big O of one over k. k here is the number of iteration. Uh, and this is optimal uh, for the gradient descent and all projected gradient descent. And this cannot be improved. In addition, if now the function f is strongly convex uh, with some modulus gamma greater than zero, and the step size belong to two gamma over is greater than zero and less than two gamma over L square. Then the sequence converts linearly to the, the unique solution. If we have strongly convex function, then the, the problem has unique solution. And uh, with the rate in the red here, and the optimal rate is attained when we minimize this function with respect to lambda. And we obtain the optimal rate is the square root of one over kappa square. Kappa here is the uh, condition number, which is which uh, Nestor mentioned last time. Is the fraction of the uh, strong uh, modulus, uh, the modulus of strong monotonicity over the Lipschitz constant. And here's the optimal rate for the gradient descent or the projected gradient descent. So this is the classical uh, result about 50, 60 years ago or, or so. Huh? And it's, it turned out that the gradient descent is nothing else but just the discrete version of the uh, gradient flow or the projected gradient flow. So when we uh, discuss try this, dynamic system with the Euler uh, disk disk rise, huh? we obtain this uh, gradient descent. And similarly for the, the projected gradient descent, when you disk try this one, huh? where T here is the, uh, T here is defined by this formula, huh? I here is the identity, matrix, uh, identity operator. And here's the uh, nested of uh, accelerated gradient method. Uh, um, a simple uh, modification, but a huge difference where he, he take the uh, intermediate step by taking yk here is equal to xk plus theta k, uh, xk minus ik minus one here before taking the gradient step. Okay, and this step uh, usually called the uh, inertial step. If you think about the dynamic system, this is the vel velocity, yeah? discrete vel velocity. And uh, in the same, under the same assumption with the a clever choice of theta k, uh, in his choice was theta k equal to uh, k minus two over k plus one, I think. So this is um, one minus three over k plus one. So it's 10 to, 10 to one when k is 10 to infinitive. 
and he can prove that uh, the seek one converts to uh, some solution x star and uh, moreover the 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 seek one of objective function f of xk converts to f star f star here the optimal value huh, with the optimal rate o1 over k square so in the original paper for the year ago he proved with the uh, big o but then uh, later on at uh, tooth and paper case show that is it in fact faster than big o is small o uh, and this is the huge difference. So you see, uh, previously, if you take, if you need 100 iteration to obtain epsilon approximation solution, now you only need 10 iteration, right? From one over k to one over k square. So in my opinion, uh, this is the the most elegant and the most influenced result in first order method in the last four, 40 years. Uh, so uh, it turned out that uh, uh, this this uh, scheme of from Nestero has a uh, link with the second order dynamical system at this form. So when you describe this second order dynamical system with the same operator t as before, uh, you will obtain this this uh, scheme. And uh, in addition, uh, this scheme also have a, a linear convergence rate and the rate is faster. Uh, so if you remember that the rate with the gradient descent is was uh, square root of one over kappa square, right? And, and the rate of this one in the strongly convex case is, is, is smaller one over kappa, uh, one minus kappa. So this is, this one is greater than and this one, right? That's where kappa is the uh, condition number, which is smaller than one. And now uh, here's uh, the motivation. So instead of working directly on the original optimization problem, we can work on the optimality condition. Uh, and also to the motivation is to go by on uh, convexity. And the paper of, of Nestor give birth, it's, it's a short paper, it's only five, four pages, but it give birth to like a thousand paper try to uh, modify his scheme and improve it and so on. Uh, try to extend it to a non-convex case. And if you have a, a look at the Google Scholar, the paper has like more than 5,000 citations. Uh, so people try to go by on convexity, or for example, pseudo-convexity, quasi-convex and non-convex and so on. And one of the basic question is, is it still work if we replace uh, the gradient uh, gradient of f by a, a general continuous operator capital f it means that we work on the the rational inequality so there's two different approaches to solve an optimization problem either you solve the original one this one or this one or you you solve the optimality conditions so if the function f is convex, then they are equivalent. Okay. So uh, I will talk about uh, solving the optimality condition, which is this one. And here's the formal uh, definition of the rational inequality. Uh, we try to find an x star belong to C, such that this inequality hold for all x belong to, to C. And the spectral case of uh, the rational inequality is the opti optimization problem that you have seen, but it's more general than that. For example, if you have a set of point problem or the mean max problem, which we see many times in, in the machine learning community, when you try to, uh, when you have a, a by function g of uv and you try to minimize in one variable at the same time maximize in, in the other variable 
and this is a special case of rational inequality by uh, definite by um, taking the capital F as the gradient with respect to u of the function g and minus gradient with respect to v uh, of the function g. And the uh, the feasible set c is the uh, the product of x and y. Another example, typical example, is the Nash equilibrium problem, or even the fixed point problem. All of them are special case of the rational inequality one here. And correspond to the convexity of pseudo convexity and so on. There's um, some concept of uh, monotonicity of the capital F of the function uh, of the operator F. Huh? I recall here is firstly the strongly monotone operator. So the, the capital F, the, the operator F is called strongly monotone with modulus gamma greater than zero. If it satisfies this inequality for all x, y belong to, to C. And if gamma is equal to zero, we call it monotone. Uh, it's called a strongly pseudo monotone if uh, we have this implication, this inequality imply uh, this inequality. And the class of strongly pseudo monotone is bigger than class of uh, strongly monotone. And similarly, if gamma equal to zero, is we call it the uh, we call that the the uh, the operator f is pseudo monotone. It's a little bit uh, difficult to to imagine this one in, in the by the definition, but uh, here's the Vine di diagram. So the class of uh, strongly monotone or monotone operator is the red or the pink class here, and the class of pseudo monotone is the green one or the blue one. And there is some um, difficulty when we move from, uh, for example, from the strongly monotone to strongly pseudo monotone because of the asymmetric of, of, uh, of the, the property. For example, for the strongly monotone here, it's symmetric yeah, with the both with the pair X and Y. Right? Here is asymmetric. So there arise some uh, technical difficulty when we work it with the, the asymmetric inequality. Um, for example, if usually if you have a monotone operator, if you have a monotone operator F, then if you add a regularization, huh? epsilon identity, this one becomes strongly monotone. But if you have a pseudo monotone map, F, and you add the epsilon identity, it's in not even pseudo monotone anymore. It's destroyed totally the structure. So here an example, a simple example, huh? this one, f of x defined in two dimensional space. This one is pseudo monotone, but uh, f plus epsilon i is not even pseudo monotone. So uh, you, may, you may ask a question, why do we care about this class of function, for example? Huh? Why, why do we care about pseudo monotone and so on? And there's a link between the the pseudo monotone function and the pseudo convex function. So in the 90, uh, Karamadian and Seibler uh, state the theorem saying that if the function f, small f in different table, then is the pseudo monotone if and only if the gradient is, uh, the function f is pseudo convex if and only if the gradient is pseudo monotone and so on and vice versa, uh, this equivalent condition. And similarly for strongly, monotone as well. So here in this figure, you see uh, the red function, small f is square uh, x squared. This is a strongly uh, monotone function and it's gradient, sorry, a strongly convex function uh, has unique solution, zero. And its gradient is just a line. Uh, Fx, uh, the gradient is 2x, it's a monotone, strongly monotone operator, right? 
So monotone in one dimensional space is just an increasing function. But uh, in the right hand side here, we have another function f, which is uh, strongly pseudo monotone, this one. And the green one is the, uh, sorry, the, the blue one is, is gradient, it's not monotone. It is curve, huh? the blue curve is not monotone at all. And uh, here I just uh, recall uh, the definition of pseudo-convex, which has uh, some uh, important uh, formula in, in the fractional programming. Uh, a function is called pseudo-convex if it satisfies this inequality, uh, if it satisfies this condition. Huh? And uh, one of the, the most important uh, pseudo-convex problem in, in the economics is the in the fractional programming problem, if you have a fractional function f of x equal to g of x over h of x, the denominator is convex and the denominator is concave. Both of them are uh, positive huh? and differentiable. Then this function is pseudo convex. Uh, you can find this one in many applications in economics where the nominator is a quadratic function and the denominator is a linear function. Here's just a, a graph of uh, pseudo convexity and uh, pseudo monotonicity. I plot it again. And now uh, we come to the, the class of the strongly uh, pseudo monotone variational inequality. Uh, which is the the green class where uh, which you have seen in the the the, the Venn diagram. So we have uh, this one strongly monotone, right? Uh, this monotone. This one is uh, strongly pseudo monotone. Now I'm working with uh, with this class. So the first question is whether. The basic uh, projected gradient descent still work for for this uh, class of problem or not? So uh, we assume that the the um, operator f now is a slip sheet continuous so satisfy this uh, inequality, and uh, we can prove that the problem, the variational inequality problem, has a unique solution. Moreover, it satisfies this global error bound. This is important, huh? saying that the distance from arbitrary vector x to the unique solution x star is bounded above by this quantity. So it say that um, given a, a vector x, I don't know how, I, I can estimate how far from, uh, from x to the unique solution by computing this quantity. Huh? by just computing the projection of x plus or minus f of x to x. And then I know how far I am from the this unique solution. And here the basic projection method. Uh, I, uh, we take xk plus one equal to xk minus lambda k. Lambda k is just a, a step size, f of xk, so this is the same with the projected gradient methods. So in this of using here the gradient, we have the, the general uh, operator f, right? And here we can approve this inequality saying that if we choose a lambda case bounded from uh, belong to zero and two gamma over L square, similar to the previous one, then the sequence xk converts linearly to the unique solution with the optimal rate is here, where uh, when we choose lambda k for two gamma over elsewhere. So it's a, a little bit worse than for the strongly monotone case, but it's understandable because we are working in the bigger class. So if we work with the strongly monotone case, this one, then the, the ray would be one over gamma square L square, square root of this one. So, so that's one, this one, 
a little bit worse. It's bigger than this one. It's uh, this one. This one is um, one over square root of one plus gamma square over L square. So it's a little bit bigger than this one. And here it says that in the case we don't know the parameter gamma and L square, we can take the step size converse slowly to zero and we still have the strong convergence. So um, that's it, the, the, the first result for uh, the basic projection method. Now the next question is whether the next set of accelerated um, gradient can be extended to the version of inequality or not. So of this form, right? As, as you have seen the next set of accelerated method. So practically um, people use the accelerated gradient a lot and it, it's improved the convergence speed. And the theoretical guarantees improve where uh, f is the, the gradient of a, a convex function. Uh, as you have seen, it's improved from uh, one over k to one over k square, where f is the gradient. And uh, a linear convergence with the better rate when the small f is strongly convex. So the natural question is to ask is, whether it's still true for the version of inequality or not. And if, if we have strongly monotone or strongly pseudo monotone, whether we still have a linear rate. And if we have linear rate, is it better than, than the previous one or not? And then in the literature, people also try to, to uh, uh, generalize it, the result for the monotone inclusion where we have here, zero belong to ax plus bx, a and b are arbitrary uh, operator instead of uh, f of x and the normal cone. So uh, to, to answer the, the previous question, uh, we try to mimic the, the version of inequality via um, we are fixed by problem. So we define uh, the operator T as you have seen before. You have seen this one before where uh, capital F is this, the gradient, right? So I just replace here the gradient of F, a small F by, uh, by our operator capital F. And it turned out that X star is a solution of our version of inequality if and only if X star is the is the zero of t, and moreover, um, t of x satisfies this uh, inequality. And uh, for people uh, with optimization background, is it the this can be called the quasi cohesive. Co cohesive is mean that it satisfies uh, this inequality um, in in the footnote here. It's saying that the T minus one is strongly monotone. So Coco SIP is also called the inverse strongly monotone. It satisfies this uh, inequality. So it say that this, the, the blue inequality say that the, the operator T satisfy the Coco SIP on, uh, on the zero set, where lambda is small enough. And it's give uh, now it's give the both upper global arrow bow and lower uh, global arrow bow, saying that by computing t of x, I know uh, how far from x to the solution. So both upper bow and, and lower bow. And we try to associate uh, the version of inequality with the second order dynamical system, as you have seen in the next of uh, uh, the, the dynamical system associated with the next of accelerated gradient method, right? You have seen this one before. It's a link between.
net zero accelerated gradient with the dynamic system. So this dynamic system and the, the one we consider here is the same. Huh? And the one we consider here is the same. And this is not new. This is studied by many uh, people before, like Antipin for the in the 19 for convex optimization, or Alaves and Atut, or both in Senec for monotone inclusion, and many others. But all of them is either for convex optimization or the um, operative where T is co-coercive. But we don't have the co-coercive property in the pseudo monotone case. We only have coercive on the zero set, on the solution set. So if we discretize the previous dynamo system, if we discretize this one, we obtain exactly the, the uh, projection method with the inner tail effect here, with the momentum here. Huh? We just use the, the formal uh, Euler discretization where you replace, this is the x2 dot, this is the x dot, this is the, the, the acceleration, the velocity, and this t. And uh, we're changing the variable and we, we obtain here the uh, projection method, but now with the, the relaxed variable row. And we are interested in whether this one, this scheme give us the, and accelerated in the right or not. And the first result uh, starting about the exponential convergence of the dynamical system. So there's some uh, technical assumption on the um, parameter function alpha and beta. It's look uh, like a mess, but actually it's, it's not difficult to, to find such a function satisfy i, 2i and 3i here, I show later. And if the function alpha and beta satisfy these three assumptions, then the trajectory generated by the previous dynamical system converts exponentially to the unique solution of the virtual inequality, uh, and satisfy this inequality. And here's uh, one of example, simple example, where you can choose alpha and beta satisfy the previous um, assumptions. And um, the second result is about the convergent rate, uh, a, con a linear convergence of the discretized version of the projected gradient with the momentum theta here. So here's some assumption on the parameter. So basically, um, step size lambda must less than this quantity. Eta here can be any positive number. The relaxation must satisfy this inequality. Where Q here, you have seen that before, is it the, is the right of the method where uh, we don't have the uh, we don't have the inner tail term in the classical one. This is the right in the classical one for the strongly pseudo monotone. And the inner tail um, parameter theta must satisfy this um, inequality. It must be to belong to this interval. This is just a technical assumption where I analyze the, the convergence of the result. Just mention here that here we can choose the relaxation parameter row. It can be greater than one. So minimum of one over one minus Q and one plus something, it can be greater than one. So we can choose the over relaxation. And the main theorem here say that, if all the parameters satisfy A1, A2, and A3, then the sequence XK converts linearly to the unique solution of our original uh, variation inequality. Uh, the proof is a little bit uh, technical. I will not present it here, but it depends on the, this Lyapunov function, capital AK here. Uh, the most difficulty uh, is that um, choosing the right uh, Ly Lyapunov function and working with the asymmetric property of the pseudo monotone. 
And here we can prove that I k converts linearly to zero with the rate r here. R here is equal to one minus rho one minus q. This one belongs to zero and one. And just a simple remark here is that uh, R here is less than Q whenever rho is greater or equal than, than one. So in the, the other word, if we choose the relaxation greater or equal than one, then the right here is better than the classical weight, uh, the classical right. Q. Q is this one is the, the, the right for the basic uh, gradient projection. And here we can prove that it's not worse than the basic uh, gradient projection. So if, if we choose rho greater than one, then the right is better. Uh, here, just a simple example showing that um, there are a class of uh, strongly pseudo monotone but not monotone or uh, uh, co coercive and so on. If we take a positive uh, function G, multiply with a, a positive definite matrix, let's say we work in, in, in RN, huh? it satisfies this uh, condition. And the function G is bounded from below by kappa greater than zero. Then the operator F here is strongly pseudo monotone, but not monotone. Just to show that the this class is bigger than the strongly monotone class and different with the monotone class. I think I have uh, twenty minutes or so, uh, or ten minutes. Um, for the idea to generalize to the monotone intrusion, zero belongs to A of X plus B of X, where A is a general monotone operator and B is the maximum monotone operator, a multi-value maximum monotone operator. So to replace the normal cone by a, a set value operator. So I think I, I should skip this slide, but uh, just to say that it's possible, so um, the problem has been considered by, by many well-known researchers like uh, both in CNX, Lauren Pock and Artut and Kapoor and so on. Uh, just to say that the previous uh, result is still whole for the monotone intrusion. So both uh, the, the dynamic system, the Exponential convergence of the dynamical system has been considered by both and Senec in these two paper. And the discretization lead to this um, uh, algorithm, huh? and we can start the, the result where either A or B or, uh, is gamma strongly monotone, then we still have the linear convergence with the better rate. Uh, compared with the, the classical uh, grad, uh, projectant uh, gradient. Uh, in the last maybe 10 minutes, I, will, I want to talk about the, um, the blue, blue class, uh, the, the biggest one, the pseudo monotone. VI. So uh, the trick is the same. We just need to, to find a suitable uh, fixed point operator. So previously uh, we use um, the operator T. We use this one, huh? T equal to I minus PC, I minus lambda F, right? But for the, the pseudo monotone VI, uh, the operator T is, is quite complicated, but it is not new, it's not new as well. So this has been used by other, by, by um, previous people. 
This is it's called the forward backward forward, which in we were investigated by Pao Seng. So if we denote the uh, if we define the operator t by this formula, here we we need to do uh, we we need to compute two time of f f of x here and f of this point. So in the literature, it can can be called the extra gradient because we need to compute two gradient when in the case f is the gradient. And we can also prove that uh, x star shown the uh, vagrant inequality if and only if x star at the zero point. f ellipsis continuous, then t also ellipsis continuous. It's easy to see. Uh, and for all x star belong to the solution set, the zero set of t is the, it coincides with the solution set of our vi. Then it's also co coercive in the zero set. And this is important. From here, we can mimic um, the Fravers dynamo system, and and we come up with a new algorithm for solving uh, the pseudo monotone VI with uh, acceleration. So this one is by on a recent draft with Bot and Seth Meyer. So here's our the Fravers dynamo system. Huh? Nothing different. Uh, if we write in detail, it looks like this. It it's look a mess. Huh? But basically, it's just the uh, second order dynamo system associated with C. Okay. And if we discretize this one, we obtain a new algorithm. And here, this theorem saying uh, about a solution or a system of the, the dynamo system. So basically, if the function satisfies some uh, condition, like uh, local ellipsis, and then uh, for given x0, v0, there is a unique strong global solution of the dynamical system, of this uh, dynamical system, OK? Um, and if the the function gamma and tau is shows uh, appropriately it satisfy so that it satisfy this uh, condition it's not difficult to find such a function uh, gamma and tau uh, so that these two conditions is satisfied then we can prove that the trajectory is bounded and x dot x2 dot and t of x belong to l2 um, the limit of the velocity, the acceleration, and t of x, and the difference from x t and y t equal to zero when t tends to infinity, and x t converts to the element in the zero set of t, which is the solution of the our rational inequality. And now, if we discretize the previous dynamic system, we obtain here the new algorithm for solving pseudo monotone vi uh, when alpha here equal to zero it's uh, come back to the classical uh, the name is forward backward forward uh, algorithm for solving version inequality that's one is classical and it's proved by saying but for monotone vi not pseudo monotone vi uh, and just a, a small comment here. Uh, it's maybe interesting for someone who do the numerical implementation, maybe for twin. Um, so in this case, if we don't know the, um, the ellipsis uh, constant, we can choose the step size lambda k adaptively by this formula, uh, saying that we start at some lambda zero, and each time we suppose that we don't know L, so the condition is for the convergence was that zero less than L less than uh, lambda, lambda greater than zero, but less than one over L. So this one try to, this one, we try to um, approximate one over L huh, by any constant mu belong to zero and one here. And this lambda K, 
by this formula will converge eventually to some lambda and this lambda bar and this lambda bar is less than one over L. We can prove that. This is important in the implementation because sometimes estimating the capital L is impossible. Um, here is the, um, the trade-off between the, here we have the inertial alpha and the relaxation row. And we can only prove the convergence where that constant belong to the blue area here. So basically, uh, it's just a technical assumption when we do the proof, we need to force this condition that row greater than zero and less than this quantity. We can draw in the, the figure here huh, in, in the, the blue area. Outside of the blue area, we don't know if it will converse or not. So now if, if the uh, app is pseudomonotone, lip is continuous and sequentially weekly continuous is just for the hidden bed space uh, purpose. Uh, you can forget about it if you think it's in, in RN. Huh? So it's nothing to do with the weekly continuous. Alpha K and rho K uh, satisfy these two conditions. And alpha and rho uh, satisfy the inequality 10 here. And the sequence converts to a solution of our version of inequality. So remember, in this case, we don't have a unique solution. The problem can have uh, more than one solution. And instead of a pseudo monotone, if we delight, reply the pseudo monotone by strongly pseudo monotone, then we have the linear convergence with a better rate, uh, as you have seen before. So I think that's enough for, for my talk and thank you for your attention. Thank you. Are there questions? Remark? Um, uh, maybe I have two questions. So first, uh, for the protection uh, method for the PC, so safe. Okay, so if you have your function is convex, then it uh, makes sense because uh, you're on a convex set and you have convex function. So your, uh, so I guess your um, maximum, right? Or minimum, it should be on the boundary. So if you do the protection, so it, uh, it looks okay. But uh, if your function is not convex, so, uh, you know any resource for converting so um if the function is not convex the most you have is the critical point um so is it right zero i mean if we don't have convexity then the most we have in the projection method is the critical point right yeah nothing else yeah but maybe sometimes you don't have right because uh, maybe your critical points they are not they don't live on the boundary. It's not necessary in the boundary. Because when you do the protection, uh, it looks like you, if it's outside, if, if it goes outside and you protect Well, if, the, if, if, if you start some, something inside the feasible set, it can, it can stay forever in the feasible set. Yeah, but if you have some, uh, sometimes it go outside and Yeah, yeah it can be go, it can go outside, then, but it, it can stay inside. Right? Be, for example, if you start here, it can go outside and then come back, xk plus one. And the next step is can stay inside xk plus two. Yeah, so, okay. So, so the, it, the critical point is not necessary in the boundary of the feasible set. Okay, it, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but I mean, uh, we don't know, right? Because this- Yeah, we uh, don't know. Yeah, it could, uh, your, your sequence could maybe always be on the boundary, right? Yeah, yeah, it's, po it's also possible, right. yes. And so then uh, your, okay, yeah. And then your last uh, theorem, so. This, what theorem? Yeah, the, the, the theorem uh, on the last, uh, on the last slide, last, last okay. page.
Oh yeah. yeah. Okay. So you have uh, eight uh, Hilbert space, and then uh, yeah, you can forget about him back if you work in R N. It's, it's and fine. Uh, yeah, so I I wonder about the pseudo motor monotone pseudo um condition um. So I don't know if it's related to so in BDE they have a condition called the class S plus S plus class, which says something like if you have. Uh, let me see if you have sequence. Uh, okay, I forgot. Uh, so I don't know if it's related to this uh, notion. Uh, yeah. uh, I think it would be interesting if there is relation, but I'm, I'm not aware about that. But okay. it, yeah. it would be nice to have a look at that. And then for, for the discrete uh, may, uh, discretization, so so you say uh, on in your formula ten. So they assume mm -hmm. that you say that if you always use stroke k and alpha k to satisfy this number ten, then uh, you always have convergence, right? If yes. your function is convex. Uh, now if the the capital F here is pseudo monotone. Okay. So if you think about the optimization problem, it is pseudo convex. If yeah. if your problem pseudo is pseudo convex. convex. Okay. So you have pro rho k and uh, alpha k always satisfy this, then you always have convergence. Yes. yes. Okay. Thanks, John. Other questions, remarks, comments? If not, ah, okay. To see. Uh, so, what do we know exactly at this day? Because there there is an inflation of papers and so on. What do we know at this day on the acceleration of uh, uh, for a general uh, monotone operator? Um, for example, you can expect that the accelerated with the inertial effect and for a strongly monotone case. Not it, strongly monotone. In general? A, a general monotone operator. Oh, they're quite a lot. They're quite a lot. But uh, the, but the what is the best rate? Then. Um, the best rate, as, I, as far as I know, because in the monotone operator, we don't have any objective function, right? Optimization problem, usually you try to, to see this rate, right? Either small or one over k square. But with the monotone operator, the only thing we have is the iteration. And the, the best thing, I know so far is this one, I know xk plus one. The velocity, the ray of the velocity is zero, one over k. And this one is just published, I think yesterday by Radu and his, uh, his student. Yesterday, you said? Yesterday or today. Just put it on archive. Okay, <laughs> that's fresh news. Um, yeah, this this can be you at the um, the gap function because if we have this one equal to zero, then x k is the solution. Okay, thanks. Uh, but but this, this is the best best way as far as I know. There there's some also result uh, from the happen iteration as well, and they also obtain that one over k. But I'm. Um, I, I I don't I'm not aware if there's any rate faster than that for the velocity. Other questions? Curiosity remarks. Okay. If not, we thank Wong again. Okay. So the last speaker of this long afternoon is Professor Giorgio Mantica from Insubria University, who is going to talk about simulating epidemics via the theory of dynamical systems. Well, my title is different from yours. Come here. So I took the freedom to change the title. It's not simulating, but it's understanding. And okay. certainly, I must uh, thank the organizers for inviting me, even if uh, my topic is not 100% within uh, the scope of the workshop. But nonetheless, I hope that uh, you will find uh, uh, somehow something of interest for you. 
and I really thank you for being here. So uh, these are two curves, too much known, unfortunately. These are the curves related to Italy. Number of uh, contagions by COVID-19 and the red curve, I'm not going to tell you what it is because it is dreadful. But what I'm interested in are, is in these spikes. But let me tell you immediately why I changed from simulating to understanding. I do, my primary uh, aim is not to reproduce these curves per se, neither to forecast what will come next. For instance, what will come next is the red arrow. And all of us, unfortunately, know with what is coming next. There will be a next burst of, of infections. But I want to understand what the dynamics behind this phenomena. Not to reproduce, but to understand, which is kind of different, as you will see. So I will kind of twisted a bit the meaning of words in the title by saying that I'm not using dynamical system to solve equations, but my, my equations are dynamical evolution equations, which I want to use in order to understand this phenomena. And uh, how many equations? Few in history, I will tell you, since it is late and uh, I don't want to abuse of your patience, I will just give you some historical remarks how these models arise. Probably you already heard of them, but nonetheless, uh, it, it, they serve me to introduce the topic. Uh, so we will go from few system of ordinary differential equations to more that are used today. Next, I will tell you of probabilistic models that are used nowadays to simulate this phenomena, but my real topic is to uh, introduce networks of coupled dynamical systems. So, and these will be many dynamical systems coupled. Okay, why do I say a few of these? Because our father, Daniel Bernoulli, was perhaps the first, and I learned this from uh, books that I will quote in a moment, was first the uh, first man to mathematically attack the problem of infections. And this is a quotation from his 1760 paper, which is of interest even, even now, because you see, he says that in taking decision about this topic, so important for humanity, a little calculus and mathematical knowledge should be employed. And you know better than I, how much this is interesting these days. Uh, what was the name of the game? What was the problem Bernoulli was faced was smallpox. Smallpox was a real threat to, to European population in the 1700s. And this lady, Lady Montagu, imported in England a, a, a procedure that was known in ancient China, was only in Turkey when she was uh, the daughter of, of a British ambassador, and was this variolation was a preliminary uh, sort of vaccination by which living pathogens were injected in them. And Lady Montagu had both son and daughter variolated. Now, what is the Bernoulli approach? It helps me to introduce uh, uh, vocabulary. S is the set of susceptible people, people who had not had smallpox. And if you didn't have smallpox, then you may die by natural causes. Mu is the rate of death by other causes. But then you can take smallpox and either die with a rate lambda times one minus A or survive with rate lambda A and you enter the recovered set. And you know the smallpox give you, gives you lifetime immunity. So this is it. So. Uh, system of equations, two equations, these are Bernoulli's equations. And again, when you read these, uh, our forefathers, you get impressed by their geniality because you see that if you introduce rho, which is the ratio between susceptible and S plus R, which is 
uh, believing people, you get a differential equation where at one variable, one parameter has disappeared, which is mu. And so by using this in extreme ingenuity and the actuarial tables, that is the table of the surviving fraction of kids at a certain age, suppose that you start at age zero with a fraction one, you see the continuous curve, how it goes down. And if you read the real numbers, you get shocked because you see that 50% of people died earlier than 10 years of age. So he was able to estimate from the tables to estimate the parameters. And in using these parameters, he arrived at the dashed curve that says, suppose we violate all people, how would the life expectancy at birth increase? Oops, so what happens? Huh? It increases by more than three years, which over <laughs> that short scale of life was quite significant. So this is uh, the first mathematical approach. And um, two equations. Next, few centuries after, these two uh, Scottish gentlemen introduced what is called the SIR method. Uh, these are called compartmental methods because people are put into different compartments. There is the, the two compartments that were known to Bernoulli, susceptible and recovered, and an intermediate co compartment that was those of infected people because infection might last uh, a certain period of time and you get three, uh, three differential equations and there is this new compartment and it is important that a difference with Bernoulli, this beta parameter is not a rate because we have a nonlinear term. I will come back on this nonlinear term later on. Uh, what they did, Kermak and McKendry, they could explain the shape of those peaks that we have seen. This is not a Gaussian, is a, a square a hyperbolic second. But uh, now come to our days. Uh, still, uh, pe people are using more and more compartments, putting people into different, into different categories. For instance, this is a result about COVID-19, where you see uh, the infected compartment is parted in many different uh, sub-compartments. There is even a compartment uh, with people in ICU, intensive care units. And uh, what you get is get, uh, you get systems of coupled differential equations, 11 in this case. So two, three, 11. Now, um, what, is, uh, what are the main assumptions? First of all, that individuals in each compartment have no identity. Second, the transition between one compartment and the other happen stochastically. We have been uh, seeing uh, equ um, rate equations. So drawbacks, only the total number of people in each compartment can be described. And also um, from a dynamical point of view, uh, the system is just a system of a few coupled ODEs. Now I will try to convince you that it is possible to, to go over these two assumptions, but, and in so doing, we get problems of mathematical significance per se, and interesting phenomena, and a toy model. So let me try now briefly to see how I can go beyond this compartmental model. So let's focus on the first, in, on a single individual. So in the compartment model, the single, you about an individual, you only know where it is. There is no dynamics. Either you are susceptible or not. What is written on that door? You can get in if your temperature is beyond, is below 35.5, 37.5. So now we take a person and we measure the temperature. And uh, the temperature is a number between zero and one. And uh, the higher the temperature, we say that this person is more fragile the lower it is more robust healthy and um, so the state space is a, a real variable in zero one which is what we like how does it evolve it evolves in discrete time 
we could do the differential equations, but in dynamics, we always strive for the utmost simplicity. So it uh, boils by a discrete time. So there is a function, a dynamical evolution operator that tells you if you know what is the state, the temperature at time n, what is the temperature at time n plus one? And guess what we choose for function? We choose the asymmetric tent map, which is, a, so to speak, a, the easiest example of a dynamical system you can think of. And uh, uh, on zero one, there is the Lebesgue measure, and the Lebesgue measure is invariant for this transformation. And what we all know since when we were kids is that this dynamical system is ergodic, mixing, and chaotic. So this, uh, the health state of this single person evolves according to these dynamics. So we have given to each person its own dynamical variable. Now the point is, how does contagion happen? So here is our young lady with her temperature. She's not infected, and the, uh, but she's susceptible. And in green, I will denote the zero one interval of susceptible people. But then there is, her doctor who is infected and suppose that they come into contact. So, but the doctor himself has a, a temperature and which is in the red set, the infected set. And important for what is going to come is that there is a viral charge that the doctor can transfer. The higher the temperature of the doctor, the worse his physical status, the more Viral, viral charge he can transfer to a poor lady. So if it happens, like in the picture, that the state of uh, in green is close to one, so high temperature, fragile, and here is the, in, the amount of viral charge. If the amount of viral charge is enough to make the, the green variable overcome one, we have this rule that X plus the viral charge Result, resulting larger than one, the, the state goes from successible to infected. So no uh, randomness, purely dynamical, purely deterministic system. And so this is what happens. So the, the state of the variable goes there and she gets infected. Now, to the contrary, if her temperature is low, even as an amount of viral ch charge is not enough to make the transition. So she stays healthy. Uh, so what happens now? I have to tell you what happens after you get the disease. So suppose that in, as before, she gets the disease. So we need a dynamics of contagion. And since I am a simple-minded boy, I use the same map that I used before. So you see that in beginning, the transition, uh, uh, the state tra uh, make a transition from uh, left to right. And then you have this first part of evolution given by 10 map on which I will come back later. And then, and then the states evolves according to the 10 map. What happens next? You see that I marked two states, two subsets in the red X. One is called R and the other is called F. If in this dynamical motion, the state space goes into R states, R means recovers, you see that the trajectory comes back to the previous susceptible state, which unfortunately was, is, is what is, it is happening to us. This disease does not give us lifelong immunity. So once you get the disease, then if you, are, if you are lucky, you come back to be susceptible. I don't tell you what happens if you end up in the F. Uh, so if you end up in the R recovery, you come back to be susceptible. If you end up in the F, uh, okay. Next, I'm going to release another characteristic of compartmental methods. Since there is no specific identity, there is no specificity in what kind of people you meet. Every person loses identity. But uh, we know, let's get these people out of their compartments. They live, uh, for instance, I don't want to tell you anything bad, but you might be infected in this moment. <laughs> but we are all in this room. 
and we are nodes in a network and there is and there is a directed network in such a way that this is the, uh, uh, the in the theory of networks of graphs is called the adjacent matrix that it is one if an in individual i can be infected by the individual j so you see j I'm using the physicist way of writing transitions. Mathematicians at times use it in the other way around. What is important, this is a non-symmetric matrix. So this is what happens. And so if there is a, a pathogens, pathogens can travel on this. Uh, so this is the summary of a dynamical model. I hope I have not bothered you too much because now the real talk begins. So we have an individual internal dynamics and the state space is composed of two zero one intervals, uh, the susceptible green and the infected red. But if you wish, you can put them in zero two, it doesn't matter. And um, there is a directed network that tells you who can infect who, whom. And there is this rule of contagion. So the full dynamical phase space is x to the power m, where m is the number of individuals. And the dynamics is a map from this uh, curly capital X to itself. And how it is structured, so you have your x value, your x vector, which is all the dynamical variables, the, the dynamical variables of all individuals at certain time. First, they evolve with internal dynamics, and then, it is just a matter of convenience. Uh, this is the most uh, general assumption. It would be restrictive if I would tell you that, uh, um, that the matrix is symmetric. The non-symmetric matrix also contains the symmetric case. This is one answer. The second answer is suppose Suppose you are careless. Suppose you are not, I'm careless and you are not. I can get disease from you, but you cannot get it from me. Typically, uh, the situation is highly asymmetrical. But again, this is the most general case. If you want, you can restrict to symmetric coupling. So what he, from the point of view, dynamical system is a system of a network of coupled dynamical system. Each one of us is a dynamical system and we are coupled via these network of interactions. Uh, let me tell you now I make, how I make the interactions. I, for this, I just uh, using the simplest minded uh, approach. Uh, so each one of us can get infection from a fixed number of people, all the same. Then I will tell you in the end that people in graph theory can do much better, but I'm not so much interested in generality at this point. So there are M, capital M people, and each one can get infection by a finite number. Okay, suppose that you are all equal. And this is an example where... Uh, uh, the is, uh, lower case M is two. So each of these individuals just get in viral input from two people. Now, if we are all healthy, there is no uh, contagion happening. So how do we put contagion? Again, I don't want to do anything uh, random. I just give a dynamical rule. Suppose that one of us goes outside and then it takes uh, the pathogen inside our network. So how do I simulate that dynamically? So you are uh, the susceptible individual. If you end up in a subset of, of a susceptible is to mimic the fact that you get inf in infection from outside and you bring it inside. Now, when I say M is large, here we take one, 100,000 individuals, each one of, of them receiving input, so to speak, this bad input from five people. And now I put every individual on the vertical axis. And what do I do? N is time. And here yeah, we have a, a short uh, um, span of time. And suppose that uh, here, the individual 90,000 get uh, brings contagion into the network. 
I mark the time where he gets the contagion by uh, this uh, blue square, and I call it an exogenous infection because it comes from outside. Now, after he gets the disease, he stays sick for a certain amount of time. And you see that I simulate this by a black, uh, a black segment. The segment terminates either on a green circle, which means recovery, or unfortunately on a red triangle, which means fatality. Also, during the period where when this individual is infected, infected is also, also means infected. So he can transfer the disease to other people. And these red lines tell you that the disease has been moving. OK, so this is my rules of the game. And I want to play with this. First, important question from a mathematical point of view. Does the system possess any variant measure? OK, this guy, uh, here I will put it as a conjecture. There are on a system with simple geometry, important words by Liverani, um, Keller, uh, Bunimovic, to the point that uh, this system sometimes can be proven to possess what we call a physical invariant measure. And just is a probability measure that is invariant under this many dimensional transformation. How I'm going to use this in a very naive way, suppose that I have a function from the phase space to R and uh, invariance just means this. And if I take a very special kind of functions, these phi i's of y, which are the correct, in, in simple words, you, forget, you take the individual i, i is the, is the index of a, 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 a single individual, and you say, what is, uh, forget what is, suppose I look at myself, I forget about all of you and say, what is the measure of, of uh, the interval between zero and y. So what is the probability if you want, and later we will talk about probability, the probability that my temperature is below y. And if you do that, uh, you get what uh, these mu i's, these integrals with respect to invariant measure capital lambda, which are nothing else than the, margin, the marginal distributions of the full, of the full probability measure on, on the full uh, big, and uh, if we assume that the thing is a, is a physical measure, we can get them by a, a sort of Birkhoff summation. You, uh, you evolve time and you count, you use the sort of compute uh, the average temperature. So here is what you get. Mm, the uh, blue curve, uh, so the, 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 blue, uh, the green interval to the left is susceptible, the, the red is the infected. Uh, the, uh, for the parameters chosen for this simulation, the blue curve tells you what, is, uh, what are these marginal distributions from only exogenous infections. So it means this is a, is a one-dimensional system, no coupling. If you put coupling, of course, you see that more people get uh, um, it is easier to get infected and you get this other. What is to be remarked is that to a good approximations, these distribution functions are linear, which means that um, Lebeg to a good approximation is still an invariant measure on the projected subspace. Or we can play with compartmental ODEs even here. You get uh, uh, this, uh, this is just to see that you can recover even, even for these uh, for these systems, a, a probabilistic description as, as Bernoulli, um, McCormack and Con, and uh, the other guy, I forgot the name. And uh, they well describe, they well describe the system behavior, but by this equation, we do not understand what is behind the system behavior. So we need to do some more analysis. Here is again our picture of emotion. And now let's say that I want to see how the infection of, of one individual transfer goes from one to the other individual. So here with the black arrows, you see that the first exogenous infection affects this other individual at this time, which in turn infects this other and again and again. And so what you get is a tree. 
And now I want to apply the mathematical quantities describing free trees to these pictures. So what are the, the quantities, the number of generations in the tree and the number of nodes? And, uh, and I asked myself, what are the statistical distribution of these trees? So how many trees will I have of a certain number of generations? How many trees I will have as a fraction when uh, uh, I count the number of nodes? The number of nodes is number of people infected is what we have seen in the first, uh, in the first picture. So if now you forget about dynamics and you make very simple statistical assumptions, there is a nice paper by my colleague Ed Orton, co-workers in Maryland, but says, look at this assumption. You have an individual J by which all the tree started. The tree is what, uh, I, I forgot how it is called in the epidemics, is uh, the cluster. The cluster, somebody brings in the, I bring here the pathogen and, the, the, and we get the tree. And what is, suppose that uh, transmission is purely probabilistic. So there is a probability that the, infection goes from I to J, uh, sorry, from J to I, and there is this matrix. And uh, now we ask ourselves, what is the probability that the number of generations, now let's play with generation and not with the number of nodes, number of generations of these three is less than or equal to G. And so using further simplifying assumptions, Ott and co-workers arrive at this equation. And this equation has some analysis and results on which I will come back later because now I want just to focus on the hypothesis. These are uh, random the assumptions. Now, I want to make a dynamical approach of this, uh, of this system. How can I uh, resort, uh, how can I fit in without a probabilistic, uh, a probabilistic uh, uh, framework? Now, you certainly know that much of the work in dynamical system has been done by translating things that happen in probability to things that happen in dynamical system. And since Poincaré, Birkhoff, Maxwell, even before, uh, Boltzmann, and then the Russian school, Kolmogorov, Gnedenko, the American school, uh, um, Rufus Bowen. So we try, and this keeps going, this team, we try to see how in a purely deterministic dynamical system, you can have something that you can describe probabilistic. So the first thing I want to talk about is the infection duration. Uh, you see, in, in a single unit of time, what is time here? Here we have, uh, it is true we have a discrete time, but our, our dynamical systems are moving. It's not a single, uh, like in, in a hot system where at a certain time we sit here and we say, okay, transmit or not transmit, probability, prank. then you see, is a more dynamically structured. So first of all, we have to ask ourselves how to describe infection duration. So you see, uh, the, uh, Magenta arrow tells you that once you are infected, you arrive to the red interval. And in, the, in, uh, in kappa, lowercase kappa, is the maximum amount of viral charge that you can get. So you enter to the left of the red interval. And then in the beginning iterations, you have to develop, you have to develop illness, which is what actually happens once you get uh, the disease. The disease is not immediately manifested, but it takes a certain amount of time to, to invade your body before it. And um, so, and then infection duration, you have to exit the situation. You have to exit for the good or for the bad, either in R recovery or in failure. And so this in a dynamical system terms is what we call a transit time from the set K to the other set. Now, again, here, let me see, let me sketch what happens. You are green, then you turn red, but you are in the beginning of the illness. In the initial times, you grow like lambda. Lambda is the slope of the red uh, left branch of the dynamics, which is larger than one. So your disease in increases exponentially. Then at a certain time, you are, uh, on the full interval, zero, red, zero, one, and you evolve until you end up. 
And uh, there is a nice paper which I recommend you, a very comprehensive paper by my friends Nicolai and Sandro, that tells you that when these sets become very teeny tiny, and this is what they mean by arbitrary null sets, these exit and uh, exit and transit times can be considered as Poisson random, have the same distribution as a Poisson random variable. So, but now here, there is a, a startup time T, capital T, which is the time that you need to develop illness. So if you want to use their idea, you have to resort to this. And you get that your dynamical uh, transit time is distributed as T, which is a constant. And now I tell you what is the constant, plus the same distribution as a Poisson variable of mean what is inside. Now, what is inside? is the conditional measure of the exit set with respect to the measure of the infected, which approximately is the, the back measure of, of the union of recovery, but those two small uh, intervals to the right. And T, capital T, is this, uh, the time that it tells you, that it takes you to go, uh, so to speak, equidistributed on the unit interval. So this infection duration is perfectly uh, describable by the existing theory on dynamical system, module of effect that the th theorems become rigorous in the limit of uh, very small uh, sets, but nonetheless. So the average uh, infection duration is given by this formula, on which, which I will use later. Now, Transmission of a disease happens random. What does it mean? Again, there is no randomness in here. So now you have to talk about contagion dynamics. So here, uh, recall that you have, we have a red individual, XJ, which is infected, and two possible positions for the green individual. So if a green individual is, uh, is too uh, much to the right, it is possible you see here, it is possible that with uh, the viral charge gets infected. So, and uh, here it is, he, he gets infected. To the contrary, if it is to the left, he, he doesn't get infected. Now I take the green interval and I plot it in the vertical so that uh, in, in the beginning I have, suppose that, uh, uh, suppose that I get uh, my uh, individual goes into the set K1. And then what happens? To possibly, uh, so uh, this is the function for the uh, viral charge, which is proportional to X. And so he, he, what he, he can, uh, in the beginning, you get, uh, your, uh, you get an infection of the individual. And then two things can happen. Either this now is a pair, is a, a pair game. The infected and, uh, the, uh, and the infective, either this pair ends up in K2, and in this case, infection is transmitted, or if a pair ends up in K3, it is a simple calculation. You see that in this case, no infection happens. And so here again, we can define a, we can define a, a transit time, which can be infinite on a set of relative measure or positive measure. It means that you have an infector which is not able to infect the other, the, the, peop, the, the person on which he has an input, or, or it is this, again, can also be described as T, plus a Poisson distributed uh, distribution on a set of relative measure. I call this pi theoretical because this is what replaces, what replaces the probability of transition in the stochastic model. And uh, it is uh, sim simple. It are just calculations that you can get your, uh, these quantities explicitly in terms of kappa, which is, uh, you see kappa is the slope of the viral charge. The larger kappa, the more this, uh, this, uh, this line is uh, steep. And P, 
the average value of the Poisson variable is this combination K over cap over two plus two. And so this is our probability of contagion. And our, um, if we want to do a, an approach, a stochastic approach, we see you, here you get PIJ. Uh, now, uh, these curves are experimental curves to show you that indeed those Poisson distributions are well uh, satisfied by simulations. But now let's see the consequences. Um, it is no surprise that the crucial quantity in the stochastic analysis is the leading eigenvalue of the probability of transition, of the probability of infection matrix. And uh, in our case, in the dynamical case, we have that the probability of transition is a theoretical probability transition equal for all times the, the agency matrix, because if I have no connection to somebody, I cannot certainly pass it. Now, uh, the network that I constructed is, uh, is constructed in such a way that uh, the transpose of the agency matrix is a stochastic matrix when divided by M. M is the number of individuals that have an input on you. And so you can write the leading eigenvalue in this simple, in, in a form which has everything explicit. Now, in the paper of Et, of Ed, Ott, and others, it is shown that theta equal one is a critical condition. Why? Because if you solve this equation, you can see, uh, you can uh, look, if you work with this equation, uh, I remind you that omega j is the probability that if individual j is infected, it results into a tree with less than g levels. Now, if you let g tends to infinity, this quantity theta j is the probability that an infection never stops. So he, the guy brings in a disease and the disease will burn all of us. Now, this is a theorem, but I rather call it a drama, that if his theta is larger than one, there is a non-zero probability that our the infection will never stop. It is not a certainty, contrary to what people also in the <laughs> in, uh, in, uh, in TV shows uh, think. It's not sure, it's not um, certain that you will certainly have everybody infected, but there is a probability. And also, now we can compute our theta. And you see that uh, now I take, I keep all parameters fixed and I just leave K, kappa, which is the infection uh, virulescence free as a free parameter. And I see that I have a theoretical value of kappa above which this probability is larger than zero. Oh, by the way, uh, this theta j can be computed as a fixed point of that equation. And here are the results. So if I, if I keep, if I take my theoretical estimates for the eigenvalue, the probability, I get this blue curve. This blue curve shows a, a first order phase transition. So up to this value of K theoretical, of kappa theoretical, the probability that any, an infection will spread forever is null. But if you pass, there is a, this first order phase transition by which you have a non-null probability that uh, no null, but not unity, that your infection will spread forever. And now this is done, the magenta is done with the experimenting. Just run the system, put a fresh one. You say that, for instance, you, you, now you will ask me, how can you tell that an infection will last forever? You put a very large time limit and you say, if an infection lasts longer than this, this is a, an estimate of, uh, an, of, a, of the fact that the infection will last forever. And you get that our curve. Uh, again, I tell you, uh, I'm not striving at reproducing exactly the, the reality because also I'm not fitting, I'm not fitting parameters. This is purely, is purely uh, playing with a dynamical system. You are much better at me 
than me at uh, fixing these parameters, optimizing. There's lots of work to be done here, but you see that we do have, in a purely deterministic system, the magenta, the same thing that happens with a stochastic system. And moreover, if we use dynamical system theory to estimate the parameters in this, in, in this uh, uh, coupled uh, network of, uh, of uh, maps, we get a pretty good um, agreement. Oh, another uh, important uh, consequence of this uh, analysis of what is that uh, we have uh, statistical distributions of a number. Suppose now that we count how many infection we'll have with a certain number of um, generations and how many infections we'll have with a certain number with a fraction of people infected and we get these we they get hot and co-workers these exponent minus two minus three over two which are universal in a large class of stochastic dynamical system stochastics i under i underline it and um, there is an exponential cutoff, but when you are at the critical point, and this is also true in the theory of branching processes, of which this uh, rightly belong, uh, and this, at the branching point, this, uh, um, this exponential cutoff does not appear. And again, here is, there, here are the results of a numerical experiment. And you see that uh, when kappa is uh, equal to this uh, uh, pale blue line, which is the experimental value that we found in the other, sorry, I'm standing in the middle, <laughs> uh, in the other, in the previous analysis, we do have a, what seems over many orders of magnitude a pure, point, a pure power point law. To the contrary, when you move, for instance, you move to the theoretical, which is slightly, <laughs> slightly higher because you see the numerical uh, is 4.5 and the theoretical is five, you get the, uh, power, uh, the power law with a cutoff. So, and if you now plot the experimental value of K, uh, sorry, you, you plot the sigma, this uh, uh, exponential cutoff versus kappa, you find again that the, exponen uh, the exponential cutoff fades at the critical point. So a dynamical system reproduces exactly, reproduces exactly all the, uh, all the um, phenomena that you, we have found in the purely probabilistic. But uh, it gives us more, because if it were just that we reproduce it, we would be um, greatly unimpressed. True that you are greatly unimpressed. It is what you, we do with probability. But here it gives us an understanding because these parameters that you see here, they have a meaning. They have a meaning in dynamics, but not only in dynamics, they have a clinical meaning. And let me tell you briefly. So suppose that, so we want, uh, not to a uh, theta is the point uh, is the eigenvalue which we have a transition if we have a, a, a critical point the phase the phase transition so we want we want to be on the safe side we will theta smaller than one and so we need this combination of parameters smaller than one but what are these parameters m i remind you m is the number of errors that are coming into you is the number of social contacts clearly the more the social contacts you have, your probability, uh, the worse the situation is. That is why we were locked in at home. Next, we have kappa. Uh, no, sorry, we have infection duration. Look the way the infection duration goes in. Suppose that the infection duration gets short, and it gets short in, it can get shorter in two ways. Either you die quickly, SARS, why SARS have never been a problem? You got it, you died. So if it gets, if tau becomes small, that denominator is small, two over the denominator is large, and so that quantity becomes small. So no problem. And then what I, what I find more interesting is the role of the 
virality. So you see, if you increase kappa, kappa means that uh, you are giving more and more viral charge to the other people, but this charge comes both the viral strength, both in the numerator and the denominator. And uh, this is the reaction. It happens to be true. It happens to be true, and so let us conclude. So we have this complex dynamical system. Uh, there are many open problems. That is why I, tell, I told you that not only it is interesting and amusing, but there are behind it many important dynamical questions. I, I mentioned this work, the works Liverani and others on the characterizing the invariant measures. Here we are in a, is a, is a, a tough job because these are many dimensional dynamical systems with coupling which of, of, a cert, of, a cer, of a certain, so to speak, non-smooth, uh, non-smooth. I, I am suspect that if a true mathematician will try to smooth these, uh, with these couplings. Prove rigorous results. As I mentioned, uh, Hyden and the Vianti paper are done in the limit of uh, null set. Remember set. Study open systems, because when people die, there is a leakage in your dynamical system. Again, Bunimovic has studied in a small Bunimovic, Bunimovic and others are studied in a small number of dimensions how you leak away probability, and there is all the theory of, uh, how are they called, uh, what is the name, uh, transient invariant measure, something like that. Giusto? Uh, control the statistic of extreme events. What are extreme events? Suppose that you are even before the transition point, but you are seeing that you have a distribution of, you, you, uh, this burst of infection can come in different sizes. And in extreme event is when the number of infected people surpass a certain threshold, even if you are below the threshold of the probability of a positive probability of infinite infections. Again, if your threshold is above what your health system can bear, you are in bad trouble. So there is a dynamical theory of extreme events. And one could also, people more, uh, more uh, capable than me in dealing with these uh, complex uh, random graphs can in investigate the interaction between the kind of graph, the topology. I've, I tell you uh, again, I have adopted a very simple topology and the dynamics. And I think uh, uh, we should be it. Ah, mm, I've written a small uh, 26 problems for, stu for graduate students uh, for the American Journal of Physics, where uh, I propose to do many of these experimentations in a, in a pedagogical way for uh, training graduate students. It took me a few years to write the paper because I needed to solve the problem myself, which was not easy, but, <laughs> but now I, I think I'm done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the nice talk. Are there questions? To me, I the bathroom, but as soon as he gets out, he will ask a question. Okay. <laughs> Meanwhile. <laughs> to Ian? <laughs> Do you have questions? <laughs> questions? Curiosity? Let me thank you again. <laughs> Let's do it the opposite. Is it is me who thanks. Oh, a question. <laughs> Sorry. The failure interval very, very small because I'm kind of surprised if you have an expanding mapping, you throw out a small interval. Normally, you don't have an absolutely continuous measure. Maybe, <sighs> maybe if your interval is very small, you see, you like see, uh, you end up on one of those tough questions that uh, one would like to do. No idea, but that is one of the questions I should ask. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. To Ian, questions? <laughs> <laughs> we didn't have any doubt. 
<laughs> Actually, we were kind of worried that you were not asking anything. I thought. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so my question is that, uh, so, so you say that it could happen that uh, everyone will get infected, right? Uh, but then the, the long run, then maybe the disease, uh, it will be less and less serious, right? Because if... Oh, this is a nice point. Uh, if we go to the first picture, what those spikes that we see are done with completely different dynamical systems. So we are in the presence now of another dynamical system completely different from what we had last year, two years ago. But, uh, and so this is a, a game for people in uh, like you in uh, optimization, in, uh, in fitting. I, I don't want to uh, seem to sound uh, reductive, but it is, very it is very tough to find the right parameters to fit what is happening in the forecast. Now, what I can tell you, is that from my point of view of somebody in dynamical systems, what I see is a dynamical system which is completely changing over time. So what these parameters that I have in there are kind of, uh, kappa is changing. Uh, the time of infection is changing. Uh, it, is, uh, it is a nightmare. But what we understand from this simple-minded, simple-minded uh, toy model is how this them that the infection propagates. There is the network, there is the dynamical system which is in each of us, which is uh, neglected in all analysis. I've not seen anybody who says, okay, you are a dynamical system. No, they say, okay, it is good if I, if I give you an individuality. <laughs> you, are, <laughs> you are a point in the, in the big box of the compartmental model, but no. We have to understand what each, of our, each one of us is a dynamical system, and these dynamical systems are interacting. And if you open this Pandora box, uh, you know that there are uh, phenomena in coupled maps which are uh, synchronization. Uh, this is amazing. There is a... But uh, again, I changed my title, not from simulating, because I'm not good at simulating anybody, and not even good at simulating that I know what I'm telling you, tell you about, <laughs> but understanding. This can help us to understand what happens. Yes, so uh, you have a continuous map acting on a compact set. And so sure. what, what are the obstructions to the existence of an invariant measure? Because one, one thing, you know that contagion is discontinuous. Ah. That is one of, thing. Oh, that... That's a discontinuity. Uh, ah, okay. Probably if you smooth it. Uh, yeah. So okay, but, but you yeah, see. So, but but can't you be arbitrarily uh, close to uh, something smooth? Then? Mm, uh, you're um, probably you can. <laughs> okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Other questions? Uh, first is about your paper. So you submitted on nineteen December. Ah, you see, oh, this is my, this is my claim, eh? One day to get accepted. <laughs> Same day accepted. I brag with my co-workers and colleagues that it is because when they read Matica, they publish. It is not true. Because on this section of American Journal of Physics, how does it work? Please erase the registration. You propose a paper. The editor says, the editor say, send me, if a proposal, I, I consider it. Then they say, okay, fine. Then you send the first draft and say, no, 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 change this, change this. <laughs> this is, and we, it was interesting because this is tailored for graduate students. It's not a research paper. Even if I pretend that there is much to be investigated inside. So we worked together, me and the two editors for over a year in order to make it as simple and as pedagogical as possible. So in the end, <laughs> when the last version arrived, it was accepted. But don't tell anybody, please. And don't tell Stefano. Tell Stefano that, you see, your paper got rejected. Giorgio goes in in one day. <laughs> OK, so maybe this, uh, yeah. So, so my question is in the models for Infection should uh, people take in, into the account that the the immune system will adapt 
will become adaptive to the, the disease. Okay, there is a family of models in uh, this in this game that are adaptive networks. Uh, how did I come on with this? More or less the same phenomena happen in the brain when instead of people you have neurons and neurons are preferentially attached and they transfer the excitation. And in, in brain, people since many years have been even experimentally studying this, what they call um, uh, firing cascades, a, a neuron fires, and then you have, and neurons more than our bodies adapt very quickly. So the parameter of a neuron in the brain changes plastically and it is precisely doing what you say. And people have studied this also the other way around because you say, oh, if the brain does that, let us do it too. And so they have what is called the Hebbian learning where you have a, a neural network which is trying to do a task by changing its parameters. Now, the important question from a physiological point of view is, are we adapting for the good or for the bad? Because good could be to adapt for the bad. Suppose that we adapt in such a way that if we get an infection, we die. Problem solved. <laughs> we actually, from an, uh, how could they, would they call it? Um, what was uh, Graham, the, 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 the guy in the 17th century? Uh, from an, uh, an optimization point of view, it is better to go that way. Me, less people die than from this prolonged, uh, continuous, low level uh, disease. SARS killed many, much, much less people than uh, COVID. So we don't know how we are adapting. <laughs> But unfortunately, or fortunately, we cannot decide how to. Mm -hmm. ah, also, also, bravo, bravo. This is a nice, uh, not only we are adapting, the virus is adapting also. It is a complex uh, interaction. But again, I do not know anything about viruses. <laughs> and disease. I just wanted to entertain you with this game, which is a kind of nice game for people in dynamics. Thank you very much. Other questions? If not, we thank George again. Grazie.